uh, the first two sessions uh, will be somehow coordinated uh, by me. The first one with some uh, slides, but then practically, I think I counted around like 10 people involved in Camaillo development in a way or another. Some of them not here yet, probably for a reason. <laughs> Either long party or because of the, that session to ask, uh, to answer questions about uh, use of Camaillo. But uh, I'm sure it will be uh, very interesting as usual. So first one, I plug it because, uh, yeah, uh, Kemi, it's one of uh, my uh, favorite uh, components of um, uh, Camaillo. It really brought a lot of uh, flexibility so I felt like uh, I should give some updates or actually some uh, hints about uh, how you could use it better with more flexibility for some of the common components that are used in the default um, uh, configuration file scripting language to make it uh, more convenient. So for those that are uh, here, uh, uh, getting the first, uh, let's say, touch with uh, Kemi. We introduced it quite a long time ago, so like uh, 2015 or so, was the release 5.0. One of the reasons we jumped it from four to five with the first uh, version number. Uh, before that, we actually had like support for uh, executing uh, scripts written in external uh, scripting languages in an embedded format. What means embedded format means that Camaillo becomes that interpreter, Lua interpreter, Python interpreter, so it's not like uh, external execution. So again, Camaillo it's linked, one of the modules of Camaillo is linked against like lib Python, lib Lua, and it's becoming the interpreter itself. That's, I don't know if I have it here anymore, but in the previous uh, presentation, I always make it clear, be careful when using some of the function from that scripting language, uh, because you can shut down Camaillo. For example, if you use Lua, and Lua has an exit function, that means stop Lua interpreter, and that's Camaillo actually, so it's gonna stop Camaillo, which you probably don't know, but in our native scripting language, we have exit, which is having the meaning of stop processing that C message and go to the next one, right? So you get different behavior by using somehow similar function, but uh, actually they have different um, uh, purpose. So before we had like Perl, we had uh, C Sharp, we had Java, which is kind of obsolete because there is no proper open source interpreter. GCC doesn't have it anymore because all this Oracle, uh, you know, story with uh, licensing patents and so on. And then probably also lack of community to improve that. And uh, then Python was also available, but only like inline execution. You had the script externally and you could execute function parts of those uh, scripts from native config uh, file. What KME brought was like extended this support in a way that our routing blocks, this rec uh, request route, on reply route, failure route, could be completely written in such scripting language like Lua Python by um, defining functions on those uh, scripts. And practically, I have this slide to make the relation between uh, our blocks in the native scripting language and the default names of the functions that are gonna be executed from Python, from Lua script, from JavaScript, Ruby. But you can change this if you don't like the, for example, we have native config request underscore out for handling SIB requests, invite by coming from the network. The default one in Lua will be KSR underscore request route. KSR standing from Camaillo SIP router. That's uh, the short abbreviation of that one. And then we have for the uh, main root blocks, request route, reply route, on send route, uh, this direct mapping. Again, they are mod uh, uh, 
core parameters if you want to change the default names. And then for the other blocks, which are more like callbacks on demand, so we know that failure out is executed only if you uh, use T on failure before sending out. And because you can give a function name to this T on failure or T on branch, practically is not like a, a implicit mapping, like a default mapping. It's your choice to define a function, and then we export this KSRTM.T on failure, and the parameter is the name of the function in your script that you want to be executed in the failure route event case. We have this event route blocks from different uh, modules. Usually those modules uh, have uh, uh, some event callback parameter or something similar like AVCB and some other uh, name there, but should be easier to spot. And then you can define this uh, uh, blocks because with the native scripting languages, like if you have it in the Camilo config, it will be executed. The module can check if exists that block. Here, we have to check if that function exists, and you have to tell us which is the function for it. There is another one, event route from uh, TM, which is also with this callback mechanism. In that case, it will be this T on branch failure. You give the name to it. Otherwise, just a small uh, uh, comparison that you can do with the, on the left side would be the native scripting, uh, route zip out, and the translation to uh, Lua. The name I choose KSR route zip out because this is executed from another block from another function. Uh, I gave the link to the documentation, the one in bold, but then more complete example, the link above with um, Kamailio basic came Lua. And then again, I'm tending to use Lua because I got familiar with it, but uh, from the community, I think Python is also quite popular. And Tori here, uh, I know he's using it because he also contributed some um, tools to make it easier to test, to understand. So if someone has question about Kemi and Python, I'll refer you to Tori here, and I think he might actually have a short se session today, or not sure about it. Anyhow, let's uh, get uh, back to this flexibility. Uh, a bit of uh, summary or uh, refreshing from last year or a previous um, uh, presentation I had. So you have this option of uh, uh, using uh, routing blocks and uh, uh, inline execution of, so you can have it actually like both ways. You can go with KME framework to have the request route, uh, reply route, and these blocks all written in uh, Lua, for example, or in Python. And then you can still have in Camilo CFG blocks written in native scripting language. So from KME, you can call back into the Camarillo native interpreter. And we have this KSR.route with the name and uh, uh, another one which also checks if it exists from the CFG utils modules, uh, KSR CFG utils route if exit. So only if it's found it will be executed so you don't get kind of errors from the module. And this sometimes could be useful. Some, Typically, I use it to clean up the module, and I feel it a bit more uh, convenient with the native scripting uh, language. So you see, I said the CFG engine Lua, which will switch to using KME framework for uh, routing blocks. And in the Lua script in this function, KSR request route, at some point, I execute this KSR route, uh, remove headers, RM headers. And here I actually send also some reply on options. So this that kind of, I know they're not going to really change because I want to move it. I can still remove other headers from the Lua script. I can also uh, uh, forward uh, reply and so on. But as I said, sometimes it's, uh, uh, I find it uh, convenient this way, being uh, familiar with all of them. 
Or maybe sometimes you find a function that is not yet exported to Lua from some module. So this would be a solution for that one. You put a small block in Kamailo CFG and you execute it from your uh, KME <coughs> script. Then the other way around, which existed before, actually before the KME uh, framework with the interpreter was you have your request route block, everything native scripting, and inside it, as a function, you have this Lua run, JSDT, which is JavaScript with duct tape interpreter, Python exec, or Ruby run. I think we have also Python run uh, to have it consistent, being an alias to Python exec, if I am not wrong. And then an example that uh, I was pushing and I was also mentioning to some people that ask uh, here, Sometimes I find it very useful uh, to use uh, the JavaScript interpreter for uh, uh, managing uh, JSON document because you have this JSON parse, which is native in the JavaScript, and then we'll turn that JSON in a structure, and then you can easily work with that structure, like array, you know, fields in the structure. So this is something like randomizing an RTJSON uh, document, which is used for doing serial parallel forking. Um, and it's much easier here. And also sometimes if you want to extract values from a complex JSON, this JavaScript could be easy, but also I'm sure Python has uh, a very good JSON support and Lua has the same, they'll uh, parse it and make it like a map, like a table in memory and you can access it very easily. Why I prefer in this case to use uh, JavaScript module in Camaro is because the interpreter is embedded. The duct tape is not like a library. Their uh, preferred way was to get their source code in your project because they have it like a single C file and a header. So you just copy that in your project and you have it embedded. No. Uh, dependency external. So this is the, uh, installed by default by Kamaino. So that uh, should uh, help. Or sometimes you can uh, do advanced XML uh, processing. For example, for present, sometimes you need to fix some values. We have XML ops in Kamaino and uh, can be possible to do a lot. But as I said, sometimes it's just simpler with using Python, like in this example, if you want to change a value. And then practically you have this propagation of values from one interpreter to another using variables. So we set it in the config. Uh, here we get the body actually, and then we set back, uh, body back to the C message at the end the blue uh, functions are about uh, updating uh, the, or interacting with the SIP message. The, the red one would be just Python uh, XML operation. Now, uh, to summarize about some advanced processing, uh, this uh, function could help you uh, a lot like you can get the entire C message from the first line till the end of the body. You can do whatever you want with it in um, Python, in Lua, and then you can set back to Kamailio the entire content of that C message. And this could be uh, sometimes useful in various scenarios where maybe our uh, uh, scripting language doesn't give you uh, Let's say find access to that. Yes. Um, I see here uh, for setting the buffer, it's of type string. Is that going to be like a C string, or can you actually uh, have binary content in it? Like for, if you're going to have like S7. Right now, body or? I think it's a string, but could be an option to add it. So as I said, if we lack a feature, it's because you haven't made the pull request. <laughs> But I think it's a string based on an interface. Could be made maybe as an alternative to allow some hexa or base64 encoding because the interface uh, it's kind of defaulting to the string. But this, yeah, it's a good idea. So you have time till we finish today. <laughs>
I'm joking. He has very good contribution, even modules to Camaillo, but to warm up to the day. So it's similar to MSG apply changes, same kind of restriction. You can't use it after creating the transaction because of too many references, retransmission timers that are engaged and so on. And again, you have full access uh, to replace uh, incoming content with something that um, you want. And then it's a group of variables that uh, sometimes I found it uh, useful to work to, to extract like only the headers, maybe only the first part of the message, like from the first line to the headers, so not the body, or the last part, like the headers and the body. So this uh, gives uh, flexibility, and you don't really need to uh, parse some of this, uh, like the entire message. Sometimes, for example, I will have the example of prettifying the headers, because sometimes you get a user agent that sends header name, space, colon, space, uh, sometimes uh, the colon is next to the header name, sometimes it's next to the body of the header. Maybe you want to reorder them because you work with some old gateway that if it doesn't find first from and then to, will uh, scream. So you get the headers, then you change it as you want. You can make them like compact. I gave an example with a few like from and to. I never understood that why they made two as a compact header, so you switch from two to one letters, but you save a byte there indeed. Um, so you can do this kind of operation, and then you build the new uh, message, and then you set the buffer. Just as an example uh, of uh, one can use here. Then, I and many here, I'm, I'm sure they use extensively the hash table, and then uh, there are variables for them, but uh, using function actually saves some variable name lookup, and also we have some function that combines sort of two operations, like you can set the name and the expire at the same time, so you don't need to have two function calls, which will mean looking up the item twice, this function is actually available also in the native scripting language. So uh, you have the same flexibility there, but I wanted to uh, highlight uh, them here. To remove the items, you have also functions, which usually in native config file, removing is like assigning the dollar $null uh, special uh, variable. XAVPs would be another uh, group uh, of, uh, let's say, very loved uh, variables, at least from my point of view. I use them extensively, kind of migrated from AVPs because of this structure-like accessing. And here you have, again, group of uh, functions that give you uh, easy access. So the first one is like example of the uh, replacement of AVP. So we have the item on the root list. The second one is when you want to work with this structure where you have like name of the item in the root list and then the name in the sub list. And then you can set the value, integer value, get the value, uh, remove it, uh, check if it exists, this is null. Um, again, you can use this generic case RPV, get, set, and so on, but uh, for some of these commonly used variables, I uh, really recommend to use the, the functions. They can speed up, like with the hash table, doing two operations in one item lookup. So uh, can improve also in terms of performance a little bit. Otherwise, I, I don't have the, the slide with the performance. I haven't run any new performance. Uh, measurements lately, but if you look last year, uh, the recording is not yet uh, split. Uh, it is like the full days, but uh, the guys at Pascal made a good uh, indexing with reference of the time of the start of uh, each session, which I found it uh, pretty neat to use, and uh, somehow I didn't manage to actually split it per session. 
maybe this year after this edition I'll do it for the both uh, last ones. So that would be for uh, Kemi, it was more like to warm up the day and I knew there were a couple of uh, uh, new participants and maybe they didn't get the chance to play with uh, Kemi and I wanted to uh, highlight it. Usually I had Kemi in the past as a workshop but uh, as I said I typically ended up in the past years to have half-half of deployments so native scripting language is still uh, well maintained and actually now a function can be easily exported to both. So if you actually think at the execution uh, steps, we have a wrapper for our native scripting language, which translates from these variables to plain string on integer value, and then it's executing the KEMI. So practically KEMI, it's executed always the KEMI C function, the corresponding KEMI C function. It's always executed by the uh, native scripting language uh, function. And of course for KEMI, is the Python Lua interpreter which builds the integer or the plain string value from the operation in Lua Python and then executes our C KEMI function. So the interpreter practically have the role of evaluating variables and then making integer string values of out them and passing them as parameters to a common function right now. Last year I had also like a diagram and an example of a C code so if you want more details uh, related to the implementation, uh, please watch that one. To start the day, I want again to, to thank to our all the uh, sponsors, Simgate, Seafront, Twilio, Libon, Pascom, of course here, Simud, Snom, giving some devices, a few of them still left to, to go today. I have to say the, the last one, the last phone will be during the last session, so for those that are surviving the entire day, but till then, at least two will be uh, given away, so don't worry, you have chance even if you need to catch a plane early. And then uh, we have Fred here with API ban and LOD, really good friends supporting us with infrastructure, and our uh, partner uh, or conference from the free switch developers that we know pretty much every deployment of Kamailio needs a media server and free switch it's one of the uh, commonly used out there for this uh, purpose. So that would be for uh, the first uh, session. I'll have the same slide at the end to thank you. But now thank you for waking up so early after knowing many of you actually, when I counted, I estimated 20, 30 were still at the bar after we had to kick you out from this area at 10 p.m. So I couldn't join, I was uh, very tired. So I hope you had a good time after our cocktail party. Okay, thank you for the presence here and if you have a question for uh, or actually we can switch to uh, the ask me anything because you can ask about Kemi as well and yeah I have here uh, uh, many of the developers Federico it's there next to it it's Giacomo that contributed uh, Julian it's there that wrote uh, Henning was here I'm not sure if you arrived yet Xenophone is here as a developer. Anyone? Ah, oh, Tori, it's, I couldn't see it, it's in front. Alexander Dubovikov, Andreas Graining there. So I said at least 10 or so should be able to, to answer. And Thomas, you wrote, right? Prometheus, is that from you? Okay, you are busy with that one, I understand, but you are a developer. Ah, Richard for TLS, so it's there. Behind it, it's uh, Wolfgang with the uh, uh, next generation emergency extension like um, Lost and so on. But then you can go beyond. We have Sandro, we have uh, Lorenzo with Janus, so if it's something to contribute to, to like cross relation, so feel free to ask like how you can use Kamailo with something. You have a question? Nice. Uh, so One moment. 
dream can hear you. Uh, all right, so actually I'll uh, have uh, two questions. So uh, when you are sending the output buffer and you're rewriting the entire SIP message like you did in your example, I assume if you want to be able to access the information via pseudo variables, you still need to do apply lumps afterwards? No, that does it internally. Oh, so it automatically reparses yeah, when yeah, you set it's it. Reparsing. So it's like MSG apply changes, but with the entire buffer as a value. Yes. It's not processing the lumps anymore. And if you are doing extreme modifications, like you're changing completely the call ID header and route headers, does it you can put a buy instead of an invite. It, it's up to you. You have full power there. So okay. You, and then uh, it, it then afterwards say, okay, I need to create a transaction with. If you say neutron, you'll create a transaction with the new messages information yeah. and stuff like that. So this you have to use it before creating the transaction because then you can't change it. Okay. Because once the transaction is created, it's not only this kind of buffer and references to it. There are timers for the transmission. There are uh, replies coming on branches. Uh, so that's quite complex to do at that time. I mean, it's not like it's not possible, but then it will get very complex and probably the impact on performance will be also visible. But otherwise, yeah, the sources are available and you... Okay. I was thinking to add for the transaction support to add this MHG apply changes because okay. sometimes it's useful. Would not be for the simple scenario something very, very sophisticated. But then when it's coming to serial forking and pile forking, sometimes it's in parallel with this T on failure branch. You know, you have a pile forking going on, but one branch gets a final reply, and then you want to create a second. Yeah. Then it's not that okay. easy. So you could uh, easily uh, make your own uh, home uh, brew uh, topology hiding uh, yeah. in, in Kemi entirely and not use yeah. one of the existing modules. Yeah, the, the functions are actually available also in the um, native scripting language, but you don't have the flexibility of the language probably okay. for all these massive changes. Oh, cool. But yeah, you can change completely everything there. We have there one and then Fred and I saw another. Actually, we have another... Uh, Microphone, uh, yeah. which Hello. I can pass. Uh, I have a question regarding, is there any plans to have sort of LTS version for the Camellia? So it, every two years to change a version, it's okay, but uh, sometimes it's uh, let's say, too recent. I'd I say. mean, um, we don't, we, we discussed it many times, and I think uh, Henning was one of the guys playing with uh, such ideas. I think it's a, a bit late today to, to add, but yeah, it's always like uh, a balance between uh, what one could invest as a community, as a whole, and what some entities need. Because it's, uh, I mean, it's not like we lock the stable branches that we say we don't package it, so you can still use 4.0, 4.3. We just don't spend time on packaging. There are companies that they still push patches. For example, I noticed in the past, 1 to 9 Germany, 1 in 1 Germany, because they have like over 10 million. They had a presentation here five years ago or so, not here at the previous location, but at Kamaili World as an event. So they are a second larger telephony provider he, uh, in Germany, and they actually migrate quite uh, late from a version to another. But they do their own packaging. They they have their own like uh, DevOps to you know automatic deployments and so on, and they push sometimes fixes or fixes because we don't allow new features to very old branches, and that's fine. If someone from the community or a group, better a group, wants to take over, like, you know, we want this uh, branch to maintain it longer, would, would, from my point of view, would, be not, would not be a problem. But then, like, putting in the back of the others, it's, we discuss it. Should we take it or you find it okay? Some people complain we do releases to rare, right? Because 
we had a release and then someone contributed uh, a new feature and they asked, it's gonna be in 581? No, <laughs> actually. So depending on the needs, some need this like long-term uh, 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 LTS. Some prefer a bit more like uh, rolling up uh, style of versioning. And we are somewhere in the middle. So it gives you like two years of packaging from us, which I have to thank to Victor, which this year couldn't come, but Victor Seva is allocating huge amount of time and knowledge and resources to build Kamailio for many uh, Debian Ubuntu versions, even like four back and nightly builds from the last two stable releases. And yeah, thanks to Andreas and his former company, he has access to the um, is a build system, but it's still a lot of work. So here it's where the community can come and put it in the discussion and say, hey, let's form a group. If you have interest, let's do it. and you'll get access, that's not the problem. It's just, uh, as I said, this with releasing every, five, uh, every 10 to 12 months and maintaining the last two stable releases gives the right balance between being supported enough long, not to worry like every half a year or so, so two years. And actually it's a little bit more than two years because we wait one, two months after the new release till we kind of do the latest uh, uh, packaging from the second last. So now we have 5.8, it was released in March, but we haven't done the latest packaging from uh, 5.6. We're gonna follow up soon. So plans, ideas are currently nothing on Concrete like uh, happening, Fred. On Kemi, for you know, I'm just not a strong scripter, so I don't have a, a ton of it. But if I were to do something stupid in in let's say Python, which I probably would, and I crash, you know, like divide by zero or something, how does Kama Ilio handle? So with with Python, there is a exception thrown in most of the cases. So that we catch it, it's not a, a problem to get Kamaelio like um, shut down. Uh, but with other uh, like uh, Lua, for example, they don't have this kind of ex, um, exception catching. So for example, in Python, I think if you execute one of the exit, like because it has a, a few variants, then we catch it in Kamaelio and we don't shut down. But I think also in Python is something like os.exit from one of the libraries, which is calling the lower layer exit, then it's going to um, shut down Kamailo. And this is also with the errors that will kill the interpreter, because dividing with zero is like killing the interpreter. So I'm pretty sure in Lua it's going to shut down Kamailo. In Python, many of them are uh, caught in JavaScript, I think, is not crashing. You can divide with not a number. And JavaScript is for web developers safe. <laughs> so, but I, I cannot guarantee. But usually it was quite tolerant. I'm not sure about duct tape because it's not the JavaScript as you have it in the browser that accesses HTML. This is more like ECMAScript interpreter. The JavaScript as a language interpreter, not as web development interaction with the DOM documents and so on. So yeah. Being embedded means you take responsibility of everything that happens. It would be like external execution, and yeah, you exec an external interpreter. If it's ending because of good execution or because of a crash, you just get a signal indication. Here it's you. So practically, Lua or Python is like native for Kamailu at that moment. Okay. Was another hand behind? Or? that I could see you think. But again, I ask also for other uh, developers. <laughs> uh, a question is, um, I've used Kemi for Lua and uh, Python 3. 
And for Lua, we can reload each uh, individual .lua file. But for Python 3, we don't, unless I miss something, I, I didn't hey. find anywhere to reload each individual file. Yeah, because I think in Python, you have only one file that you can uh, um, provide to Kamailio. Lua, before KME, had this option to specify many files to be loaded. And yeah, you could say load only the second one or the third one. But with all the others, including JavaScript and Ruby, I think you, you can only once set the path to the Python script. And then only that one you can reload. If you set it many times, you don't get an error. But it's kind of overwriting the previous value. So it's not loading uh, all of them if you have mod para many times for Python. But yeah, could be added as a feature. Um, personally, I added some code to up Python to make it um, Kemi uh, compatible, to add support for Kemi. I even wrote a new up Python 3S module because the initial one, which still exists, was using like a dynamic creation of C message object. And I saw that KSR, it's fine to have it as a static object. So you don't initiate it every C message and give the C message as a parameter. The previous one was more like from the C message is creating a Python object and then the uh, functions are like methods for that object. And I thought it's impacting the performance but um, at the end, there was not much difference. The only benefit I could find it is now, if you want to translate from like Lua to Python, it's kind of similar approach because it's no longer like self methods. It's just static function that you can execute from KME exports. So yeah, this is because of the design supporting a single uh, file to be loaded. So then the single file can be also reloaded, but can be extended if someone has more experience with Python. I know that with Python, at some point, they are missing some cleanup errors because there could be these exceptions on some uh, situation. And then you have to clean up also from the interpreter if you want to execute it second time with another C message, of course. But those errors are kind of global states. So we executed second time and you got like a same error at the beginning because the interpreter saw the error pointer it's already on. So yeah, this again, the benefit is for you if you are familiar with uh, Lua Python and you know what can happen. You just think Kamailo is now the Python interpreter and you have an extra library in your script, the KSR. But then you can import whatever is available in the Python world or in the Lua world and work with those libraries in your config. With JavaScript interpreter, it's not Node.js because some people come and ask, can I use any Node.js uh, module or how they are called? And no, the answer is no. You can write your own module. There is support. Someone added a few years ago. So you can write JavaScript files and package them as a module, and then you can load it in up uh, Java script, script file, and um, should work. But Node.js, no, because Node.js is its own interpreter. It's based also on Chromium JavaScript interpreter. It's a different one than duct tape. Since we are here, I remember that well, it was a discussion, and I think maybe Tori remembers, like, you reload the Python script, but then if you need to reload the imported library, it was kind of a trick that someone, you are not involved. But yeah, it was a discussion about this one. And it's a trick that is now uh, documented in the readme, because it was reloading Kamailio, the file that you specified to Kamailio, but not what that file was importing. Question? Maybe anyone from the audience can answer it, right? Not only you. Uh, 
Um, the question was asked by a colleague of mine in the mailing list recently, but he forgot to say hello, and I thought, oh, the community is not going to answer him. And <laughs> that's what happened. <laughs> so very well, uh, well done. Um, and it's also not about fancy features. It's something that probably was there 10 years ago already. So I guess many people know the answer. Um, the thing is, like, we have a proxy, and our customer wants to count every message coming in and out. Yeah. And we have found no way to count certain messages, and I'm going to tell you which one, right? Um, when the proxy, like when it sends a request, there is an on-send route, right, that it will say, oh, it, I sent it, I sent that request. But then when the response comes, you can pick up the response on the on-response, on-reply, whatever, but when the response is forwarded in the other direction, we didn't, found, uh, we didn't find any event that we can... Yeah. Uh, from the there is uh, on send route, but it's uh, executed by default only for request. You have to set a global parameter on the reply send route or something like that, equal on. Okay, let me set one from four messages. What do you say? All the transmissions. That's good because that's my other question. I, I didn't get any transmission counted, and I like, oh, how do I count the transmission? So, Global parameter, what do you say? On send reply route or something like that. On send reply route on. Okay, that was the first one, thank you. <laughs> if you ask question before Kamaili word, people are in traveling mode, in busy mode, so. <laughs> I totally support the idea that people don't ask. That's fine. Um, the interesting thing that the PM model, uh, when it receives a cancel, Right? It generates a 200 OK for the cancel and also a 487 for the invite. I don't find an event to count. OK, sorry. I wanted to put the browser on the screen, but I saw it's uh, the camera. Can you repeat it? Because yeah. I wanted to show that parameter, but I will show you in the break. Yeah, I took a note. I'll, I'll find it or I'll, I'll ping you. Don't worry. Um, so TM model uh, receives a cancel for an yeah. ongoing invite negotiation generates 200 OK for the cancel, generates an ACE, uh, um, yeah, generates uh, 487 for the invite. How do we count those two? Uh, the invite is, the reply for the invite is not by Camaelio. It should be f by the next hop, unless it's Camaelio the last uh, it's, hop. But it's hop by hop, right? It's no, no, the, for the invite, the 487 or? Will come, OK, will come in, OK. Will come in no. and go. But the 200 OK for cancel, yes, that's hop by hop. You have to check because actually in my, there is, uh, oh no, that's for stateless. So if you don't get it, you should get it with the on send route, I think, for the reply. If you enable that uh, okay, module okay. parameter, might yeah. be the magic, you know, solves your, the oh entire okay. problems then question. Well, we could, because the other thing is also in the TM model is, of course, it starts generating cancels and when it receives the 400, yeah. it generates an ACK. Those we couldn't count because we got, I mean, the PM model has a local response event, mm -hmm. but those two messages are not considered local response. Then I give you another hint, but I'm not sure it, because my had some overhead. There is a magic module called uh, SIP dump. Yeah, I saw that yesterday someone mentioned it and I took, but we did the test, it didn't work. For what? For something, I, I didn't do the test, I just wrote the image to the guy. <laughs> <laughs> for some of these four things, maybe for the responses. Uh, no, the, the idea with that module is that by default, the purpose is to write pickups or text file with the SIP traffic, so it's easier for TLS and so on. But in addition, it can also execute event route yeah. for message in and message out. And then you can use hash table to count or something else. But then, I'm not sure if you can get it to execute only the event route or it's also writing to a file which will add the overhead. But I think you, you have the option to say execute only the event route. And then should catch everything, like retransmission and so because it's like what's gonna be on the network. But then you don't have but because you can also execute event C trace and also inside because implemented in and you can inside. That's it. And if you don't need to, to send it to Homer, you can drop it. Yeah, I got it out. Yeah, so SIP <laughs> trace. Could be. Sip trace. I got it. <laughs> you can, Dragos, if you want to help, yeah. I can. Yeah, I have a chop. Value 4 is just the. Uh, okay. Just any of it. If you want to show, you can. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I was, he, he got it, so it's okay. But uh, then I, it's why I lost the question. I didn't get uh, the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, one more. Yeah, Alexander, I think it's one for you regarding SIP trace. You just reminded me. So uh, there is a, uh, I seen there is a method to send uh, SIP traces to the different uh, uh, locations, means, but uh, you can specify only one uh, in. But I've seen in documentation there is a possibility, but it's very unclear how to do the, specify the different uh, 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 it's locations a, to send. I think it's semi semicolon separated. You can m uh, set multiple destination, ah. like profiling. Yeah, but I need to check. Don't remember. Because it's not clear in documentation at all. Yeah. It, it was uh, like in configuration, you have to specify like explicitly where to send, yeah, yeah. and this way you need, but not in the module uh, initialization or something in like this. You can only set uh, host and transport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a uh, method where you can define the destination uh, where, when you send it manually, and there you can just send a CPU. You, uh, put the CPU right here. But uh, are they clashing with the uh, uh, original, let's say, in the model? No, no, you can pair, uh, pair function core, essentially. You can uh, put... Yeah. So one of the parameters of the function is the destination where to send it to. So that works. Okay, got it, thanks. We have Tori here. Can you bring Alexander? You need some sport this morning, yeah. so come. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. For thirty one. Uh, so uh, this is a DMQ question. Uh, I was wondering: Is it possible to have a, a Camellio part of more than one DMQ clusters? Uh, for the context of it, is I have uh, different H tables. There's one hash table I want where I want it to uh, be replicated between the uh, load balancers and the application server, and then there's other H tables, I just want to keep local to the app, app servers, and I don't want to then have one bi big grand nice, yeah. uh, replication thing for all the stuff, even the stuff that doesn't need to be broadcasted as much. Yeah, and there's no such uh, fine tuning right now, but it's something that I also wanted to add, like a uh, bus name or how you want to call it, uh, should not be uh, something complex, but I didn't get to it right now because. I have to skip some of the nodes for replication. Actually, the traffic is sent to them, but in the config file, based on the request URI, you can drop it. You cannot. Ha you can. Sk you, you check its DMQ. You check uh, the request URI because that identifies if it's for hash table and so on. And you then should, you firewall for net, uh, H table rules. Okay. Uh, so then you drop it, but then you still get the traffic. So there is the overhead there. It just you decide, okay, I don't need this DMQ message to me, I'm skipping from DMQ handle message or how it's called, I don't recall by hand right now that function. But uh, this is something that I wanted to have also like, yeah, for the front proxy to replicate the IP band DMQ, but that doesn't need to replicate to register, for example, but some other uh, hash tables I wanted uh, to be replicated. I think the H table I was wanting to uh, not replicate is uh, uh, for CPS limits, that I just want to keep that SLV and not yeah. all the, every packet being duplicated multiple times. So yeah, so it should not be because, yeah, it's like grouping this, giving a name to the notification and advertising. So it's doable, not something very sophisticated, but someone needs to get the time to implement it. But this is something that I also got to need it at some point, it's just that I didn't get the time to really made it. Julian made some contribution back in the days for uh, DMQ and replication or with user lock, right? Batching, so you are right if I remember correctly. Because at the beginning also with the replication of um, user lock was like trying to replicate everything at once and could get congestion on the network, right? So you have also like wait parameter now, like send a batch, then wait a bit, send another. So it's not much stress on the network. That so over the, over the time, uh, usually when you start a new node and you synchronize everything, that can put a lot of stress. But So we improve over the 
the years based on everyone's need. Um, so we have a Camaglio server running in production that is segfaulting from time to time. And we were unable to reproduce this in development or testing. What would be a good way to get rid of the bug? So it, it's like crashing. Yeah, the the it's best is, uh, that's always a feature, <laughs> crashing. Uh, the best is to have the core dump enabled. Uh, which uh, depends from system to system because some of the system now they have like up armor or something like that, they catch it on the fly. So it would be like setting um, U-limit for the core to unlimited first, have the user with the privilege of dumping because in the past pretty much every user could do it but that ended up to be a security issue. Uh, if you can afford of which is not advisable, of course, running as root, then you are safe. Otherwise, you need to grant permission to the user, Camaillo, to write uh, core files. Uh, then there are, uh, very important will be to enable at least uh, uh, one core per PID, per process, because you are multi-process, and usually the last, if one dies, that is a child, but the last one that actually crashes is the main attendant, which is not handling SIP traffic, but it's overwriting the core file. So then you see it crashed at the shutdown, but that's not the shutdown callback. So have at least this uh, uh, core dump per uh, PID enabled. The alternative is to set uh, uh, core file uh, pattern for the name and you can put some specifier to get the time, the PID, into the name of the core file, and then it's not overwriting. Otherwise, it's just core file as a name core, and one is crashing, writes one, then another Camaillo process could crash at that time, because if the first one that crashes leaves some inconsistent structure, the second one usually tries to clean up at shutdown, the main attendance, and we'll also write a core file overwriting the one that has the real reason. The second core is usually a side effect of the first crash. Dragos? Uh, for that problem, I recommend... Sorry, stop. <laughs> for that problem, uh, you can actually set, um, a, I, I don't know, some param sys control param parameters and things like that to have the PID um, suffixed to every core dump. Yeah. And then you have all of them, and yeah. you have to find the one that actually caused the problem, not the ones that just crashed yeah. along. It's good to look at all of them. So this is uh, one core per PID file. But, um, yeah, usually the last one is not the reason for the crash, the first one. Anyone else? Last question, chance, because Marcus. Will that be a developer meeting? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat it. Yeah, I uh, hope to have a developer meeting, and um, usually we had it in autumn. Uh, I think we had it only in November so far, although sometimes we try to do it on, um, during October. Definitely I'm for it, and I know you are uh, welcoming us uh, very well, so it's a good question. Everyone that wants to... A uh, camp in Dusseldorf, somewhere in uh, like October, November time frame. Uh, I don't think we'll uh, be able to do it in September because of holidays ending in August and everyone returning and has a lot of bunch to do. But yeah, the um, Marcus and his team at uh, SIPGATE are a very, very nice uh, uh, host. For us, you get there like a free breakfast, free, free lunch, evening event. Usually we had it two days, but if it's interested, we can make it three days. Drinks, food there, some nice uh, entertaining games, sort of uh, bowling, but German strange game with killing yourself virtually or kicking you out and uh, uh, many other uh, options there. So it's really nice, of course, you have to invest first time, which is usually a precious uh, resource, and then um, traveling and accommodation. 
If you need support, uh, write me if you really want to attend uh, and we'll try to figure out some support for you, at least partial. There we meet and discuss what's good to do for Camaillo. So it might not be coding, could be coding, could be documentation. Um, it's completely informal, no kind of registration. Uh, and um, you have to write me or Marcus so we know who expect and prepare the room and so on. But uh, yeah, so don't think you have to be a developer to attend it. But on the other hand, that meeting is not where you come and you want to just ask questions about using Camaillo. Of course, you can ask everyone, ask about this one, but don't think like I'm coming there and just to ask everyone. You have to come and think of how you can help Camaillo as well. I said documentation, infrastructure, packaging. At one point, we got Sergey, which is taking care of uh, or RPM packages from time to time. So, uh, yeah, nice location, good food, good uh, company there with the Sipgate team. Everything else you have to arrange. And a lot of fun discussion. Sometimes we did also online conference, but it's hard to focus to keep, you know, like uh, GTC Meet always on. And uh, last year, we uh, we were about 10 or so, if I remember, and the main outcome was this uh, like automatic management of issues and pull requests, uh, which pissed off some people, and I agree with that. Uh, closing is not always the solution, but we wanted also to get the uh, reporter of an issue active and engaged, because they reported, sometimes nobody takes care, there are two years, two new releases, you don't know if it's active, like still valid that report and you don't have as a developer the um, uh, time and resources to install an older version and uh, replicate or see if it's uh, still uh, for the latest release because if it's new addition the line in the code has shifted so if it's a backtrace it's not matching anymore the latest development version so yeah it's kind of volu volunteering and we want to fix it, but also the reporter has to stay engaged and practically it's about either making a comment to the issue and it's saying this is stalled, nobody's doing anything and you can make a comment and it's resetting. Or when it's adding this stall, you can, uh, if you have a developer, you can remove the label. But as an external contributor, you just have to make a short comment, no stale, or add, is still valid, or you, any comment, or just kind of a comment, no stale, or no close, and we'll revert it back. So it's not that we don't want to fix it, and what we want to hide it is just both sides have to be engaged in, in it, not just I'm throwing it, and then sometimes you ask a question, and they are not responding for uh, half a year, and then, we are closing it, but then it takes time. And then you also, with the new features, they request it, and then, then maybe they even change the company. They don't need it at all. OK, I think I'm over uh, Lorenzo's time, five minutes already, but he speaks quite fast. But I don't want to take more. I'll, I'll be in. Um, so Lorenzo, please set up. I'll be around uh, in some breaks, although a bit more engaged with the uh, administration, but uh, yeah, we can discuss uh, more. I can give this. And actually, I will have more time if you go in Napoli in 10 days, right, Lorenzo? Yeah. There I will not be all organizers. So if you have questions for Janus Gateway, here you can ask yeah. because they will be busy in 10 days. And I will be there and you can come there and ask me questions because I will be in the break and having drinks. And <laughs> so that's uh, your world and you're just... No, that's <laughs> ask me anything in Janus for Camaillo and here it's like ask him during the breaks about uh, Janus. Lorenzo, thank you for uh, uh, coming and when I saw the title, I knew it is 
for the morning session because it's like I'm a drunk or drunk or something <laughs> like that or sober. Definitely after the cocktail party. But yeah, Janus Gateways, pretty much everyone knows, a cool project in open source space, especially for WebRTC and interconnecting uh, web services with legacy, let's call it like that. <laughs> but anyhow, I let uh, uh, Lorenzo to present more, and thank you again for coming. The floor is yours. Well, thank you for having me here once more. I'm always happy to, uh, to be here. And uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, I, don't, I don't think that you are seeing the slides, though. Yeah, because it showed the content. Sorry, I'm the wrong. But Skeletor is better. Skeletor is better, yeah. <laughs> I think that for some reason, yeah, it's not showing the content where it should be. No, 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 it's my problem. I should move this. Uh, I saw, here. Yeah, I saw no, that was my, the future was of my telephony. Problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, this talk, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll show some ignorance during this talk, so please bear with me, mostly because I was interested in experimenting a bit with SIP trunking, but uh, I'm, I don't work with SIP every day as you do, so I'll probably say some things that may piss you off or may show a bit, a bit more ignorance from my side that I, hope to be, that, I'm, that I hope to show, but hopefully it will be fine in the end. And so, again, just, just a very quick slide about me. I got my PhD at the University of Naples, and with some colleagues there, we, we created a small company in the south of Italy called Miteco, and I'm mostly known as the main author of Janus. There are some links there if you want to learn a bit more about what I do for work or for, for fun. And yeah, Miteco is a small company that mostly does consulting support, very focused on standardization and open source, SIP, WebRTC, and all these kind of things. And talking about Janus specifically, uh, Daniel already anticipated some uh, a bit about Janus. Janus is, in general, a WebRTC server that we conceived as open source and general purpose as much as possible, meaning that it has a pluggable architecture to, to work with different kind of requirements and scenarios. One of them, of course, uh, very important being SIP. And um, the way that Janus works with SIP, it has a plugin that is called the Janus SIP plugin that basically acts as a collection of endpoints. So when you use Janus as a WebRTC gateway, Janus is not working as a SIP server, so as you would normally expect, but basically just for each user that connects, each WebRTC user that is con interested in interacting with the SIP world, Janus creates an, a local endpoint, a local to Janus endpoint on behalf of that user. So you can see the Janus API in this case like a remote control for that SIP stack that lives in there. So the WebRTC user says, I want to call this SIP URI, then it's Janus that from that endpoint creates the SIP invite and maintains the related dialogue to, in a nutshell. So that on, from Jan between Janus and the SIP infrastructure, you have SIP and then possibly encrypted or not encrypted uh, RTP and so on. And on the WebRTC side, you never do see SIP at all. So, you may see CPU arise, but you never see actual SIP dialogues or something like this, which is something that, I mean, that uh, we, we did on purpose. So Janus says is indeed a collection of endpoints and not a server trunk. We implemented the SIP part using Sophia, which is the same stack that FreeSwitch uses and maintains. Uh, media, we never transcode, so we just relay it, which is the easiest way to implement a gateway in that sense, because since SIP endpoints and WebRTC endpoints actually share most of the same multimedia stack. So we, they both use RTP, they both use SDP. The codex can also be pretty much the same if you stick to the mandatory to implement WebRTC codex. Then transcoding is not something that you really do need. We support recordings out of the box and stuff like this. And this is something that we did on purpose because just to simplify life to web developers, including us, because we didn't really want to maintain at the state of a SIP dialogue within uh, JavaScript or a web page, for instance, which can be quite complicated. You can use libraries for this, but it's still a bit problematic. So in, we just wanted to send a message to say, call this, call this person, maybe an event to tell us that we are being called, simplify the management of how uh, events and the call flow works, basically. And we, we do have support for a few features, but that's not really important here. 
uh, of course, it works great with Camaglio, uh, because, for instance, if you remember, I was last year when I presented something related to real-time text, and I did a very silly demo during the Dangerous Demos, where I, where I used my own uh, point-and-click adventure engine as a SIP uh, stack that implemented real-time text, and I used that through Camaglio to chat with, with the browser that was implementing uh, using the SIP plugin to talk via data channels to that SIP endpoint on the other end. And this was all done using Camaglio as the way to, to bridge everything from, uh, from a SIP perspective. And all this to say that in practice, the way that the SIP plugin works right now, this means that if I have different users, two users, five, 100, and so on and so forth, for each of these users, within Janus, I'm actually creating a different SIP stack. Because again, for each user, I'm creating a different SIP endpoint, a different SIP client that lives within Janus, with Janus, the, the Janus SIP plugin being its container, which means I have different SIP stacks, each of them having their own media, uh, depending on whether or not there is a call active for each of them, uh, and so on and so forth. And over the years, I mean, and this works, I mean, this works nicely. There's a lot of companies using Janus for SIP gateway purposes. But over the years, there have been people that have asked me, why don't we add some form of trunking support to Janus? Basically, having some sort of a single, single pipe over which I can take care of all the SIP, uh, SIP, in, SIP interactions rather than having to create all those C different endpoints uh, in the background, and so on and so forth. Which, as I'll show in the presentation, is not that easy just because of how it's con the, the current implementation of SIP is uh, within Janus. Because again, Janus is not a server. It's not a SIP server where trunking may make more sense. It is a collection of endpoints. So it's actually implementing a lot of clients. So it does mean changing a bit the, the perspective and the approach uh, in that regard. Which, first of all, and this is where I first started showing my, my big ignorance, what is a trunk anyway from a practical perspective? Because from a, let's say, from a general perspective, I get the idea, but then when I wanted to start having a look at, okay, what does it mean in a practical perspective? What do I need to do to actually implement a SIP, uh, SIP trunk in practice? Then you start Googling around and there's a lot of marketing fluff out there. I mean, you're probably all familiar with this. You start looking into something, and then you encounter a blog post of uh, 1,000 words, and none of them really matter to what you wanted to, to figure out. I mean, it's, it was very little technical details, a lot of fluff. And it wasn't really clear to me at the beginning what this was, because in general, they, they talk about yeah, ag aggregating a lot of analog lines, but in the digital world and so on. But for me, this is what SIP has always been. So, it basically uh, already allows you to do as many calls as you want. You don't have the same limitations as with PSTN or something like this in terms of how many channels and so on and so forth. You, you already have that kind of freedom. So you start digging a bit more. It's more it, 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 becomes, it became a bit clearer when I started to see it as a way to connect, for instance, private and public domains, as some put it. More in general, some sort of an interconnection between two SIP servers, for instance, via IP-based peering. So I have this address, I have this address. We are the only ones allowed to talk to each other. Maybe, I don't know, maybe some authentication involved somewhere. I don't really know. But in general, if I see it like this, so just as, let's say, a, a generic interconnection mechanism rather than whatever additional marketing is behind that word itself, it did make a bit more sense to me. So I started to see the benefit in, in what people were asking me about. So because there are some things that Janus could benefit from uh, in that case, because for instance, I could use it to ensure that all WebRTC calls from WebRTC users go through a specific server. And this is in, it's something that we could already do with outbound proxies, but, outbound proxies, but in general, it's a nice property to have. Most importantly, we could ensure that all incoming calls for WebRTC users would all come from the same place as well, which is not something that we can really enforce in Janus at the moment, mostly because, again, as I said, Janus is a collection of endpoints, and each of those endpoints may be configured entirely differently. Maybe this user is using this proxy, this user is using this other infrastructure, 
as, long, as soon as you have a SIP contact that is the one implemented at that point, in theory, anyone from the internet can call those addresses if you don't have any additional filtering in place. And also, interesting, interestingly, it also opened the door to maybe get rid of registrations where we may not need them. So imagine, for instance, a contact center that is implemented via WebRTC. You have a series of endpoints that you know will be handling some specific calls. You don't want all those endpoints to register. You just want to, to tell the SIP infrastructure all calls that are, that are meant for any of these addresses, send them to me, I'll take care of it, basically, in, in a nutshell. And this was also an interesting, uh, interesting thing that I wanted to look into. It did mean, though, that I had to start studying a bit how to implement all this in JAMS. Because, and I'll say this again because it's an important point. JAMS is a collection of endpoints and not a SIP server. So it's not that easy to, to change that paradigm. And so I mentioned how I, can, I could already enforce uh, the way out. So for instance, I, we can already set an outbound, pro outbound proxy if we want traffic to always go through a server for outgoing calls. But there is, for instance, no current limitation on, uh, current way to constrain the incoming traffic. To say, for instance, only allow incoming calls if they come from this infrastructure and ignore everything that is coming from somewhere else in a, in a nutshell. And when I started to look into it from a practical perspective, so what should I actually implement to make this work? I saw a couple of different approaches. One of them was I could try to implement an internal small, very limited scope proxy within Janus, and that would basically act as the SIP server that I would need to inter in interact with from a peering perspective with, uh, with other proxies. Or I could refactor the SIP plugin to also allow more WebRTC users to not necessarily create a new SIP stack for each of them, but maybe just create a single SIP stack and allow them to share this SIP stack to, um, to do what they need to do. And in, I mean, when I started looking into this, both of them have pros and cons, because I mean, implementing an internal proxy seemed like the easiest idea, let's say in theory simpler, because it meant that I could add this new component within Jams that would implement the proxying and trunking part, and then everything else I could leave exactly the same. So I could keep the, each, each WebRTC user is an endpoint logic within Janus, and then these, these users would all ref, uh, refer to that internal proxy for their own communication, which is a pro in this case because it means that I have to touch the SIP plugin code as little as possible. I don't really need to mess too much with it. And, but it also means that it's, of course, not simple at all because we are all here because we are talking about Camaleo and we all know how writing a proxy is not an easy, an easy thing at all, even if it's such a limited scope thing as, uh, as I wanted it to do. And besides, I mean, it would also be, a, let's say, a, I wrote a silent, hidden, and unneeded hope in the middle. So in local host, you are adding an additional hope that you don't really need to do. It can be problematic for a ton of different reasons. So I soon uh, stepped away from this approach and started looking into the, let's see if I can just refactor the plugin to allow for a different logic as well. And so the idea was, let's try to possibly use, create a single Sophia SIP stack that I'll then allow multiple WebRTC users to borrow for their own dialogue, let's say. This was the, the main idea. And this would allow me, since I would have a single SIP stack for the context of these, uh, for these users, I could implement the peer within this single stack. So I could, for instance, enforce an outbound proxy for that single stack so that I would guarantee things on the way out. For incoming dialogues, I could process incoming calls to check, first of all, whether or not they were coming from the peer that I was peering with in term, as far as, as trunking is concerned. And then if the incoming call is for a user that I'm currently managing, then I can do something with, that, with it. Otherwise, I can just get rid of the call. And of course, the con here is that in this case, I do have to make some work on the plugin code because uh, this is not something that the current plugin offers. Because again, uh, at the moment, each WebRTC user has its own SIP stack, which means more work in terms of user management, cleanup, references, all that kind of stuff. 
But it of, it's, of course, much easier to implement than a full proxy, and it gives me also some more flexibility in terms of what I want to do uh, with, the, uh, with the calls. And so the idea in a nutshell was, if this is what I want to do, it was mostly working on that part over there. So ensuring that with that single SIP stack that, that handles multiple users, I could actually implement this. So ensure that I wouldn't step, uh, that I wouldn't have calls from one user step on the feet of another user, and ensure that there was, let's say, no problem in implementing all this uh, in a practical way. And from an implementation perspective, this meant that I did have to, to make quite some changes. So I won't bore you too much with the code details, but in principle it meant that besides the existing structure that I have for maintaining a SIP stack associated to a SIP user associated with a WebRTC user, I also created a new structure that would represent, from an abstract perspective, a trunk itself. And for the moment, I is stuck to just IP peering for these trunks. So when you create a trunk, you say, uh, I'm binding to this local address over here, and I'm only, I only want to talk to this remote address over here. And then there is some enforcement done to ensure that that happens uh, as needed. Then I create a SIP stack uh, associated to these uh, fake SIP participant, because in this case, I reuse the, some properties of the SIP plugin, because the, the trunk is indeed a SIP user as far as the plugin is concerned. So I reuse that part, I associate it with the trunk as a fake participant. I enforce the participant at the network level, so that if I get, for instance, a SIP message from, the, from an address that is not the address of the trunk that I know about, at the moment, and this is again just me guessing how this might work, I just send a 403 back, but I mean, uh, there may be other ways to deal with it. Maybe uh, the traffic would be ignored entirely. You could send something else. So I, I mean, I really don't know. I'm, I'm here also to ask you questions in this context. And then from a user perspective, so we have a demo, a demo page that we use to test all the functionality of the SIP plugin, which looks a bit like a a web, web phone, let's say. So the, normally you, you put your, the SIP server that you want to register at, you put your credentials, stuff like this, and then Janus creates the endpoint for you. When you want to use the trunk stack, you basically just say, okay, this is my SIP URI, I'm not going to register, but I want to use the SIP trunk that you created for me there. And so when that happens, basically the Janus just keeps track of the SIP URI that you want to be known as, so that it knows that uh, this is an address that should be able to receive calls even though there, were no, uh, there is no registration involved. Which means that, yeah, the, the mapping between uh, a WebRTC user and its uh, CPURI is all done locally within Janus itself when we use this approach. And so again, for outgoing dialogues, we just reuse that shared stack that we created in, at the beginning. So no matter how many WebRTC users I have, if they are using the trunk, they use that SIP dialog to create, for instance, an invite on the way out. On the way in, I other check if uh, it's a dialog that I'm maintaining. And since I'm using Sophia SIP, it means uh, if it is a new handle that I know about, for instance. And so in that case, I know which user I should notify about that. If it is a new invite for a new call, very simply, I look at the headers, I say, ah, okay, this is a call for Lorenzo. Lorenzo is a user I'm managing. It's here, I send a notification via the Janus API to that user, and that user can then get it from there, and then that user is responsible for that SIP dialogue, in, really in a nutshell. And then we also did some additional magic in the code itself just to, to avoid that calls associated to specific users would clog the loop associated to that single SIP stack because now we have a single SIP stack that is responsible for multiple things and we don't want that, that loop to be kept busy because we are negotiating a peer connection with somebody, for instance. So anytime there is an event meant for a specific user, we just queue it to that specific user thread and that thread is now responsible for, for instance, taking care of the negotiations aspect of it. And so in, really in a nutshell, this is a sequence diagram, hopefully it's readable enough, but the idea very simply is, for instance, I register uh, as to, uh, to, uh, to Janus uh, as a trunk user, I just say, um, I am goofy from now on, 
John also says, okay, I'll, I'll associate Goofy to you uh, from now on. I created a, a, a tri trunk with a C proxy on the other side. I receive a call from that C proxy, which is meant for Mickey Mouse. I check Mickey Mouse. No, Mickey Mouse is not a user I'm handling. Send the 404 back. I receive a new SIP invite for Goofy. Goofy is a user I'm managing. I just received a notification for that user. I pass that incoming call event to that WebRTC user instead. And then everything works as expected. Then a different proxy contacts me to, to contact maybe Goofy or Mickey Mouse or something else. It's not, the source address is not the one that I was expecting. It's not the peer that I created the peering with. I send a four or three back. Really, this is just uh, bird's view of what I implemented right now. And I mean, it already kind of works, at least in the way that I had envisioned it, so in the way that I had understood how tranking worked in the first place, but there is indeed a lot missing because, as I mentioned at the moment, I'm only enforcing this peering at the network level, but again, I'm, I really don't know if that is enough. I really don't know if, for instance, telco providers or anything else provide Tranking in different ways. Is sometimes anything required at the SIP level to get this to work? I, I really don't know. Maybe peering could be done at the TLS level, maybe the exchange certificates or something like this. Again, that's something that I really don't know and I hope um, you'll maybe clarify this a bit for more for me. So I would love to know if there is more that I need to do in order to implement tranking a better way. Also, to make things simpler, in the first proof of concept that I created, and that is, uh, it is a, a branch on Janus, if you want to, to test it, it's already out there. I basically just create a single hard-coded trunk that either you want to use or you don't. And of course, it's, this is limited because it, ideally we may want to have multiple trunking with multiple proxies if possible, even creating them dynamically when possible. There's also no authorization enforced on WebRTC either in this proof of concept. And I mentioned that there is no registration, so there is no challenge present for, for instance, via SIP, because when we are using this trunk, no registration ever happens, so there is no, in nowhere is there a place where we are asking for a credentials or a challenge or something like this which is something that in the long run we may want to do, because even if we are doing these mappings locally to say, uh, I am Goofy, okay, I will handle all calls for Goofy and pass them to you. We may want to ensure that the user that says I am Goofy is indeed Goofy. And then this is, of course, just at the Janus level, because between Janus and users, there is no SIP involved. So it's just a matter of ensuring that we may have some database of people that we want to handle at the Janus level and maybe guarantee at, at the very least some basic uh, ways to ensure that, for instance, uh, a user claiming to want to receive calls for, for that user in these Janus instances, would they say they are? You can they just challenge invites. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is one of the potential uh, approaches. So this is not something that I'm currently doing, though. So this is part of what I want to, to do in the future. And, and this is more related to the refactoring that I did. So first of all, uh, I mentioned how normally for new WebRTC users, we create a SIP endpoint on the fly, which means that normally if the WebRTC user is not there and not connected to Janus, if I receive a SIP call for the endpoint that the WebRTC user usually uses, if the endpoint doesn't exist, I will just ignore the call because I will not be there as an endpoint to handle it. But if I am creating that single SIP stack for as a trunk user, then I will always receive an invite for a specific endpoint if the peering is configured as such. And so if I am Lorenzo and Janus receives a call for siplorenzo at example.com, then it may make sense not to send the 404 right away. It may make sense to instead use the Janus API or something else to notify the WebRTC user, wherever they are, and tell them, uh, look, there is a call for you and you're not connected. Maybe connect and I'll... I'll wait a bit for you before just sending a 404 for that call. Meaning that we could do, uh, for instance, associate this with a bit with push notifications and so on and so forth. But this is, again, just a broad idea about trying to break a limitation that we currently have that, and that may be helpful not to have if, we, if you use this. And this is really it, and I'm open to questions. And before, of course, uh, before going to that, I'll just reiterate what Daniel said. We are having 
Janus Con in about 10 days, and Janus Con is basically what Camaglio World is to Camaglio. So we, we are really looking forward to that. We'll also have presentations about SIP, and we are happy to have Daniel join us for the second time as well. And that's really it. I'm, I'm open to questions if you have any. Thank you. Guys, first. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> but don't worry about open source in 10 days. You come there and you have pizza, pasta. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm naive on WebRTC for Janus. Mm -hmm. um, would it support, let's say, a, a WebSocket invite? So, like, if I sent via WebSockets a, an invite to people, would people get it? No, the idea with Janus is that uh, when you see, for instance, the HTTP WebSockets and stuff like this, this, this is all meant uh, on the WebRTC side. I mean, this is always an HTTP or WebSocket transport for the Janus API. So WebRTC users, whether they are using the C plugin or other things, they always use the Janus API, which is a JSON-based protocol that has its own logic. And so different plugins then implement a different sub-protocol within the context of the Janus API. And for the SIP plugin, this means a simplified JSON API that then somehow maps to the, the SIP dialogues that you are going to create. So for instance, when you want to call somebody, I want to call you, I will say request call URI SIP Fred at uh, LOD.com, for instance. And so this is all I do from the Janus API perspective, so more simple. And then the Janus SIP plugin turns that into a new SIP dialog then, then is sent over either plain UDP or TCP or TLS, depending on how it is configured, which means that from SIP to the SIP infrastructure, you just use the uh, regular approach of creating a SIP dialog, which is why, I mean, we created this in the first place to, to allow any SIP infrastructure that may know nothing about WebRTC at all to communicate with WebRTC users, because as far as they are concerned, they see just basic SIP over UDP, for instance, and unencrypted RTP, so something that may be as simple as they need it to be. Any sort of encryption or more complex management is dealt, dealt with by Janus on their side. So we don't support SIP over WebSockets because in that case we don't, we don't do this. But you could do, if you really do need that part because you want to handle SIP on your own or stuff like this, we have a different plugin that is called No SIP, which is basically a, <laughs> which is basically a clone of the SIP plugin without all the SIP management. So it only acts as a media gateway in that sense. Okay. <laughs> I mean, how would one Janus, like let's say you were doing um, a Janus to Janus, like I had one instance and another instance, how would they normally communicate through, you'd initiate it with an API call, I guess? Yeah, in this case, for instance, the different users, that different SIP users, uh, different WebRTC users that want to use SIP, they may refer to the same Janus instance or not. And, but the way it, they communicate with each other only if the SIP infrastructure behind them decides that they need to communicate with each other. So for instance, it could be, if it is a direct call, it may be through a Camaglio proxy, for instance, in the back. So both of them would refer, for instance, to Camaglio. I send a request, to, uh, send an invite to Fred at uh, LOD.com. This gets to the Camaglio, the Camaglio uh, proxy, and Camaglio knows that I am registered via Janus, and so the endpoint is in that Janus instance over there. Camilla would proxy it to the SIP endpoint that, that he knows, and so the, the request goes there, it's handled by the Janus SIP endpoint, Janus notifies the user via Janus API, and they say, okay, accept the call, and this is my SDP. So this is how it works, really, in, in two words. Yeah. Hello. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, just a small idea for improvement is to have a failover trunk. It's the first one. <laughs> like, quite a, but uh, uh, my question is that uh, uh, do you see an uh, impact on the memory footprint? Means in the sense, if you are creating a multiple, uh, like a classic way, uh, multiple SIP stacks, and uh, it affects the memory, and uh, if you are creating only one, do you have? Uh, did you make some te load test or something? No, I mean, no load testing yet, mostly because this was really just a proof of concept to 
to check whether or not the idea made sense and whether or not it could be implemented easily enough in the first place. So this is all part of uh, future work because I want to see the impact. First of all, I want to check that nothing breaks for more calls than, than I made the simple tests with these sort of things. But I do expect that in general the memory footprint should be lower, but in general the management of SIP stacks within Janus is not that high in terms of memory usage. So we, we managed to, to make hundreds if not more of calls even in the, in the previous approach. So I don't expect many issues there. Okay, last question and to keep you from the coffee. Some of you really need it. Thank you very much for the presentation. Most of my questions were, were already uh, asked by our colleagues, but we are using a very similar strategy with mm -hmm. our with our product, and the the same concept is done, but with older plugins. So it's it's a very good news that you have this uh, already present. Uh, so my first question is. Uh, this part related to the without don't have authentication uh, it opens it the, completely the use of the trunk so any user using any kind of uh, endpoint can access the server and just use the system it's uh, something that we need to fix some way and the other the other thing is what you said about the 404 when the uh, webrtc endpoint is not created yeah uh, did you uh, think about the uh, default uh, callback or something similar? Because what we are doing right now is on a previous step, just to call a, an endpoint to uh, launch a push notification or whatever. But the idea is, uh, do you have something in mind, like uh, wait a little bit, um, <laughs> as you previously said? Thank you. Yeah, no, I, this is again just, um, this was just, uh, an idea that uh, that I had in mind. So um, I knew that this opened the door to this possibility that was not there before, because before the C endpoint wasn't there, so the proxy would never even even try to con connect to it. Now the proxy always sends us, us traffic meant for us, and so it's up to us to decide what to do with it. And so one of the ideas may be create a new way of notifying something, which could also be uh, for instance, associating a generic HTTP backend that I always notify with a custom message any time that I receive a, an invite from somebody that, that I don't know who they are because there is no local mapping. And so this could be one example, maybe create a, a callback mechanism where I send an HTTP request and then wait until a response comes back to decide what, what to do with it. Maybe I send uh, 100 right away and then I say, no, okay, it's, it's not there or something like this. But it's really now in the realm of this is a possibility. Then how we actually implement it is something that we can discuss at limit. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, it's quite late, so catch. Oh, thank you very much. Him. Thanks. <laughs> Better at uh, Janusz Kohn because he has to hurry today as well. He needs to prepare. I finished today, he, his next week is something that I don't want to remember. But before the lunch break, quickly, to give a book uh, away, and I should ask Milica here to extract someone, because, yeah, to see who. Ilie Soltanich. Okay, so, thank you. The book here. So just to show it, but I'll have to replace it because I see this is a bit damaged from the oh. packaging, but I'll give you another one uh, in the break. Okay, so we have coffee break. It's a bit shorter. Maybe we start a bit, a few minutes late, but not too late, not to delay the day too long. Thank you, and see you in uh, 20, 25 minutes around.
uh, space, not only Kamaelio, like this extension for Homer SIP capture, but also like uh, SIP grep, for example. Yeah, it was first application, exactly. Yeah, and then Homer SIP capture is uh, the, the founder, the initial developer, and uh, always gets its hands dirty with uh, complex but uh, useful uh, uh, solution. Okay, Alexander, thanks for coming to all this. Yeah, thank you and, uh, to be invited. Yeah, so it's uh, very pr proud to be here. Thank you so much. So we can start, the guys. Okay, we will come later. So um, about me, I'm Alexander Dubuykov, um, CTO of QXAP, father of Hep, Hep Homer, and my son Maxim. So I developer, always more than 30 years. So I'm really old already. Um, to develop and contributed a lot of open source projects, like it's, it's written on, on this, this slide. Uh, QXAP is a company who developed uh, and support Hepic and Homer, and also our new product, um, it's querying. Yeah. So it's everything for web observability and etc. we do inside. So packet sniffing, uh, who knows what is, what is eBPF? Okay. Good. Yeah, so last year, <laughs> exactly, I, I um, uh, showed this topic about eBPF. Just let me uh, short introduce what about eBPF. eBPF, it's ex uh, extended BPF filter, uh, Berkeley, uh, Berkeley packet filter. Everybody uses it, uh, normal uh, Berkeley packet filter daily, yeah, if you're involved with voice RIP, especially capturing uh, TCP dump, uh, TCP, TCP trace, etc. You use BPF to filter some packets, for example, port, port range, IP, host, host and also you can make some um, additional filtering for IP headers, CDP headers, and, and, and et cetera. So the guys, uh, normally it's a BPF, a BPF filter, it's a, a special instructions you, which compile to, to like assembler code, yeah? and it's put to kernel, and kernel use this uh, uh, instructions to filter uh, data what you uh, you want to display, but normally it works only for capturing. You know, for socket row, uh, you can attach the socket and uh, do this stuff. The guys from Linux, uh, is Stravoitov, uh, um, Sergei Stravoitov, he extend this stuff, and now it's called eBPF filter. Normally, uh, before eBPF. Uh, if you would like to develop some cool stuff, you have to do, do kernel module. You know? For example, everybody uses LTP engine. Yeah? So LTP engine, we have kernel module which uploaded in kernel and controls all this stuff. What LTP streams go to, from left to right and so on, and so on. But this is very dangerous because if you will make any mistake in kernel module, it will be crashed your system completely. So in eBPF, it's not. You can write a uh, module. It will be exactly uploaded to kernel. And with special instructions, you can write in C. It will be compiled to bytecode. It will be uploaded. And it started in, like in virtual machine. Yeah? If anything it happens in this model, it will be crashed only this model. It will be not crash your system. Uh, and this eBPF stuff, it's extended. It's, you can do not only uh, network stuff, but you can also attach to user space to kernel space, uh, to see all functions, make uh, TCP um, tracing, UDP tracing, uh, latency, and so on, so on, a lot, of, a lot of stuff. It's very powerful because it's connected directly to kernel. It's use event, so event uh, stuff from kernel, and it's no impact on your system. Uh, probably you, if you are familiar with Linux uh, shell and so on, you have uh, this BP, uh, BPF tools. And inside, uh, it's already exists some BPF, uh, BPF tools which can be used and attached to any, let's say, processing. Yeah? Uh, it's uh, written on Python. It's a compiled uh, C code inside uh, this Python library. And uh, you can exactly monitor any, anything what you see here. Um, just to recap, uh, last Camellia world, I, uh, I introduced uh, LTC agent. Uh, which use eBPF filter stuff, eBPF model, uh, and we displayed how it works. So it's a Go application which compiled uh, eBPF model, attach uh, to uh, Camellia to free switch. We can attach to 
any uh, uh, function of, uh, of uh, Camarillo, for example. We have this connect, send, receive. We attach it to receive uh, stuff. We attach it to send stuff. And we can see uh, which messages Camarillo sends. So we can also get parameters uh, from these functions. We can uh, convert this structure to, uh, to readable uh, params and send to Homer, for example. Last year, I displayed what, how we can do it. Um, and uh, this is very cool because you don't need to use any uh, zip trace model inside. You can attach directly to functions. You can copy uh, everything what you received, and so on and so on. Later, I can show you. But is it good enough? No. So, it's me, yeah. So demo time. Uh, um, one second. Yeah, uh, one second. So, uh, normally, in uh, we uh, so, sorry, um, in the TC agent we extended uh, code, and now we can uh, monitor uh, also Camellio side. But let me uh, first uh, to explain why. Because normally, if you have Camellio, some troubles. Yeah. So what do you do? You check logs file. Yeah. You activate the logs file, and everything is outside. But what if the problem is will be not visible in the log file? How you can debug it? You, it's impossible. Yeah? Therefore, we develop application in the TC agent. We develop a special monitor. We can attach to any sys calls, user calls, network calls, and we can see the latency in each uh, function. For example, let me show you. As usual, I finished it uh, uh, two days ago. Uh, so we uh, run main RTC agent. So we introduced this RTC agent monitor. Hmm? Ooh. One second. It's always a problem here, one second. Uh, control pass, yeah? Nah, doesn't work. One second. It's as usual. It's last time. It was exactly the same problem. <coughs> Control shift plus. Control shift plus. Okay. Yeah. It's better. So uh, minus h. Here we can do uh, syscall. Yeah. For example. So we, it's our binary is Camaillo. User has been Camaillo. Camarillo, so it's all good. And now we can check syscalls. Syscall, eh? boom. So here is the syscalls. We attach it this monitor to Camarillo, and now it's sorted by latency. Latency is nanoseconds, but you see with Camarillo with, with speed. So normally, let me show you. Uh, it's because scroll, scrolled. So it's uh, okay. Note it's my note. Timestamp can be also in nanoseconds. Application Camarillo. So we attach uh, to any uh, events from kernel, but we filter only Camarillo. We can attach to any applications normally. PIT, TIT, it's exactly PIT of Camarillo. Cisco, which is Cisco, it has been executed in uh, system library. Epoch wait, you will see uh, uh, and read. It's the most, uh, let's say, busy application in Camarillo. So we can also attach to see. What exactly uh, what uh, process Camellia use, which functions is used, but with the system functions. But is it enough? No. What we can do else? Uh, we can also uh, attach to user uh, to user functions. So, for example, uh, we implemented uh, in here is a show user function function function. Yeah. No, oh, it's wrong spelled. Functions, yeah. Boom. So, and let's see. It's inside, this is exactly what in, you have inside of Camarillo, these functions. And receive message. Yeah? So, we have this receive message. And when, let's connect to receive message. Boom. No, it's wrong. Uh, oops. Ah, yeah, sorry. As usual, 
uh, function receive message and uh, network uh, uh, user chrome. Yeah. So now let's send some traffic to Kamailu, run zipzock. Boom, send. And what we see? So we, had, we see what uh, during this traffic, receive message takes this latency. So it's uh, 2,000 uh, nanoseconds. And we send three packets. It's received, displayed, and we can do troubleshooting, attach. For example, yesterday it was a good um, um, case how we can make, um, let's say, uh, least cost routing based on uh, latency. So you can attach this application and see based on IP and so on, how big latency is uh, from this, this IP. And based on this information, we can uh, rebuild our routing for trunking. So is it enough? No, it's not enough. Let's show me something else, what we can do. So again, we can attach to any user, uh, user functions what you develop in Camellia, and also in, in model, Camellia model. Uh, and let's make network now. Network. Call. And let's send another calls. Yeah? Boom. Send. And what we see here, we see this zip zack, Yeah, Send this packet. And we see also details, status of TCP handshakes, how long it takes. We see final, close, and so on. This information, we also will have latency. We can do really develop and uh, this least cost routing based on this application, or well, this information. So you can extend it, you can attach, and so on. Is it enough? Not, not, not enough, because uh, the dream is how we can connect it system calls, user calls, networking, and also zip trace model. Yeah? Uh, is it possible with the EBPF application? Yes, it's possible. And uh, it exists application from Cloudflare. It's called eBPF Export, and uh, I develop a model for eBPF Export. It's called also Camille. It's pub published already. And let's see if it works. So we start export, and we send some traffic. Okay, one more time. Okay, it's already bind, it's already sent. Uh, this information we send to querying. So it's all, all, also our product, it's observability platform, which we can uh, collect all data and so on and so on. Uh, we can send like open telemetry and let's see if we can find any calls here. Okay, we found. It's a receive message. We click it. Okay. And let's uh, make a filter by system calls. And this was receive message. Okay. Let's scroll, 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 scroll. Okay. So if you see, we have a read. We can see each um, nanoseconds uh, delay, latency, which uh, calls, system calls. It was sent to. It's, it's, you can, you can, it's connected session already. So we connected all with syscalls to network calls. Now we connected to receive message. Receive message is our user, user system, uh, application, uh, user functions. And what else? And we also capture zip, uh, zip uh, packet inside. So we connected really syscall, network calls, and real zip application. So it's connected at once. You can troubleshoot. You can find the call ID. And you will see how Camellia proceed for this uh, call ID inside. How take network call, uh, how takes uh, how many uh, latency uh, nanoseconds it take. User functions how uh, proceed. You can also to see uh, exit code of functions. For example, if functions return zero, it means it's okay. Yeah? So it's uh, how you develop. If it's return minus one my, or two, it means what is something happens and you can troubleshoot. So it works. Uh, any question? No? No? Yeah. I did not expect that. At least I kept 
quiet. Yes, you learn. <laughs> but they cannot turn it on any longer. It does not want to talk to you. <laughs> okay. Story of my life. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so, uh, one thing that I'd be interested in, uh, because it doesn't exist, is uh, to be able to trace the messages from comma Elio to RTP engine, the control messages. So, I think it, it looks like it should be doable with the eBPF uh, by uh, latching on uh, to the message to set that for sending uh, to RTP engine and receiving to RTP engine. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering, like, uh, is there on your command line to say, okay, I want uh, to just uh, send to uh, uh, to HEP uh, the uh, parameter, uh, the message buffer uh, on the send and receive of RTP engine, and then I can go yeah. and correlate it. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. Okay, because yeah, I saw you. You filtered on function, but I didn't see you. No, no, say, okay. Uh, uh, on parameter. Probably it's it's a little bit confusing, but uh, yeah, it's possible. Um, my case in this case uh, in this topic, it was to to show what you can correlate SIP, so user user replication, yeah, uh, it's mm -hmm. OSI uh, six, yeah, mm -hmm. to uh, system calls, mm -hmm. to net, uh, user uh, user calls, user functions, and you can exactly to see and troubleshoot chameleon side how chameleon proceed. This is more for development. It's not for end user, but it's more, more for Daniel or for another developer who developed a chameleon model. And, and also, if in, in Kub uh, Kubernetes, you can also touch to any chameleon instances and see how it's proceed. Maybe it's your Docker, let's say your Kubernetes image. It's uh, it's worse and take a little more CPU and you can exactly attach and see uh, which um, uh, user space or user function uh, makes worse processing, yeah? So also, you can attach, in Camarillo, why I told what you can attach to any uh, user space function. You can, for example, attach to a scale query execution in Camarillo and, and make a, a measurement for latency, how long this scale execution takes, yeah? This is more important. So, and you can see, ah, okay, this is a uh, scale execution takes a little bit longer. It's something happens to me with my, my database. So you can uh, find the problem before you then go to the, the DB guys and say, ah, can you check why it's uh, database is proceed, uh, let's say, wrong, yeah, or slow. So you can, you can see it's already in Camellio. You can trace without to touch any code of Camellio. You can attach it, you can connect it, and you can, uh, you can validate it. So uh, everything what I displayed uh, or uh, discussed about how you can collect now SIP trace data, you can connect metrics, you can connect, connect open telemetry and a lot of this stuff and what we can do. And uh, uh, all this data we have developed or we, de we still continue developing uh, HOMA 10, which normally it's not only about SIP, uh, it's not about only tracing um, stuff in, uh, from your application, it's, all, it's also about logging, monitoring, uh, um, uh, statistics, and a lot of this stuff. Uh, uh, so uh, this HOMA 10, it's a, it's a new, new generated application of uh, I mean, what HOMA 7 does, but a little bit more. So it's, it's based on, on querying. It's our application which receives uh, HEP data. It receives also a logging, open telemetry, and so on and so on. You can use, uh, we develop also Grafana plugin. Uh, for example, Tori used it yeah, already, and it works well. Like he displayed yesterday, it's uh, correlation works, everything is works. And inside of Grafana, you can uh, have the uh, Homer plugin. Uh, so normally, it's plugin. You can make search, you can see data, you can uh, make a chart flow, you can connect this call, uh, call to uh, statistics, to metrics. Like I displayed, you can also use Tempo from, uh, from Grafana. Tempo service, it's already included in querying. And you can see an expert make alerts on any data what uh, you store it in home. So, um, like I said, it's, uh, it's centralized uh, st uh, platform for logging, for CDRs, and so on. You can do profiling for your customer, you can do a lot of, uh, lot of cool stuff inside. So, it's... Uh, 100% compatible with HEP, you can send data. You can, exactly like I said, it's a call flow, it's already inside. You can cl click on any messages, it will be displayed, everything what is sent, and, and so on, so on. So it's, uh, it's 
lock agent, you can also use not only our agents, you can also use exter external agents. Yeah? So you can, with vector or um, with uh, ALU from Grafana, you can send data to Homer to collect the display, make metrics. Uh, our plugin support also PromQL, it support uh, LQL, so it's a lot of power stuff inside. You can use trace. And uh, yeah, we, we continue working on uh, new agents, new profiling. Like I said, it's RTC agent can now support monitoring. You can also send this data using uh, open telemetry. And yeah, it's a lot, a lot of cool stuff. Um, um, but it's not, it doesn't mean what Homer 7 is obsolete. Yeah? So it's like Henik, uh, Henik is here. Yeah? Yeah. He asked about uh, to, to make uh, update for Angor. So we did update for Homer 7 Angor 16. So it's already in dev uh, branch. You, you can still use, yeah. So it's not dead. It's just Homer 10, it's a new revolution, uh, say new generation, next level when you don't, uh, if you don't want only collect SIP data, yeah? you, it's uh, made for something bigger. Yeah? So uh, about eBPF, like I said, if you're interested, uh, we have these repositories on GitHub, join us, um, yeah, bring your idea, ask questions. We are always open for new ideas, for new in in integrations, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you so much. So support open source. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Questions? Okay, we put some quote on that table soon. Believe me. And then Thomas. Igor has a flat rate for questions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a bit technical question about eBPF. As I've seen, am I limited to the, some subset of languages to use uh, to write like eBPF? The eBPF can be right only. Oh, I can show you. It's in C code. Yeah? So if you're interested, uh, it's like, for example, uh, this is eBPF. Okay. I, okay. Normally it's eBPF. Um, uh, you can no. It's Go. Sorry. Um, it's the wrong one. This one. So uh, eBPF, it's C, applic normally it's instructions, but you can write uh, with libbf, it's a library um, um, where you can set the instructions to which functions, for example, you have multiple props, uprop, kprop, traces, uh, and so on and so on. You can write instructions in C, it's we compile it in this binary, special binary code and you can attach. But normally, even uh, Python application or Go application, they, uh, they, let's say, have like wrapper, which uh, what code you wrote, it will be connect, converted to, Go, uh, to C and it will be compiled with C in, uh, in binary and it will be uploaded to, to kernel. So, so it's C. In, yeah. So in theory, I can use just Python and uh, without you can any, use let's say, additional uh, yeah, layers. Yeah, Python has some, li some libraries which uh, helps you to to uh, touch to eBPF without to touch uh, C code, yeah. Okay, got it, thanks. It's also the same for, it exists Cilium uh, from in Go. Uh, it's Lua, I don't remember, but uh, most important, it's Python and uh, in Go applications. So, of course, C, yeah. So for Camellio, we can directly integrate it to any module, yeah, with code. But, and also very, very important, I forgot to mention, um, once you compiled the binary, this bytecode yeah, uh, uh, on any Linux, Linux system, it can be used also in another Linux system if you have a, a kernel version 5.2, yeah? so, and, and, and higher. So it doesn't mean what you have to compile it for each version of Linux, so new kernel, you have to compile it. No, no, you compile it once. Uh, uh, for example, this RTC agent is a uh, Go application which compiled, uh, it's compiled all um, binary instructions, and up inside we upload it inside in binary. So we have this in memory and we extracted it and upload it to, to kernel. So you, sh you should not, uh, you have not to, to copy it from, uh, from another system, recompile it and so on. It's compiled once and done. So this is a beauty. Yeah? So it's, it should not be, yeah, make uh, life uh, harder. It should be make life, our life easier. 
Uh, maybe I missed it, but if you're using TLS, the encrypted packets is going into eBPF or the... No, no, it's, uh, it's uh, last time I showed it, it's exactly the case. The case why you have to use eBPF and especially, for example, you have Camellia, yeah, and you, you receive Camellia, but from vendors, yeah, not from Daniel, yeah. Some vendors, for example, uh, with Zipwise, yeah, uh, installed you, and you could not touch any uh, uh, config inside, yeah but you would like to, to capture it. So you can install LTC agent. It will be connected to functions of Camellio receive and send, and it will be see the uh, plain text message. Yeah? You can take it, you have IP, you have also structured uh, with RC info structured inside, you have message structure from uh, Camellio. You can get extracted any, any information. Yes, the same, the most, for example, with free switch, it was nightmare, but it's also possible. So uh, I also showed to last time, it's possible extract TLS. Doesn't matter, because you know, if you don't pri have private key and you have this TLS 1.3, so private key is gone, uh, you could not even touch it because it's, it's in handshakes, and how you can uh, decrypt it, impossible. Eh? So WebRTC and so on, so on, it's no, no problem anymore. So you can attach to, to function, you can uh, get this message how it, it has been received by Camelio and send out to Homer. So it hooks to the memory, like to the program and what he has in memory at that moment. Uh, for those that are familiar with GDB, it would be like you have access to GDB, but program a way to inspect the program, what's executing, the execution this, trace and so Yeah, this is what I said, it's a user function. Why I, I also measured measurement the user function because you, you can attach to any user function inside of uh, your program. It's, let's say it's not Camellia, it's, I don't know, it's a Linfon. You can also uh, make a, a read elf uh, which functions are inside. You can take this function, you can attach to this function and read data. So this is a beauty. And you, sh you, you don't have uh, to recompile it or retouch uh, any application. So it's already integrated in, in kernel. But I guess you need to know the source code to know where to attach your site, right? Uh, Theoretically, yeah, okay, you can, yeah, you have to. If you get directly binary, uh, the sources uh, without okay, debugging. Okay, so if binary is stripped and so on, so, uh, yeah, it will be impossible. But theoretically, if you, if you develop before with eyes on the right uh, and so on, so you can attach to function, you can read data, and after you can, uh, with uh, exactly binary, to read what is inside. But yeah, it's easier. Uh, if you know Camellio or you know free switch inside what exactly function does, where's the position? Yeah, it's easy. But you can also decrypt, uh, uh, say, decode all binary inside of this function and see uh, which position uh, it's um, on, on for your zip message. Exactly what I did for uh, for free switch because free switch it's with uh, Sophie, it's nightmare. It really was nightmare. The guys uh, from free switch also said it's uh, thanks what you did because it's really it was amazing. And it, it's, it's structure, 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 structure. You could not even find where it started yeah, or ended. Yeah? And you have to extract all data. Therefore, I, I was decrypt, uh, decoded all binary and found the position for IP, position for Z, and so on and so on. And get it and copy it. So, but it works. Uh, could you also capture audio that's going through RTP engine? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's why not? Because it's a go to kernel. Yeah. So it's everything what is goes to kernel, you can yeah. take it. Did you, you can try it? Sorry? Did you try it already? Uh, it's, uh, okay, I did not try it, but it's, uh, from, uh, my po from this point of view, how you can do it, it's, uh, it's not a problem. Uh, even, even better, because um, in eBPF, uh, do you know DPDK? Yeah? So everybody knows Intel, everything is good. Uh, you have to compile it, uh, di drivers, and so on and so on. The guys from uh, Linux, uh, Linux Torvald and so on, they did XDP uh, in eBPF. This is exactly the same procedure like DPTK. You, you um, make a hook for network processing in net, the network stack yeah? before it even go to kernel uh, buffer, ring buffer. You can attach to a packet. You can make analysis of each packet what you have received on network card. So it's very powerful. It's, uh, if you compare it to, to uh, DPDK, it's exactly the same, same speed. And you, can make, uh, and you can decide what to do with packet or drop or send to another destination. So you can also develop, uh, let's say, new RT, uh, RTP agent generation based on eBPF and uh, is, is, is XDP hooks. So it's very powerful. And uh, you, you can also generate a new, let's say, capture agent to, 
to send data. So okay, thank you, Alexander. As usual, yep. in time we started late, so it's fine to have. So a bit thank of you so much, uh, guys. Uh, share your ideas because, uh, for example, I'm uh, really thankful for Dan. Where is Dan? Yeah, because right. he's okay. He's gone. But because if you talk, if you um, brings your idea, it's uh, make product better and uh, it's, it helps for everybody. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Thanks. And, uh, Marcus, we are uh, now uh, switching to the next uh, uh, presentation. As you could notice in the past edition, we're mostly about Kamaino, but we Thanks. have also related. Um, yep. gotcha. Presentation from the related uh, real time communication infrastructure. So. I'm really eager to see the next presentation with uh, Marcus coming from uh, DLR. I don't know exactly in the German, but the translation would be like the space agency of the German, uh, of Germany, like NASA, that uh, people know from the USA. And I assume we'll see some interesting. Uh, uh, knowledge from the experience of sending bits in space and Somewhere. eventually getting something back okay. in for uh, controlling. So uh, many, many thanks for taking your time and resources to come here and share with us uh, what you experience out there <laughs> in the communication. And I know you are actually coming from the this real-time communication world, your colleague like with uh, Alexander before or something like that, right? Or yeah. So he's experienced also in the terrestrial communication, but let's see what happens in outer space. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks a lot. So I will talk about uh, web at the sea for space mission control. And the content of the presentation is structured in uh, what are voice communication systems for mission control, because most of you may not know it. What's special, how are they used, why we use WebRTC, and then we talk a little bit about the WebRTC implementation. So what are voice communication systems for mission control? Voice communication systems for mission control are mainly current communication systems. So we will not talk uh, too much about space links. We will talk mainly about the ground segment. Here you see a page uh, for all the centers which are connected for ISS operations and just distributed over the whole world. And that's the same for satellite operation missions. In the control center, you, had a, you have a lot of positions which are good. And uh, for example, some of the engineers are responsible for payload. Some of the engineers are responsible for systems. Some of the engineers are responsible for terminal things. And they all talk together via voice communication system, even if they are in the, con in the same room. One position is a flight director, and that's a special position. And uh, this uh, position is shown here. Um, we have the flight director using the voice communication system. You can see she's wearing a headset, and she's touching on the screen. The screen will look like this. We have a lot of conferences, which are enabled, and we have some participation rights uh, for the conferences. So you are not allowed to uh, access any loop, any voice loop. Conferences are called voice loops. Sorry. Um, conferences are called voice loops in this uh, kind of environment. And uh, you, have, you have a lot of voice loops in parallel, and you can connect uh, to them via the system. Here's a scheme about uh, some participation right layout. You can see the space to crowns on the left side are just in monitor mode, so you can just enable it to listen. And the ground control has a talk indication. You usually have a redundant system set up with system A and B, and you can connect from the, the, you can connect from the user terminal which systems you are using. So voice communication system, a short system overview. What we need to have is audio output, audio input, push to talk, and channels or voice loops. 
These are the four building blocks of a voice communication system. The special use case is, as I mentioned, multi-party multi-conferencing. So we have one participant which is active in several conferences at the same time. And we have participation states which are listen only, talk, or actually talking. Actually talking is indicated with push to talk pressed. We have a role-based access layout. And here's an example for a flight director. The flight director has the access, access right of uh, talk within the voice loop, and the user is assigned to the role. Different roles have different layouts. So each role has a different functionality, and related to the functionality, the layout is designed. And that's all what a voice communication system uh, for space mission control is. So we have the permission management, which is special uh, with the role-based position management. We have the multi-party multi-conferencing system, where you access multiple conferences at the same time. And everything of that is, dedicated, uh, is coordinated within a dedicated local network. And you need to have user support, IT support, network support, and audio technology all in once if you work for a voice communication system. Now I would like to showcase how voice is sent up to the space station. So we have a center in Munich or Oberpfaffenhofen, the Columbus Control Center, and that's the central hub for all communication uh, of Europe. That's connected to Huntsville and Houston via dedicated TDM over IP channels. So we use TDM-based systems at the current uh, control center setup. Um, and we have 48 channels shared to Houston and Huntsville, which means 48 voice loops are connected to America. And then from America, uh, from Houston or from Huntsville, the uplink is via White Sands to a geostationary geo geo -stationary satellite. And from the geostationary geo satellite, it's downlinked to the space station. That's about one minute of round trip time for each voice packet. So why we are use WebRTC? For the voice communication systems, we have about 50 years of user interface mapping. So an example from 19, 1965, we have some buttons, uh, which are physical hardware buttons connected, uh, or which, which connects the voice loop when they are pressed. Then we have today, we have systems with software buttons on dedicated hardware. Um, and the common setup of a headset, a push-to-talk unit, and an embedded dust wheel touchscreen device for the user interface. So our base idea was we continue with the user interface mapping. We had the hardware buttons to software buttons, where the system configuration was easy to exchange, so you can exchange uh, which voice loops are used. And now we would like to make the hardware configuration easy to exchange with the software buttons on non-dedicated hardware. We developed a prototype based on HTML5 and WebRTC. And we started the project OpenVox. That's our project. And the idea of the project is to have an event-based system where you can connect uh, the different loops. For example, here with the event join loop and the WebRTC-based communication. We had a meeting about our dependencies and our development baseline, and we have a development baseline of POSIX 2017 and C11 with uh, just minimal, minimal um, external dependencies. Now I would like to show a short demo. I log in with user one, then I select my role, allow microphone access, and the user interface is shown. As you can see here, it's the same 
like uh, in the, the, the traditional uh, system, you have a button. When you press it, it goes to monitor. When you press it again, it goes to talk. Talk is indicated with green. And if you actually want to talk, you need to press push to talk. That's down below. You can change the volume. Then you can switch off. And we have a call button for call outs. No, it's not working like I expected. So what I want to show is state synchronization. When I look into a different client with the same user and the same password, with the same wall, we have implemented a state synchronization. So you can switch on any client interface, and that's distributed to the other side. Um, that's for redundancy reasons, where we can have a redundant setup with one console at, at, at the left side of uh, the flight director position, and one console at the right side of the flight director position, and we synchronize the client interactions. Also, the volume is synchronized. So that's more or less what I wanted to show. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the redundancy setup because I want to focus on media distribution using, using a WebRTC implementation. What I've shown was a client and the idea that we have a signaling with, with JSON over WebSockets and the media distribution with WebRTC and DTLS SRTP. We have implemented a signaling proxy and an ICE proxy connected to a multicast network, which uh, connects a mixer cloud. So it's a microservice mixer cloud. And when you log in, you get a dedicated mixer. So the media transmission is as follows. Uh, media is sent from the client to the ICE proxy, and then the ICE proxy sends it to multicast streams. So each voice loop is a multicast stream, and uh, yeah, depending on the setup for talk, so here, loop two, uh, it will be sent to the multicast address of loop two. And the dedicated mixer receives all multicast streams and mixes the stream for the client, which is sent back to the ICE proxy and then forwarded to the, to the user terminal. The path for talk is quite easy because it's just a point-to-point -point connection between the client and the ICE proxy and then forwarding of the multicast stream to the multicast group. The whole thing looks like this. We have an external IP, which is a dedicated IP for the ICE proxy. So we don't use dynamic setup on the server side. We use a static setup on the server side, and we multiplex based on the remote IP. And each remote IP is connected internally with the session to an internal IP where the stream of the user is received. This means we also need to have a session over the proxy and the mixer because listen events are switched on the mixer, and talk events are switched on the ICE proxy. When we switch listen, then the multicast stream will be added to the uh, mix stream, and when we switch talk, we uh, need to send to a dedicated multicast address. The whole setup, uh, the whole setup is Oh, sorry. The whole setup is redundant, and we have a session between uh, the client and the ice proxy, and as I mentioned, the session between the ice proxy and the mixer. Uh, ich, yeah. Um, 
I have a few minutes left, so I go to the code where we have a dedicated uh, STP setup. So we use uh, Opus and uh, only use Opus within the system. The Opus codec will be sent to the ICE proxy. The ICE proxy is doing uh, secure to unsecure conversation. So it may mentions or it makes an SRTP packet, an RTP packet, which is then forwarded to the mixer. And each mixer uses uh, the, the same Opus configuration. We always use the format 100 for the mixers. And internally within the mixer, we use the format to add the volume. This is shown. This is shown here. So when we have a multicast stream which is, which is coming in to the, uh, to the multicast mixer, we uh, use the, the format flag of the RTP header to set the volume for that loop because each, volume, uh, each loop has a different volume. And then we mix that uh, within the mixer later on once all loops are added up. So that's kind of a, kind of a hack we use, but it's an interesting um, possibility to transport the volume within the RTP frame. Now let's go back to the Outlook. And for the Outlook, I will go back to this uh, slide. So what we want to do is uh, to implement some protocols for clients and servers and to define some protocols for clients and servers so different parties can implement different parts of the system. For current systems are based on current systems are based on uh, dedicated turnkey solutions which are vendor specific. The system we use currently at uh, the German Space Operation Center is from Frequentis. And what we want to achieve is uh, to open up the system that part of the systems can be delivered from different vendors. So when we define a protocol for clients and server, then uh, someone can develop a client and someone else can develop a server. That's not done yet for voice communication systems in uh, the space mission context. And what we also can add is uh, within the multicast network, we can not only add the mixer cloud, we have uh, also interest to connect SIP connections. For example, to have point-to-point -point connections between different, uh, different uh, control centers. And there we uh, foresee to implement a proxy with Camellio. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you, thank you. We have Fred with... It's here. Matthias. On the Opus with 4,800 or 48,000, um, is that for terrestrial communication or, I mean, do you lower it when you're trying to go out to very far away or I don't know what you mean the ISS, the, do you use a lower bit rate the ISS so the opus codec you use is, is a big bit rate it's what 64 or 128 something like it's big and so I was wondering if you were gonna if you guys switch it to something lower um, something smaller to go out to space to improve the latency yeah. currently we have five channels to the space station, also, so five voice channels, and not more. But if you would use uh, lower, uh, like uh, encoding for the codec, so not 64, 8 bit, you ask them. You need, you have enough like bandwidth to send uh, like uh, wide band audio, or it's narrow band. Yeah, we can send wide band audio. 
Okay. Actually, I think the answer is that it's TDM to the ISS. Today it's TDM, yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. So TDM to ISS. Other question here? Oh, two, one, next to each other. Yeah, thank you, Markus. Um, I'm Mr. Ventis. <laughs> Um, and my question would be, um, are you planning to open the, um, the now DDM-based solution also to, to WebRTC, to, to get a real uh, uh, WebRTC stream uh, to the space station, or to, to change actually the, uh, the space-to-ground communication? No, that's not planned. So for the lifetime of the ISS, it's uh, planned to have Frequentis working as a communication system for the ISS. And what we plan to do is to open up the internal side. So we would like to connect our open box with the frequent system and share some loops with universities because it's easier to share via WebRTC uh, than via a dedicated key set. Currently we have dedicated key sets. Yeah, hi, I've noticed in the codec negotiation for Opus that, uh, that uh, it's uh, using stereo, so I was wondering if it's just you know, WebRTC default or something, or you really need stereo. Uh, Do you need stereo? No, we don't need stereo. Okay. But we added it because it's a standard for WebRTC from the browser. So I'm interested in your uh, blob marked multicast network. Is it? like multicast at the IP level, or is it just like conceptually multicast? It's multicast at IP level. So it's a real multicast network. How many people do you connect with your system? How many average? people? It's, different. Uh, it's difficult to say, because there are a lot of sites we connect. Um, to give you a number, we have 15 sites in Europe which are connected, and these are universities or uh, some, um, some, some, some vendor of parts of the system, engineering support and things like that. And there are a lot of people working on each side, so we don't know how many people we connect. We know how many key sets we have, so how many user terminals. <laughs> And this, this, is, this is about uh, 200 at the moment. Okay, so 200 would be the maximum then, because if you have 200 terminals, or can you have more than 200 participants in your rings? Not in the current system. Okay, thank you. Okay, probably you can get uh, Mark now. Uh, thank you, Mark, once again, really interesting. And uh, good to see that software and open source and open standards go into some domains that we never thought of it before, or we thought but look like untouchable for the usual people. And the usual technology, we are all thinking they use this magic Star Trek stuff in the NSA and uh, space communication. Okay, so now we have our uh, interactive presentation session with many participants at a rather fast uh, pace. So, uh, coordinated by the Seabgate team, we have now Andreas in the control and the other supporting in the, the back. Please, Andreas, thank you for taking care of putting everything together and thank you again to uh, Sibgate for uh, supporting us. Yeah. Yours. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Yeah, uh, let's do some PowerPoint karaoke. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a uh, long tradition, I think, uh, <laughs> already since 2019, I just learned, uh, with a small break of Corona. And yeah, uh, as you can see, uh, last year there were eight people, I think, if I'm counted correct, or nine people uh, contributing. Let's see uh, how many 
persons we have today because most of the slides were inserted yeah, this morning <laughs> or maybe this night by some people. Uh, yeah, let's start. I think uh, Sebastian knows uh, that he is the first one in the list. And yeah, um, I, I've been speaking here last, uh, uh, last year and uh, as you all prepared for this year's edition, you probably listened to the live stream uh, again from last year. And so you know that I talked about uh, trunks um, or how to connect uh, thousands of trunks uh, uh, from cloud systems. And there's some things change really fast and it's not facts, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but um, a few months after uh, I held this talk and um, I showed you this slide where we took uh, actually residential telecom VoIP lines and uh, sent them through different DSL connections and uh, sent multiple hundreds or even thousands of uh, numbers uh, through one DSL and that worked, uh, it actually didn't work anymore. <laughs> so I thought I'd just give you an update. Uh, the, yeah, the, there were two changes. Um, one of them was uh, that we uh, replaced uh, uh, our copper DSL uh, with a fiber DSL uh, from the telecom uh, in one of our offices. Um, and the other one was that telecom started um, uh, rolling out uh, new SBCs. And the, this combination was uh, really bad. Um, and we started seeing uh, this behavior. <laughs> um, yeah, then uh, we even used, uh, yeah, and then we, we started experimenting uh, with what we could, uh, we could do. Uh, we tried using the old SPCs, uh, which actually worked via the copper line, but not over the fiber line. <laughs> And uh, we started discussing with telecom and we showed them uh, old uh, mail conversations from uh, a couple of years ago and uh, where they said, uh, yeah, something around 160 calls uh, over one DSL must work. Um, and uh, yeah, but actually they didn't want to know that uh, anymore and uh, other people, other decisions. And uh, so huh, they finally, they, uh, we came to the conclusion it won't work anymore. <laughs> so um, those were small customers with, uh, that um, uh, had been migrated into the cloud from uh, legacy on-site uh, solutions and they always, uh, they had their DSLs uh, in the uh, in the offices uh, still, and the numbers were tied to it. But uh, yeah, we had to uh, we had to come up with a solution, and the solution was uh, we told our partners that uh, or resellers that um, mainly manage those um, uh, those cloud instances uh, that they have to move and quickly. <laughs> so they got a like a three month. Uh, uh, in advance, uh, we, we told them, you have to move. We gave them a workaround for the, for the time being. And uh, fortunately, uh, yeah, our customers, uh, they, uh, they accepted it. And uh, they, they didn't, it didn't run away, at least most of them. And uh, I, I think we didn't have a lot of complaints after we turned it off. Uh, I was on vacation but, uh, at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was slide number four. Uh, slide number five, you know, uh, it's my off day. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Sebastian. Uh, perfect in, in four minutes. Uh, so the rules were five slides in five minutes, so you have one minute left. Uh, and we can go to the next person. Who is it? Tori. Again, timer is restarting soon. All right. So uh, uh, Daniel said this is supposed to be interactive. So I'm going to start off by asking two questions. Who here uses a uh, Kemi Python 3? One. 
Two. Okay. Three. Okay, next question. How many, uh, of those three people, how many of you actually write unit tests for your uh, Kemi Python code? Zero. Okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this slide presentation is going to be a bit relevant then because uh, I'm talking about writing unit tests for Kemi Python. So uh, the first thing you do uh, with Kemi Python is you, uh, with your up and running system, you dump all of the APIs uh, of the modules you're using, dump it to a JSON file, and then you run the Python script that's already in the upstream uh, contrib, uh, and that will generate uh, stubs. And then uh, you either can, uh, if you just shove it into the same directory that you have your uh, Kemi Python, or, or you put it in a different directory and say, and add it as a root, like what I do, because I don't want to actually accidentally deploy my case on a PI and have my code calling bad instead of the real comma area, which would be disappointing. So uh, first thing that you get by doing that is you get code completion. So uh, uh, already there, you can now uh, see all the methods that are available uh, in the dropdowns. And the second of all, you get to know, uh, you can uh, uh, go into it and you can see what uh, the types are. You can see, for example, DSelect routes, the first two parameters must be a string. The second parameter is an integer. And that's important because if you uh, say, uh, put uh, pass 5060 as a string and what is expecting an integer, Python will not like you, and no, nor would comma Elio. So you have to make sure you get the types of your parameters right. And the second thing that's important is that it, it will tell you the fact that this returns an int, which is also important because uh, there's two ways in which comma Elio behaves. The first one is uh, int, where uh, positive value is true, negative value is false, and then others are blue or uh, bool, uh, where it's true and false. So uh, you need to know whether you need to do greater than zero or just do a simple if statement. Uh, if you mix it up, uh, then you can have some weird behavior in your code. Uh, second of all, after you've ri uh, actually written the code, it would be nice to test it. And there's two ways to do that. You can either, for some methods, if you just always want to return the same value, you just say, okay, when that method gets called, always return minus one. Otherwise, you can uh, make a function and then uh, uh, make a function pointer to that method and then it will emulate that. And then after you define all the functions you call, you just say uh, 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 instantiate of a uh, fake Camellio and run the request route. And boom, you've just simulated the call. Uh, then uh, the other thing I've done is uh, there's a lot of things that you can uh, replicate the same. So like there is, uh, uh, set, if, you, uh, if you set a, a pseudo variable, you want to be able to get it back. Uh, you, if you want a header, you want to be able to have it in that. And then that's text up functions. So I implemented a lot of my, uh, libraries twice because uh, I first did it at Foxbone and then when I left, I did it again. But fortunately at the second company I was at, uh, they had an all open source module. So if you're interested in that code, you can find it here. Uh, so that's uh, my presentation. Uh, so any, qu any questions I have? One minute, 35 seconds. <laughs> One, it's on. So for uh, testing and um, how it's kind of the, the feeling is you, you look only at the output for this mocking or what you, how you evaluate the result of the test? Uh, for example, here, oh, uh, wait, go back to. Say so here, like I, I, I put a variable in there, uh, my forward, and then I uh, assert, okay, at, at the end of it, okay, that I actually reached that method. And then over in the code, like I, I've asserted that, okay, the, the u variable that I set uh, got set to the destination. So then I say, okay, I'm now here, I'm validating that the code flow with the given inputs have now uh, routed to the uh, place I expected it to, okay. for example. So you you can import that somehow, like you can use other variables, like here you have the sip example.com, but it could be like loaded from JSON or like all this testing. Oh, well, like yeah, this, 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 is, this is your test code. And okay. uh, I do have the case our utils where I modulate things uh, like various text operations and uh, things like okay. that. I'll uh, be able to, uh, if you do an add header, you can then access it by the dollar sign HDR and so on and so forth like that. Uh, a lot of boilerplate that just to make it act like a, the way you would expect Camellio to do, but yeah. Okay. Nice, nice. Good, thank you. Just in time. Three seconds left. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Tori. Let's see who's next. Dennis. Welcome. Thank you. Time Hi. is starting. 
Um, yeah, I'm Dennis, BioNetworks uh, today. <laughs> As, uh, some other days, some other companies, but today it's BioNetworks. I <laughs> planned to fill in a gap uh, to have a talk about this in more depth, but then basically I gave away my time to a maybe more interesting uh, topic to the other slot or the other guy who's dealing, no, not dealing, but sharing the slot with me. So I decided to go for five minutes, five slides with a rather, you know, unspectacular topic of saying, can we, you can do something that is um, easy and good. <laughs> it can use um, TLS towards your clients. Uh, it can use the domain part or be better said the subdomain part um, to identify, okay, for example, which client Asterix server in the backend it's matching to and then basically just um, replacing that uh, subdomain with this private IP address and route it um, resource efficiently via UDP to this asterisk in the background. Um, yeah, so this is basically a good thing which is set up quite easily. Um, I don't want to go into details because obviously this is something very easy to manage, but uh, that's also what I wanted to show. It's that easy to do. Uh, you basically just load a module, then you connect to your database. Your database holds those <coughs> key values where to find that specific private IP address uh, connected to that domain you wanted to. Um, um, forward to and uh, basically then you just need a little bit of code which is basically rather you know specific to your routing settings to just replace that request URI domain part with this private IP address easy peasy and um, on the other side of course uh, what you can use Cameo for is of course you have your internal network running on UDP, but uh, you want to secure your network towards your clients with TLS. So basically you just offload the TLS part to Kamaio and um, let Kamaio do the TLS thing uh, just towards the clients while using UDP towards your uh, infrastructure. And again, this is also quite easily to achieve. Uh, the only thing that you always need to keep in mind with TCP connections, of course, is do some parameters to optimize that this works well when it scales up. Um, but then again, you only just enable TS equals yes, load a module, um, put your certificate at a place where Camille can find it, and off you go. So that's the conclusion, right? Because that was also one part of the uh, request for the, for the slides, like uh, what are the benefits? Yeah, the benefits are that you can run uh, 10K uh, TLS user connections on a very, very small machine. Um, as uh, we learned yesterday, of course, this is maybe even possible on a Raspberry Pi and it uh, can have some uh, energy left to um, run your home assistant. By the way, you know, that's, that's how efficient it is and that's what Cameo gives you at that point. And obviously, um, just stating the obvious uh, TLS, you want to secure a network, but definitely you don't want to have the overhead of debugging TLS within your network, so you only do it at the edge and then basically uh, live happily every, uh, ever after with UDP inside uh, your network so that you can um, use Homer for analyzing what is happening or what is not happening. So, 30 seconds left. Oh, a question from Tori. Yes. Uh, now it gets serious. Uh, you said, uh, <laughs> you said uh, at the, your first slide of multi-domain, uh, but it looked like you were just putting a TLS certificate for one domain, or did you just concatenate all the domains in relevant to that certificate? Exactly, so the idea is basically that um, you have this subdomain part, which is the variable. Well, and it's a start certificate from, from Let's Encrypt, exactly. Right. 
Time is over. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And next one. Next one is Sandro. Here we go. Hello. So. Okay. So I'm Sandro Gauci. Um, originally from Malta, but uh, I live here in Germany. Um, and I run a company called Enable Security. What we do is we specialize in voice over IP and WebRTC security testing and penetration testing, right? Um, and some of the times um, we end up reviewing Camellio servers and configurations. We don't do that in isolation, but we usually have a live environment to, to test on as well. Um, but having the configuration, of course, gives you superpowers, um, which you really need when uh, you have a short engagement. Um, so the key takeaways from these few minutes is that um, what we find with our clients is that even well-established configurations can be vulnerable. Those vulnerabilities could have been sitting there since years. Um, and a lot of the reasons might be that no one ever pointed them out or, you know, if an intrusion happened, it wasn't noticed. Um, and there's a lot of reliance on IP, so the so-called IP authentication, um, which we don't think is uh, really authentication. So that's something a bit, um, you know, there is no identity there. IPs can be changed, can be spoofed, whatever. Yeah, there's various different reasons. Anyway, so let's jump into some examples. I only have two examples. I have a longer presentation that uh, Maybe I give next year, or if anyone wants, uh, chat me up. Um, but I have two examples. Um, so the, the first one, this is something interesting. So if you have something like this, and of course, keep in mind that most configurations are much more complex. Um, and I cleaned up a lot of stuff from, uh, you know, to, to make it readable and also uh, not reveal the um, victims slash um, Guilty. Um, so in this case, we're, we're, we're using in the configuration, we're using the DNS query uh, function. And what we notice is that if an attacker were to send a flood of uh, SIP messages in this case, it tends to be more complicated, of course. Uh, this might be used only in certain cases uh, where an invite message has a certain SIP domain, for example. But if, you, if an attacker were to hit this part, the DNS query, that's, um, and with a flood, that's going to hang Camario and lead to denial of service because DNS query um, is not uh, asynchronous. And what we do in our test is we, point, we, we ask for a DNS name where the, the DNS server is not really responding. So it takes forever for Camellio to time out, and this overwhelms the system. Uh, next one is, is essentially a standard um, SQL injection. If you're using the, the BigQuery function like something like this without any um, filtering, without using the SQL, um, what do you call them? Uh, yeah, the, the sanitation function, sorry. Um, then you're going to have SQL injection. Um, in this case, it was in, injected through the diversion header, but of course, you can find all sorts of examples. Right. So those were the two examples that I have here. I have uh, six more on, a private sli on other slides, so yeah, let me know if you're interested. What can you do? Well, um, of course, stay informed. And um, yeah, we have our uh, RTC security newsletter that we publish every month. So please subscribe. It's free. And uh, we put a lot of effort into it. 
most of the times at least. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's very interesting stuff, what's happening with uh, voice over IP and WebRTC security. We try to cover all of that. And of course, test, 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 because that's what we do, so, <laughs> and hire us. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect timing again. Let's see who's next. Thanks a lot, Sandro. Uh, Nick. Now a bit color. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, g'day guys. Uh, my name's Nick. Uh, I'm, I guess, in the Camellio world, uh, best known for I run a blog called Nick versus Networking. And in the real world, I run a company called OmniTouch, where we sort of jokingly describe it as we build cellular networks in places that other people are too stupid to try. And today I'm going to be talking about how we implemented number portability with CG rates and Camellio for a country. So again, we're kind of like the A-team, but we build mobile networks and we don't have a van. Uh, the requirements for this project were that we had to do an all number query number portability for all the phone numbers in the country. It had to be for voice calls, SMS, and it had to support SIP, which fairly straightforward, but also SS7 intelligent network and MAP for the SMS side of things. We also had to interface with a third party SOAP API, which provided us with all the information about the ports that are being requested. Um, so that's fairly straightforward. Uh, the regulator in this country uh, picked a vendor called Porting Access, and they provide an XML uh, API where you request the ports, reject the ports, etc. That's super easy. That hits our porting gateway, which is just essentially a Python Flask app, which then pushes up to the BSS system, which allows us to deprovision a user when a number gets ported out, stop billing for it, etc. And also our enum server. Uh, so we needed an, an enum server, and uh, Dan from CG Rates was the man to call. Um, so we picked CG Rates because it's it's awesome, but also it's super quick. We're using attributes which works amazingly well, um, and it also means that our billing system knows if a number is ported or not. We're not trying to pull external data; it's all integrated in there. So how this actually looks is here's a fuzzed out query, but this is a, a dig query for a phone number. You look it up; it comes back with the you know. Uh, the routing numbers that are used for the um, global title translation, but also, you know, if it's a mobile number or a fixed number, and then there's a four-letter code that's fuzzed out at the end there between mobile and number portability, which tells you which operator to go to. And then inside the giant's rat's, rat's net of routing, the two blue boxes on the far left there, the two SIP proxies, they're both Camellio boxes. They do an enum lookup and then work out which network to route this to. And it's a bit of a pain in the backside because we've got traffic coming in on, we've got 60 E1 circuits that come in from an operator. The switch that runs that network went end of life before I was born. Um, we've got all sorts of weird legacy crap to deal with. Uh, and we also have to provide transit routing as well, which we also do through Camellio. So if a call comes in from operator A, but the number was originally with us and is now ported to operator B, we've got to provide transit routing. And we've got to do the same for the SMS as well, which means that we've got to do all the global title stuff and everything else. And so yeah, it uh, was a bit of a mess to get going. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts, but it works amazingly well. It was pretty quick to turn around, thanks to Dan and, and the CG Rates team. Uh, Arba from the CG Rates team actually did a talk on this at Foz Devcom, uh, talking a little bit more about uh, how it works under the hood with, Camille uh, with CG Rates. And man, I've got a minute 50. Didn't even need to blast through this. Any questions, I guess? Questions? So CG Rates is like the, the DNS in ARM server? Yeah, so I mean, we, we looked at using, I mean, when you think DNS, you think things like bind. Yeah. Uh, but it's just, it's a real bugger to do anything sort of API or programmatic with. Uh, so we picked CG Rates because a, it meant that we had all that information about billing there available for us. So when we rate a call, we know who the operator is. Um, you know, it's not just prefix matching, it actually knows if the number's ported or not. And it's got a really easy API to deal with. Okay, nice. Good to know about that. I was looking for a DNS server. <laughs> actually, it, it, it does NAFTA and like we, we've got like a record stored in there as well. It, it's a fully fledged DNS server, as well as being a great rating agent engine. Okay. Good, thank you. Cool, thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, that's good. Uh, Xenophone.
Hello, I'm Xenophon Caramanos from Gilaba Company. And I would like to introduce you to one of the modules in 5.8, is the file out module. Its main use cases are for easy logging directly to a specific file you uh, declare with mining high performance debug, lo debug logging and high throughput data. And with flexible formatting using very, uh, the pseudo variables offered by uh, Camaleo uh, environment. A bit of briefly how it's implemented. It uses a queue internally for storing the messages over a specified interval. Uh, the timer based worker uh, then flashes the queue to the files you declare. And we have support for multiple files, and as I already suggested, uh, supports many of the, all of the pseudo variables that Kamali offers. Uh, let's see how to enable it in the um, config file. As all of the modules, you have to load it uh, with the load module uh, function. Yeah, uh, there are two main uh, parameters, mod params that you should be probably aware of. The first one is the base folder. It's where um, your files should be written to. Make sure you have uh, right access to it. And of course, the main part is the mod param file uh, parameter that uh, you declare your files and the rotation uh, interval, what their extension should be, and also we in, in, introduce the prefix that every uh, message you log to that file should be prefixed with uh, as well. And how would you use it in your request route config file? In your request route, you use the function offered by the module, also called file out. Uh, it accepts two parameters. The first one is, of course, the file you want to write to, in this case, the missed calls. And the second parameter is the uh, string you want to log to, along with any pseudo variables that you want to include into the string. Um, when the message arrives, uh, the file will be created in the folder you uh, suggested in the mod param. And for example, in our case where we included the prefix as a pseudo variable of time, uh, time variable pseudo variable to the second uh, precision, it's uh, written to the file and alongside with the string and the evaluated pseudo variables. Thank you. If there's any questions. Any question? Quick one. You can define many files, right? And yeah, of course. Choose. There is support up to 10 files right now, but if there is need for it, we And probably. the file is like the identifier. You don't have like a uh, variable the file inside here, it. Here, right? param. You okay. specify the four currently parameters. It's the name, the interval, the yeah. extension, the prefix. But the required can I have one is the name. <laughs> for example, can I have the name being like miss calls underscore from user, like dollar $f uppercase u? In the name, I don't think we included pseudo variables, so only in the prefix. Okay. Uh, yeah. Five nine, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So there's another question? There's a question. I think. Uh, a minute left. Okay. You have minus 10 seconds so, uh, left. <laughs> Hi. Uh, what exactly does the interval do? So is it as a suffix for the file? Will I get missed calls dot one, missed calls dot two or something? So. Uh, what it's supposed it to do. Pressure? The interval. The interval. Uh, it's about rotating the file, uh, which the file should be rotated. It's the interval. The file should be rotated. Uh, you, it creates a new one. So you e every 30 seconds or yeah, every 30 seconds, lines yes. or seconds? In seconds, yes. Uh -huh. And then it will attach some suffix or prefix? Yep, it okay. will attach a suffix before the prefix. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> before the extension. <laughs> before okay. the extension. Thank sure. you. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you. Well. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's it.
Thanks That's a lot, all. Daniel, yeah. also for promoting uh, this. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, and for every contributor. Having the courage to show what you can uh, do with Kamayu and other application, and uh, yeah, it's time before going to lunch for the snom. Can you come in front? I'll bring the bowl. I want to give a few more devices. So you go in front. I need to bring some. So I have today Oliver from uh, Snome today, which you want to, you know, choose the lucky ones today. Okay. I don't know how many are there, or two or three. Yeah, not two or three, and uh, we also have uh, a couple more, and I uh, also have minimum one deck multi-cell system here, but this is only for Europe, so you know, US. Sorry. Not working. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's working, but maybe you you end up in jail. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> he used to put people in jail because he was a <laughs> policeman. Yeah, 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 I can imagine. So, no, yeah, so it won't take five minutes, I would say. Huh? Okay. Uh, Jan Vigara. It's here. Does it work in Australia? What you give? Because I think he's coming from Australia, right? So what, IP phone or speaker phone? So I already have one. You already have oh, one? Oh, you had one last year. That's, that's good news. Whoa, so, so lucky. OK, next so time I will cut you from the list. Yeah. <laughs> you, you squeeze all the. Yeah, either this one or we just add one more. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll see. So hopefully now, here's the next one. Sandro. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> that was actually for, for us as SNOM, that was quite interesting because in principle, why not having this in a very small device, yeah? And then do all the nice web RTC coming in, etc. Um, and then, since you're a user agent, multiple user agent, for us it's like a dream. Yeah, nothing to think okay. about. Should work actually. So okay. we'll see. And the last one. Let me rotate a little bit, and you do more. Yeah. So now IP phone. Idris. Ah, you lost. At he was here. Idris, it's outside. He was. On the phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's it is. I think it's outside. So he, that's the colleague. They, they are four from the same ah, okay. company. So, so you you're sure you here. give it to him? <laughs> no, yeah, they're from. It is the boss, anyhow. So. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded. So, yeah, it's. But, you know. Yeah, it's recorded. But since when uh, does the boss know what the guy does? Huh? The <laughs> worker. Okay. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Snom, again for uh, all these okay. nice devices and Oliver. And I guess now you know your way to the restaurant for the lunch. We'll see here in roughly one hour or so for the afternoon.
Thomas Magedans. If Camaillo world got so far and actually started is also because of him and uh, Dragos Bungerzan. At that time, they were just finishing with the uh, Open IMS core and they were going into EPC and they kindly supported uh, us in uh, getting the former location of the previous editions. As you saw the history, uh, Camaillo with the name SIP Express Router at that time started at the Fraunhofer Institute uh, like 20 and a few more years ago. And it's uh, Thomas department that actually it's focusing on all this real-time communication past to this voice IMS, then going lower EPC, now it's 5G core and continues on this uh, direction. So thank you, Thomas, for uh, supporting uh, us along those uh, years, getting us to this uh, edition. And uh, of course, for all your innovation that uh, your, your team is uh, getting out and sharing the knowledge with us and uh, we know that uh, you are uh, busy and for those that want to catch you up, probably you will present that yeah, Fuseco Forum is coming in autumn, next week will be Hanover uh, Messe and so on. So there are plenty other options to meet with his team and see what cool stuff they do now in research. and. By that, you can also predict what direction of your business could invest a little bit more and be ahead of the others. Okay, Thomas, a few more to come in, but I think we are good to start. Uh, thank you again. Your floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for the kind words. Let me just double check with you. Um, the session is roughly 30 minutes, including Q&A. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Okay, then, ladies and gentlemen, again, it's a big pleasure to be back again at Camillo World and give you a little bit of um, an overview for those of you who have seen me last year, uh, maybe an update on what we are doing. So, in this talk, I want to... Um, open up your eyes a little bit into 6G and what 6G might be and how 5G might fit into it. There have been big discussions in the recent months where 6G is going to go and um, on the other hand, at least when you look at my CV, you will see that um, we are building toolkits, toolkits for building up testbed infrastructures for academia, but also for the industry. And um, this is somehow here what I want to address and share with you. Um, my new mission is um, an open 6G for all. And I will explain to you what it means and what is the ratio behind it. And um, yeah, so in principle, um, you may know every mobile generation takes 10 years, starting backwards um, or forward. 2030 is the time, the expected time, when 6G should hit the ground on the first deployments. Research started 2020, and um, the most interesting time is ahead of us. It is around 2025 when the international standardization is starting. Uh, and as you know, international standardization typically takes a couple of years because we have this classic three-stage standardization process use cases, functional architecture, protocols, and then the really deep dive specifications. And um, so I guess it's now a good time to review what has been done in international research. Ideally, the business model typically is uh, patent your brilliant ideas, go to standardization, make your ideas 
standard essential hopefully become rich. That's one way. Okay, some other Fraunhofer institutes do it much better than we. We are the ones who built the early prototypes. So we always aim to create the reference architectures for researchers to play with their ideas, to validate their ideas, and hopefully see that things might work or not. Yeah? So this is basically what you later will learn is our upcoming open 6G core. And as you know from the past, um, open not necessarily means open source. We are licensing um, the source code for organizations, for research stuff. Commercialization is then something else. Nevertheless, there's room for open source in this context. And this is what I'm doing with my university chair. And you may know that Ramona is with me at Technical University of Berlin. And I think we have a very synergetic environment in order to move forward into this context. And we have an initiative there, which we call open6gnet.org uh, in order to there. Let's see what kind of 6G ready software pops up. Currently, and to make a long story short, 5G is the basis for 6G research. And uh, there's a good reason for this. Um, in principle, what network operators, and you may know, they're all horrified by looking on the return of investment of 5G. Um, it's basically they're not really making the money which they expected. So there is no big happiness to look forward for a new networking technology and investing into this. So there's a clear statement. Um, for instance, when you directly talk to them, but also when you look at the NGMN, the Next Generation Mobile Network Association, so this is a club of network operators, they clearly say 5G has to be part of 6G or other way around. 6G at least has to be somehow, whatever this means, backward compatible. So when we then look um, what is currently happening, um, we see and when we understand what 5G is originally designed for, not just more multimedia, big bit pipes. This was only one, one small, maybe a big aspect. But you may recall the 5G triangle and next, so multimedia on top. But you had also IoT, massive device communications, or many devices connected to the network, and the low latency really uh, liability communication and um, this is something which network operators cannot really deploy in across the country. So this is expensive. And also this is now becoming possible. And um, ideally this is something which is happening on an airport, in a football stadium, at a fairground, in a factory, in a hospital, in a harbor, private networks, enterprise networks, not typically the place where network operators uh, are at home. Of course, they aim to do this, but um, we will see currently that there's a big move, and Germany is a pioneer in this. As you may know, we have private 5G frequencies. It's easy and not too expensive to acquire local spectrum and um, you can do a lot with 100 megahertz spectrum in a given location. So the new trend combining this with what is happening around open run, but also what has been started long before in the core and in other segments, network virtualization. We talk about open modular networks popping up. And in this context, it seems to be clear that campus networks, enterprise networks, um, are driving innovation in 5G. Reason simple, small deployment, not too much money to be invested, still a lot. However, 
you can try to calculate a business case. So this is what uh, we can observe these days. And um, yeah, uh, we are in these projects, in the key projects which are researching this. And um, the main storyline is, and I want to give you a little bit of background and outline where we are moving and then you can start brainstorming where might be models for uh, engagements. Tanya mentioned already, okay, I'm <laughs> since 35 years at Focus, so I'm an old guy. And um, nevertheless, our mission was always to provide these testbed infrastructures. We learned soon that, or early, that we cannot provide a testbed for all the network operators around the globe at our premises. So then we particularly shipped our toolkits to the places where these uh, test beds should be and particularly integrated into the environment of the customer or partner. So we started with open source because we had some sponsors and then we didn't have a sponsor for core networks, which was for us a natural consequence to look for. Nowadays, everyone is talking about a core network. It becomes quite popular, but our open EPC was the first software we really licensed as a source code for quite some good money. We did this 100 times. We created a spin-off company and then become kind of rich in this domain and famous. However, we started the Open 5G Core more or less in the same time when we started the spin-off company. And this Open 5G Core is today the reference implementation for implementing 5G crazy things. And um, now is the time to start to push out the open 6G core. And I will tell a little bit more about this in a few minutes. Okay, you see here some crazy things on top of this view graph. Um, and um, this particularly comes back to this an open 6G for all. So at my university chair, some 10 years ago, I started uh, an initiative which was called UNIFI. I don't know even what it stands for. So, um, kind of common network infrastructure for future internet research. And the idea was simple, together with some universities, Cape Town University, where I'm now professor as well, uh, Shula Longhorn in Bangkok, Vietnam University, and University de Chile. The idea was, Let's try to create similar test beds based on similar toolkits in order to allow students to work on these toolkits and have the ability to jump in between the universities. So the idea was try to build up local skills which are needed in these countries. And um, now since a couple of months, I'm pushing forward for what is called open RIT, open research infrastructures and toolkits where I revived my old buddies, uh, added some new buddies, and our ambition now is to set up a um, toolkit catalog, which should enable really every country of this world, even for low cost, to get started with 5G, preparing the minds for 6G. And um, this hopefully will enable countries like South Africa, India, and many others who are maybe not so fortunate the, the, as we are here in the Northern Hemisphere um, to develop local skills and to build networks which are highly customized to the local needs. And I think this is quite important, customization for the local needs. So I don't go too much on this because otherwise the time is over, but uh, important here to mention is um, 6G should be considered as a 5G evolution. And nevertheless, we see higher frequencies, we see more modularity, we see some crazy new applications. And um, particularly, we see also the requirement, which every one of us will be hidden by, namely the United Nations Sustainability Goals. Yeah? And this means energy efficiency, sustainability in the things you are building, look where these guys, the software and the hardware is coming from, blah, blah, blah. So this is a key driver. And I think this is where 
the 5G evolution is mainly driven. My take on the interpretation of this is um, we have to provide software building blocks in order to allow the so-called unconnected to be part of the game. And this is one of the key mission which um, in 6G has to be supported, built an infrastructure which really allows to bridge the gap in the digital divide. And there are two means for this. Uh, on the one hand, there is a very deep integration of satellite technologies and high altitude platforms and flying things. So this is called non-terrestrial networks. This already started long ago with 5G, so it's an extension. But it becomes clear that the satellite connection to your mobile phone is one of the key important connections in the future. And on the other hand, to provide the ability for these local communities to build up their own kind of communication networks for the things they really need. Two pointers. NGNM I mentioned, so there is some statement what are the to-dos uh, for the vendors when they want to build 6G technologies. And there is another one which reflects what is called the IMT 2030. So currently whatever you see from the technology point of view being rolled out is IMT 2020. This is 5G. Now IMT and IMT is the club of global players. They say which is the direction to go for communications. So they have now released the IMT 2030 framework. And as part of this, they have created these view graphs here. I have no time to go into the details, but you know in IMT 2020, we have seen the triangular from 5G. Now it's a kind of sex egg, I don't know the English word for it, but um, in principle, these are just extensions of some use cases, combinations of them. One important point is integrated communications and sensing, so the radio base station is a radar system, and so you can now identify what is going on in a given area. Very interesting. Um, but on the outside, there is particularly this sustainability um, aspect, which is really a key uh, requirement. Okay, there are some capabilities um, on what this technology should do, should do better than 5G. I don't go into the details. I only also want to reveal this is a standardization process. So the long story short is now is a good time to prototype your crazy ideas and make up your mind how to bring it into the standardization. And I think having an infrastructure, and this is what we are doing at Focus, demo or die, um, we um, build these infrastructures in order to see if some crazy ideas are feasible or not. And um, yeah, this is a time plan. So you see the different releases, namely um, 20, uh, particularly 21 will be the 6G release which is going to be implemented for the first rollouts. And then, of course, the whole story goes on as it is going on now with 5G advanced. I don't have too much time to, you know, this is a very simplified virtualized 5G view graph. Um, so you see virtualization platforms, um, this different kind of radio access networks, you see the core network, and then on top some management functionalities, which are of course very important, and monitoring functionalities in order to put AI on it. By the way, of course, I forgot to mention AI everywhere, so 6G should be the super AI network controlled by AI. Um, and I'm curious to see whether the specifications for 6G will come from ChatGPT at some point in time. Uh, um, but some people play around with this. Don't, don't take this too unserious. So, but long story short, so we focused on the core network because the core network is cool, because every new technology somehow has to be linked to the core network. So we have a pretty cool release 8 currently, 
uh, being available, um, very stable for a prototype, um, very interoperable with different base stations, whether they are ORAN or not open RAN, and uh, even non 3 gpb technologies could be linked into this. The cool part of the next one, and I think this is the most important one, we did a lot of effort this year to make it cloud native, so you can also run this core as a service somewhere. And um, this is then our release nine, which is coming um, throughout this year. Okay, so I skip this. I don't want to do a big pitch here for this, but at least you should understand we are coming from something which gets stronger and better by every release because we follow the market demands, basically our customers. This whole thing, and I think this is a slide, is currently more than 125 times deployed around the globe. And of course, now would be the time to think about a spin-off. Um, I'm not sure whether we want to do it or not. Um, but we get traction. And um, you find some slides, you get the slides uh, to learn by heart later on. Different use cases, being it fire disaster situations, being it a smart factory, being it multimedia support on public events, being it a smart hospital, being it uh, connectivity uh, with train systems. Um, so this is what we are doing. And basically, um, one, one aspect which we really love is this nomadic node. Yeah? You see it in the right corner down. So we can bring a 5G network to a place where instant connectivity is needed. So a disaster place or maybe a construction site. Yeah? And everything which grows, adapts, uh, doesn't have the real connectivity which is needed to interconnect the machines. Um, we can do this. And basically we do this in a flagship project, 70 million euros um, are in this project with satellite projects around, so projects going into different application domains. We are aiming for building up a modular open ecosystem to build network infrastructures. So what we are aiming for, driven by the German ministry, we want to create a local ecosystem we don't want dependence from Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, CTE, and all these other guys. So the idea is you build up your own plug and play network infrastructure. And um, again, just to repeat, this nomadic node could be a big box. For instance, as we do it in the airport of Schönhagen here near Berlin in order to support firefighters. But it could be also something very small and niche um, for specific very specific use cases where size matters. Yeah? So this nomadic node, for instance, is three boxes. One is power supply to act autonomously. One is the core network and application stuff. And the third one is uh, the radio equipment. So those guys I talked to with MCX, so mission critical services. So your stuff goes then probably in the box where core and application servers are handled. Okay, so, but I still want to touch with a little bit on the 6G story um, because we are in two of the four big German 6G hubs. So currently, since already two years roughly, we are using our brain and try to think what could 6G be. And we are in the 6G RIC, which is driven here in Berlin. And we are in the open hub, in the open 6G hub, which is driven by the University of Kaiserslautern and DFKI. My buddy Hans Schotten is in the driving seat. And in this particular project, we are building the open 6G core. And so the storyline for us and for you is we have understood that we have a very cool user plane function quite performant, good for the next years. And the core network architecture, you know, the service-based architecture is nice, but to some extent quite inefficient because all of these boxes in the service architecture, you have seen the open 5G core and all these boxes. These have to communicate with each other. That is not the most performant and efficient way. So we have created the concept of organic core in the hub project. So the idea is that in 6G, because we have to work in networks which are very small and networks which might be very large due to the NTN integration. And this means 
a base station, namely a satellite, flies in and flies out, you have to cope with this dynamicity. Yeah? And organic means also networks can grow functionality-wise, capacity-wise. So um, this is what is needed for the future in order to create a successful infrastructure. So, and we are inspired by the internet architecture, so we will work with front ends, and these front ends then talk to service components or servers or services, and then uh, we follow the principle of a shared centralized subscriber state in order to allow fancy handover and mobility patterns. So long story short, we are currently having a prototype demo up and running where we are implementing and aggregating key functionalities of a 5G core in specific services and then interact with them. So there is less, much less interactions of these components. Um, you have much more flexibility to place them, relocate them um, for power savings, shut them down, put them somewhere. So basically this slide is illustrating the principles which are guiding us for the design of this. The interesting part is we make it the, you will see big announcements, middle of the year, we have a big 6G conference here in Berlin, and um, we will have two network operators stamping our core as this is the way to go forward. Um, so they stand behind us and helping us in doing things right. Um, ah, I didn't change the picture, this is the picture. So, and um, in fact, I wanted to go to this picture. So uh, therefore, um, middle of the year, we will announce this statement. It will be packaged with a nice RAN UE combination. This should become the German toolkit for 6G research. As I'm an international guy, I already have links to Japan, Singapore, US, and the like. So we will aim to make it the global 6G core toolkit. And this allows to add very specific local things, local things in terms that we are keeping control of the main basic parts and then uh, our partners, customers could add to this specific radio access network technologies, ICAS modules for integrated sensing and uh, communication, positioning stuff, um, management staff, AI stuff, so we will provide when we are progress accordingly the interfaces to allow these partners, customers to do their own research. And hopefully with this we will create a big um, ecosystem to stimulate research. So I skipped these slides. I just wanted to say one more word and I'm not sure whether um, Ramona, I'm just looking for you. Do you also talk about open 6 net or did you talk? Yeah. Okay, so then I don't have to do it. So while the open 6 core is a toolkit where we currently put a lot of money in, we have to sell it in order to somehow get the money back and maintain it. Um, so this is similar to the open 5 g core, and you have seen a previous slide. It's somehow like an upgrade and an on because we share the same UPF. You can still use the 5 g core, which we still develop further. But this is a little bit more the disruptive way of thinking how we can do cloud native a much better job in this kind of network environment. The more or less free of charge thing is at my university chair, and uh, Ramona will talk to you later about this. So I created this initiative. We had a big kickoff workshop in Cape Town, my second hometown, and um, people from Japan, from Singapore, from US and other places joined me in making this thing happen. And basically it's initiated by cooperation with Cape Town University, where we are collecting useful 5G open source technologies, useful. And uh, we are particularly combining useful combinations and test them. And once these are tested and we consider they are useful for students, we put them in the catalog. Yeah? And the idea is that every university which is really bankrupt but still wants to start with this research can start with this kind of technology. Of course, you need to invest into some radio uh, system or you use a radio emulator. But for me, for instance, here at Technical University, it was important students who are passing by and say, hey, we want to work with 5G. 
I don't let them onto the focus premises and on our core. Yeah? Otherwise, this thing might go everywhere. No, so in order to handle these requests, Ramo Erna has developed this kind of environment and hopefully we will grow it with open source passionists. So currently we have quite good run components, we have core components, we are looking for management components, UEs and simulators and tools and so on. So hopefully let's make it a success. I'm pushing for it globally, have lots of panels around the globe to make this thing a big activity. So, Daniel mentioned, and I'm already over my time, um, we make every year a big show in our facilities, lots of demos, you can see the nomadic node, you can see the 6G core, you can see fancy other stuff, and particularly meet very interesting network operators and uh, industry players, but also university uh, professors from all over the world. It's a cool party for two days. Um, so save the date. It was a pleasure to talk to you. I hope you at least have taken something with you. You should get these slides. And um, if you're interested, contact Daniela, ah, Ramona. It was a tough week and I'm still fasting. Yeah? So, but there uh, is a Daniela there, so they can contact <laughs> Yeah, there is a Daniel. But um, talk to these guys, uh, which could be the interface or email me directly. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas. Really appreciate it and good to have the insights. Questions before Thomas? Uh, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Um, in the last few years, we've seen a lot of warfare around the world, in Ukraine, of course, and I'm wondering if this is somehow influencing the development of 5G, 6G. Uh, you mentioned the nomadic uh, use cases, and I'm just wondering if this is, has piqued your mind and if it's uh, somehow influencing your uh, development. Um, you, you said welfare? Wars. wars. Warfare. War, like wars in Ukraine. Yeah, is okay. If this nomadic node could help? Yeah, let's say, of course it could help. Uh, this is a no-brainer, uh, honestly, let's say. Um, first of all, the real problem is that me, myself, as a professor of the Technical University, I'm not allowed to do anything with military. Otherwise, they will fire me. Okay, so... But my focus guys can do, others can do. Yeah. So honestly, let's say, um, yeah, of course, the, the use cases are there. I'm not driven by the warfare. And I think there has to be a big change in thinking, even in Germany, because I think, you know, when the Russians are coming, we are dead. <laughs> There's no way to defend ourselves. It's a drama. Um, but look at uh, situations where we have these flood catastrophes, and it took so many days to build up an infrastructure. We could do this, right? The point is, and, and you are right, when we develop this, and this nomadic note as an example, um, my deputy, Marius Kurici, when he did his master thesis some, I don't know, 19 years ago or maybe 17 years ago, um, he developed Comcase. Comcase was a satellite suitcase, so basically a satellite UE with a Wi-Fi hotspot. And the idea was, okay, we can now bring this to Africa or to other places and then allow local communities to be connected to the internet. And then this, of course, this idea uh, evolved. What we have learned is um, when you want to do, and this is why I'm saying welfare or doing good, the NGOs and so on, no one has money, you know, no one wants to pay for this, which is a drama and is really sad. And obviously, yes, this is a technology which um, 
is already used in, in military setups. Yeah? And we, I know companies in the military context where, for instance, the tanks, the trucks are having their own network. Then when they come together, they build up a mesh network and you know, cell size grows and so on. So um, we even have worked long ago with BlackNet in the EPC time to build up mesh networks. And BlackNet is a company, as you may know, <laughs> is uh, now with Rheinmetall, and they have been always in the military context. OK, thank you. Another questions because I have one about uh, you know I'm still like application layer since mm. I left Focus uh, and recently I got a bit more in touch and the event uh, two days ago helped me to get a better um, uh, view of what's now at the l lower layer and for me the evolution from 4G to 5G because I'm not a huge consumer uh, is that. Uh, <coughs> The entry barrier is much lower for uh, like an average guy like me, passionate about communication. So 3G, 4G was impossible to acquire, you know, the radio and then look at what the software. So luckily with this 5G, it's affordable, at least for small, medium companies, it's much better. But do you predict that maybe 7, 8, what, whatsoever is going to become like really programmable by the average guy like we see now with Twilio or all these API telephony platforms that, you know, some sm smart guy has an idea and then you can hook into some APIs in the core network without very laborious, you know, legal agreements. You go on the website, you give your billing details and in five minutes you are ready to use this. Because it's a lot of smart things done by the core and by uh, the entire infrastructure, but still it's kind of controlled by the big operators right now. Okay, yeah, so, so hmm. the answer is complex. It's complex because of different, um, maybe it's simple. I would say yes, done. So now the explanation is complex. So then first, <laughs> you know, the... the, the but I want it would be the 8G, the 9G. Which no, it will be 6G. It will be definitely. It will be happening in the next five years, for sure. Because we we see different streams. I'm not sure whether things like Camara, these are, for instance, the network interfaces which Twilio also long ago offered to third parties. I don't know whether Camara will fly or not. But we have um, big players like Bosch and other big companies who want this API and they don't want to care whether this is Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone or Telefonica or some other operator somewhere, they can now use a network and build their services on top. So then this means the question is who am I or who are you in a value chain? Yeah? That's the question because the point is there are in the future very different operation models you can go with an operator, you can do it on yourself when you have the skills. And now I'm talking more a little bit on, on companies. Yeah? Um, or you go to, and I think this is how you print the money in the future, being an integrator. Because when we talk about modular network infrastructures, we need someone who is bringing these things together. We talk about continuous development, continuous testing, and so on. So this means you have one component from one supplier which goes now back into the system, and is it compromising the system or not? So someone has to take care on, on this, right? Um, so the point is what we currently observe is that the with the what I call private networks, campus networks, it's a global phenomenon. It becomes clear also now, yesterday it was interesting because we had the wireless world research huddle for two days at Focus with a lot of Bundesnetzagentur, so regulators. And there is a learning, and the learning is we don't want to give them frequencies anymore only to the network operators. We need more flexible spectrum allocation schemes, dynamic spectrum, I would not say sharing, but be more flexible. So this is what we will see. So I'm sure that in the future, everyone, if he's willing and having a brilliant idea, could go for spectrum. And when you have the spectrum, you can do something. So now we see also that networks become a commodity for, in the sense that 
they become a minor part in an application context. So now the question is for whom you are building what? Yeah? Are you still on the enabling layer and say, we can provide connectivity for you in the me medical environment, we can do this for multimedia. So now this is a challenge why 5G is still not existing in success everywhere, but when you know what you want to do, with whom you want to do, things become very easy. And the last answer to it is, we talk about non-zero touch networking. And when we talk about an organic network, we build now the executables to be configured, but the configuration will come from AI and machine learning. So we also assume that we will see in the future much more abstraction layers according to the super stupid user or the application on top, where the network takes care for what you want. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So therefore, this is, in my opinion, a combination of trends which will, I have a very radical thesis. I'm saying 6G in the future, because of new frequencies, is a technology which leads to very different types of customized networks. And these networks somehow need to be federated and talk to each other if they need. Yeah? And there's a willingness to do so. So when you see all the features which we currently have in 5G, and then what is currently discussed in 6G, 3GPP will not handle to standardize all this. So I believe they will standardize a red cap, reduced capability, minimum functionality, allowing others to do on top their customization. Okay, great. Would be 6G, it's good for me. I'm not retired, I think. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the point is, you know, now we have talked about 2030 6G deployment, and we, it is like 5G deployment. It happens somewhere very slowly. Yeah. However, 6G is now, because now you have to brainstorm. Now you can go to standardization. Now you can follow standardization and build up your own ideas. Yeah. So the next years are glorious for startups. Okay, Thomas, really many thanks again for all uh, your support for Tamayo Award and everything in real-time communication. You saw some events that you can catch. This mic will I not take. Please take it back here. With Thomas. I think it's. Thank you. Fuseco Forum in autumn, next week in Hanover Messe. So we are uh, a bit over time, but we started late, so Wolfgang, you have the full slot, 30 minutes, don't, uh, <coughs> don't worry about it, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna uh, introduce quickly Wolfgang, a very good friend of Kamailio and developer, and also very good friend of Kamailio World. He has been at many editions, presenting always very good insights of what happens in the emergency services, current generation, next generation. He's also involved in standardization with Etsy, INA, and other uh, groups across uh, Europe mainly, but also US, NG911, NG112. Thank you, Volgan, really appreciating you coming every year more or less to yeah, thanks Shame Daniel, thanks for the introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here and a great honor to speak to you. Um, and it was a great introduction by Thomas for me because he was talking about 6G. I'm jumping now back to 4G, but I have a question for you. What besides the G uh, do 4G, 5G and 6G have in common? G. Besides the G. <laughs> no idea? CDMA? Close. <laughs> No, no, it's quite simple. It's packet switch technology, and this means for emergency communication, you can do other media than voice, uh, which is actually great for accessibility. And uh, I'll introduce to you today what else to do besides LOST. LOST is the module I did a few years ago, uh, so it's just a small piece of it. And uh, I think the, the bigger part is also lies in the media and in, in other parts. And uh, yeah, I'm with Frequentis. Uh, a corporate research. Uh, this talk is not about rocket science, uh, so we also have some systems uh, at uh, DLR, for instance, at NASA. This is more the public safety part, and it's about uh, yeah, emergency communication. I'm uh, also with INA and the Technical and Operational Committee, uh, and uh, I'm co-founder of uh, 
small association in Austria. It's called uh, DEC 112, which means uh, Digital Emergency Communication 112. And uh, we provide a next generation 112 based uh, accessibility service in Austria, which is, I think, available since five years. Uh, it's a, a text based uh, emergency communication solution. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's being used uh, mostly by deaf people uh, because we don't have other good services in Austria. So there is just a, a fax solution and an SMS solution, uh, which is actually not used that often. Um, a short recap, uh, I've done this uh, last time as well. So it's uh, about next generation core services. So what does it mean? Uh, we, we have on the left side originating networks uh, and uh, then we, we have an infrastructure uh, which is actually uh, yeah, a common uh, solution uh, for individual uh, originating networks or service providers like uh, IMS, like Voice of IP. Uh, so usually it's the telco operator that uh, does the routing to the most appropriate piece up. Uh, but with, the, with, with such an infrastructure, we have the capability to move this uh, to the agency. Uh, so they would then have to run this kind of core services uh, in order to uh, route to the most appropriate piece up. So if, if this is a model uh, in, in a certain country, like in Austria, we have uh, federal states and uh, federal states are responsible uh, for emergency communication. So we would have to route uh, to a piece up or emergency communication center in Vienna if you are dialing uh, 144 for the ambulance uh, and you are located in Vienna. So the, the main elements uh, uh, are the emergency core routing function, it's called the ECRF. So this is kind of GIS database that uh, keeps the service boundaries and, and does the mapping. So actually it gets a request, uh, it's called the, the lost request, uh, so it's an XML structure uh, which provides the location information which provides the the, the service request, so if it's police ambulance or uh, just simply SOS. And returns back uh, a CPU URI uh, or a plain telephone number depending on, on the system um, that's uh, being used. The other element uh, is the ESRP, the Emergency Service Routing Proxy. Uh, and uh, this is yeah a simple uh, SIP proxy with some extensions because it needs to understand the loss protocol and the health protocol. Uh, held is uh, HTTP enabled location delivery. So this is being used to uh, query uh, a location information service and uh, retrieve location information based, for instance, on an identity. So the identity could be uh, E164 number or a CPU URI. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, it returns back uh, location information, which uh, then is used uh, to query the ECRF. Uh, last but not least, uh, the, the list itself uh, is a location information service and uh, perhaps you've heard, uh, who knows about AML? AML. Actually, oh great, one person. Uh, that's, that's enabled right now. So if you uh, dial emergency number, for instance, in Germany, uh, your mobile device, uh, being Android or iOS, uh, sends uh, an SMS uh, to an endpoint uh, providing a location information. And this can be uh, queried by the piece of that gets the call. So using the, the identity, which is the phone number. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, around since a couple of years. Uh, and this helps uh, to yeah, provide a much better location information uh, to the piece of. So this, this could be used for dispatching. So it's really then the, the GPS location that your device knows. Uh, Nina and Etsy we have defined this kind of uh, core services. So basically, uh, it's based on some, some RFCs uh, and, and other specifications. And uh, you can actually uh, download. Uh, it's public available. So uh, I will share the slides anyway. And uh, all this Nina IS3 and Etsy DS10349 uh, are links uh, in the slide. Uh, so you can just uh, have a look at it. And yeah, just to summarize, main task is uh, throughout emergency communication to the most appropriate emergency communication center or piece up. And this is independent of the originating network. So this means that the originating network provider would have to provide some information, which is most important on the location. It doesn't have to be very accurate. It just uh, needs to be accurate enough uh, to figure out what piece up uh, is responsible uh, for that region. And uh, in addition to that, if it's not uh, just 
the basic service URN, URN service SOS, if it's uh, another service like fire, like ambulance or uh, police, uh, then um, would have to provide uh, this, this service request, which is actually triggered by the user. So in the zip invite, you won't find uh, uh, a zip URI in the request line, you will find uh, a service URI. Yeah, the, the lost module uh, is, uh, as I said, something that turns uh, Camilo into an ESRP. Uh, so with this location-based routing capabilities, uh, and recently I've updated uh, the module with, with some uh, support of uh, shape representations as in RFC uh, 5491. Uh, so far it was just uh, a circle uh, and a point uh, that uh, was used uh, by the module uh, to create an ECRF. But yesterday uh, Nick showed me a trace uh, from, from a mobile device in his network uh, and the device was providing an ellipsoid uh, in three dimensions. So you have uh, the position and you have a set axis as well. Um, so uh, that's why I've implemented this capability. And since not all of the ECRFs are enabled uh, to support 3D uh, queries or lost requests, uh, you can enable and disable this uh, by a specific parameter in the module. And what uh, the, the module then does is uh, simply uh, cut out uh, the, the position uh, and use it to the uh, location point uh, and request this at the ECRF. Um, the timeline, uh, so actually we, we are right here. Yeah? So <laughs> next year um, we will, well, hopefully we'll see some, some changes uh, in the infrastructures because there is some um, important thing. It's the European Accessibility Act that <coughs> actually requires uh, networks to have the capability uh, to route to the most appropriate piece up. Uh, so that's actually done uh, with those core services. And uh, to support equivalent access. And this means uh, you need something else uh, than uh, just voice because some, some people are not able to speak. Uh, you might be in a situation where you can't speak but you would like to text uh, uh, to emergency communication. So this means uh, the support of uh, real-time text. Uh, RFC 4103, uh, and also video, if, if this is already enabled uh, for accessibility uh, in the infrastructures. Uh, and there are two uh, milestones. The first one is uh, the infrastructure needs to enable this, so this might be some changes uh, in the mobile network operator's infrastructure or in the voice service provider infrastructure. Uh, and then 2027, it's required that this is being supported uh, by the piece of so the um, emergency communication um, centers. So perhaps next year at Camilla World, I can talk about the first uh, installations uh, or deployments in, in some networks. What uh, does actually equivalence mean? Uh, so it's, this is uh, not AI generated, uh, this picture. Uh, so this is a screenshot uh, from, uh, uh, I think it was a Samsung device. Uh, when we did some testing in the US uh, and uh, you, you can see here uh, there is a, a symbol for, for video, uh, there is the audio and there is a text symbol, so this, that's the native dialer. So this means it's being enabled uh, in the IMS, so there's some, some profiles that need to be enabled or some bundles that need to be uh, in place uh, that the end device can do it. Uh, so we have already end devices, uh, I think even your Mobile device uh, would have this capability, and if you have the right provider in the US, uh, you may see this uh, via the lock screen, and uh, you may have the capability to uh, start the communication using real-time text, for instance. So equivalence means you can just grab your, any device, uh, you enable the dialer via the lock screen, and then you can select different types of media. In addition, uh, as you all know, in a mobile network infrastructure, you get a higher priority if you do an emergency uh, attachment and the setup procedure in the IMS, uh, and uh, you can choose, uh, no matter where you are, uh, any type of, of this uh, media. Um, another important thing is, uh, Tim is not here because he mentioned yesterday that 
He likes to have uh, the local breakout uh, capability in the IMS uh, for latency reasons. Uh, in emergency communication, uh, it's also quite important to get these local breakout capabilities for emergency calling because if, uh, as an Austrian person, if I would dial an emergency number, yeah, 112 here, and uh, my provider is in, in Austria, I would perhaps get connected to an Austrian PISA, uh, but I need someone who helps me here in Germany. So that needs to be also done via the local breakout. And yeah, all this uh, cannot be done, even if there are nice uh, applications around, this cannot be done with, with over the top. So we need support uh, from the mobile network operators, uh, from the end devices, uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, why there's a lot of uh, standardization going on as well. What else to do? So um, you've seen uh, we, we have different capabilities on, on the end device, we have different uh, originating service provider infrastructures, so, so I simplified this a little bit. Uh, so on the left, the OSP uh, usually has something that uh, knows about the location, could be in an IMS, or could be a service from a mobile network operator, uh, does something uh, to, to interconnect uh, with, uh, with other providers or with the emergency services, and has something that deals uh, with session management. So however this looks like, uh, that could be quite a simple uh, zip uh, core uh, with, with a Camellia proxy, or it could be a little bit more complex uh, with uh, yeah, IMS elements, whatever. So there is the ECSCF, you may have heard about it, uh, which, which deals with the emergency. Um, and then we, we have this, this colored, uh, things uh, here, this is uh, besides the ESRP that I've introduced, or the PCF, the border control function, or the ECRF, we have other things uh, for, for media processing, for instance, there is uh, something, it's called a bridge uh, in the specification. Um, this could be a free switch, for instance. And uh, this needs to support uh, some add-ons, uh, like for instance, uh, a transfer is, is not just simple a, a transfer, it's always a conference in emergency communication. Uh, so um, if you use ad hoc methods, uh, so the, the PISA would then ask uh, for a conference uh, service uh, at the bridge uh, and then send out the refer to uh, yeah, the new, to, to dial into uh, the, 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 the other PISA that needs to be connected, so if it's transfer, uh, and would provide additional information. I'll talk about this later for uh, sharing uh, incident data, for instance. Um, we have also recording capabilities uh, here that's uh, defined uh, with, with ZipRec and um, a lot of other things uh, that are on the, let's say, signaling plane, like identity, uh, incident data sharing, location, logging, outbound calls and callback, and uh, if needed, um, if such networks are interconnected, so cross-border, for instance. Uh, there's something called a, a forest guide, so that's part of the lost hierarchy, um, just to uh, figure out, okay, where would I have to ask uh, for the mapping uh, when I um, need to connect to Germany, for instance. Um, trusted identity. Um, we heard a presentation uh, yesterday from Twilio about uh, steel shaking, so that's actually, um, the same thing here, so uh, what uh, the emergency services would expect uh, is, and if, if it's steel shaken compliant, uh, then they would, could do it, is that uh, the identity is verified and uh, is signed, uh, and uh, this is part of the, the invite request sent into uh, such an infrastructure, and then there is something like a validation service uh, that uh, yeah, gets then the public certificate and uh, verifies uh, if, uh, yeah, the identity is, is known and uh, then would just uh, insert this uh, parameter, the versed parameter, to let other elements know uh, that are uh, downstream, uh, know about, okay, this, this, this call was uh, verified and there was a successful verification process. Uh, important here is that if uh, there is no uh, signed uh, request or there is uh, a failure and not a success in, in the verification process, it's still being forwarded. Yeah, so there might be some indication at the piece of, okay, this, this is perhaps um, yeah, a suspicious caller or whatever, 
uh, but it still needs to be forwarded uh, uh, towards the PISA. Uh, and uh, with, uh, with the identity header, we, we get actually assigned uh, identity, which is then being used uh, for callback uh, purposes. Uh, so the PIA header is uh, yeah, maybe inserted by the provider um, and signed, and then it's being consumed at, at the PISA. Um, and uh, this helps us for the callback, uh, which is shown here. There is another element, uh, which is actually a proxy with certain uh, extensions. It's called the OSIF. It's the outbound call interface function. Uh, and that's actually the entity that, that just uh, interworks uh, with uh, the SDIAS. So it gets the information uh, from the piece up. Uh, so there's the from header, uh, peer identity header, RPH, uh, which is resource priority, which equals to ESnet 0, 1, 2, or whatever. Uh, and the C priority, which uh, uh, contains the piece of callback information. So, and uh, all this is signed. Um, so, we have an RPH uh, passport and a shaken passport. Um, and then it's being forwarded uh, to the provider. So, the provider can then uh, do the, the validation. Uh, this is uh, currently being tested. Uh, so, I think end of this year we'll have another um, plug fest event uh, where we uh, want to test this uh, with, with actual providers to see, okay, does it work in both directions? Uh, we already tested it uh, uh, towards the piece up, uh, but the callback uh, um, is, is something very new. Uh, another thing, uh, quite interesting, uh, because this is, uh, introduces uh, new uh, interfaces. Uh, so far, there was a lot of XML things uh, that's being shared. Um, but uh, with, with the uh, incident data exchange service, uh, we have something new that uses JSON over WebSocket. So actually, you, you get a, a URL as PSAP, and you can uh, subscribe uh, using this URL. So there's some, some uh, messages uh, being defined, and then you would get notifications if something uh, changed or uh, something was added by the, by the incident. So uh, this, this new uh, emergency incident data object actually replaces the traditional serial port. Uh, so there's this computer-aided dispatching. You have in a piece up, you always have uh, the code taking and the dispatching um, part of it. And um, so far, it was always a serial line that interconnects those things. And, and now it's a very modern uh, JSON over WebSocket thing. Uh, and, uh, I mentioned this before, if you transfer a call from one piece up to the other piece up, uh, then you uh, actually provide this kind of EIDO URI, uh, which is then being used by the new piece up uh, to get all this incident data uh, that was uh, recorded by the first piece up, uh, and uh, then you can work on it. And even the previous piece up uh, could still uh, be subscribed and get some notifications about what was going on uh, in terms of uh, yeah, CAD information. Uh, SIP events, uh, that's also uh, quite interesting. So there's a lot of uh, things uh, that are uh, being exchanged using subscribe notify, even for, for entities that do not have a SIP stack usually. Uh, it's like the ECRF, uh, so it's not a SIP entity, but it uh, needs to su support subscribe notify uh, just to, to provide uh, yeah, uh, notifications with, with some uh, crazy names like the gap overlap. So gap is geographic area of primary uh, responsibility. So this is this kind of area the piece of is responsible for. And if, if there is an overlap, um, then the ECRF would notify the ESRB saying, okay, there is an overlap. Uh, you need to decide uh, where the route to, and this can be done based on some, some uh, other conditions uh, like, like the queue state, where the piece provides to the ESRP, okay, the queue is full, uh, I need to, uh, reroute or retarget it uh, to another entity. And there's also the, the location information service with the held interface that uh, provides uh, yeah, zip subscribe notify for presence events, which means uh, updating uh, location. Logging and recording, uh, also a different interface, JSON-based uh, HTTP. Uh, so logging web services usually receive signed uh, JSON objects. Uh, so you get everything actually to do the logger. So it's uh, external events, internal events, media, 
which is CPREC, uh, and uh, CPID HTTP messages. So everything that exchanges something uh, takes everything into uh, such a JSON web, uh, JSON document, sorry, and, and forwards it uh, to the logger. Um, yeah, um, some, some funny stuff. Um, we had a project, this Stack 112 uh, association, we had a project in Austria where we uh, were dealing with IoT for emergency communication, so that's the, 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 the image on, on the right side. Uh, so where we uh, used this kind of emergency buttons uh, with, with some sensors, uh, and we used the zip message uh, and uh, the CUP uh, common alerting protocol, and I'm not sure if you heard about CNML. Uh, it sends uh, measurement lists, uh, it's an RFC that uh, describes a format uh, that is designed uh, for uh, processes with very limited capabilities. So like this, this book.js, so it has a, um, a few sensors like temperature uh, and, and, and detects also movement. Uh, and we integrated this uh, um, with, with some, some gateway and then yeah, enhanced it with, with some zip messages uh, to, and location information that it can be routed uh, through the, the infrastructure to the PISA. So the PISA would then see, okay, this was an IoT device uh, and it provided some, some information or there was an alarm. And the, the other thing, uh, this is not uh, the next generation's GNOME phone, uh, so this is just uh, something I, I tried out. So I found uh, on GitHub the uh, a doorbell solution, uh, so where someone was implementing a zip stack uh, and uh, everything is needed like STP and then media processing. Uh, and I was curious if, if this also works uh, with emergency communication, so I uh, added some, some location information, I added an emergency button, and uh, yeah, it could be something for a dangerous demo in the future. Uh, I figured out that the zip stack is, is, needs some enhancements uh, to, to interwork uh, with emergency uh, communication, but uh, uh, at least uh, with an asterisk box and the echo service, it, it, it worked. Okay, finally, uh, interoperability testing. Um, so I would like to invite everyone who is interested to join us uh, at the next uh, Plugfest or plug test event uh, in Malaga in Spain. Uh, so the date is end of uh, September, uh, where we have uh, 4G, 5G infrastructure, and uh, actually it's not shown here, but uh, even web service provider uh, are invited to join uh, just to uh, see how it works uh, with emergency communication. So we, we are trying to test uh, audio, video, real-time text from the end devices, uh, next generation e-call, um, and, and this kind of uh, infrastructure in between. Uh, and uh, for sure there will be someone who is not here today but uh, has an IMS and already told me that he is going to join us. Uh, so it will be quite interesting to see, okay, how does this uh, work together and uh, can we actually route an emergency call uh, from a real network infrastructure uh, towards the PSAP. So it's open to everyone, um, and uh, there will be some, I think, call for registration from Etsy. And if you're interested, uh, just uh, drop me a line. Uh, here's some uh, contact information, and I'll forward you the information from Etsy. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, Wolfgang. <laughs> it's, it's good to have the perspective from like standardization body and also knowing that you are a developer I trust that you put some breaks when they start a bit uh, exaggerating with you know over engineering the specs and hopefully we'll see this running out maybe one quick question to catch up a bit on time and then Volkman will be around uh, thank you um, my question is how do you test uh, these new services uh, like you call directly to the actual uh, um, people that take the emergency calls or is there a separate uh, number or service uh, like in US we have 933 for testing emergency calls so is there a um, if, like if, we, if we run some, some tests uh, we, we have a certain infrastructure where we have uh, specific numbers uh, so in Austria they did uh, recently some testing uh, with uh, uh, a number that, that was downloaded uh, to the device, uh, so attaching uh, to the network, uh, getting some information from the MME, it's the extended emergency number list, and there was a, a five digits number just for testing purposes. And for the device it was a real uh, emergency number, so that, that is one way. But usually if we have this uh, in, in a lab, um, 
then there is uh, specific SIM cards uh, being used uh, and, the, and you have the closed <coughs> environment and uh, you can then define what, whatever number you would like to have, yes. Or if it's web based, uh, then you, you just connect the uh, web infrastructure and yeah, decide what number to use for emergency. Okay, thank you once again. Tori, you have a quick one? Uh, you're Very quick one. Half your, a question. Your equivalency side, uh, I mentioned video. Is, is that true? Uh, what, if so, uh, what video codecs are there? And just to also confirm the te real time text, that's the real time text in the media stream, not message message, right? Yes, it's the real-time text in the media stream, it's RFC 4103, uh, regarding uh, video. Um, um, in, in Europe, it's, it's, it's a bit different, so the, the accessibility access, if, if there are already uh, services, uh, third-party services enabled in a country with video, then you would have to provide it uh, for emergency services as well. If they are not in place, then it's uh, enough to have uh, real-time text and audio. And the codecs, uh, phew, I don't know, but, but they are usually um, based on, on requirements uh, for, for sign language. So you need a kind of frame rate uh, and uh, uh, resolution that supports uh, sign language. Okay. But you find it in the standard, so they are yeah. Okay. Thank you once again. And we get now Roman to set up. And meanwhile, I want to uh, offer to the woman in the room some small present because. They were not that lucky to win so far. Unfortunately, I couldn't find um, something that I could give to everyone. We have like four or five of them. So someone will have to be a bit luckier and get a book, and the other will get a box of uh, chocolate. Ramona, maybe I extracted. It's why I asked some person here about the name on the badge, because I was not sure. You have to extract one that will get the book, nope. a Kamailu okay. book, and the other ones will get. Okay, so Milica gets the book. We are very happy to have you, like other gender in the technical, rather technical conference, and for. Uh, the other, I think three are here. Uh, I can't see any I can see. So. You just put it somewhere, not mm -hmm. take it from away. Okay. Doing strange things and someone it's not yet here. It's anyone that has a colleague, woman. So you are Yara, <coughs> and then and then then Carla. I think it's missing. Okay, I'll keep it. Probably it's outside. Yeah. Yeah. So Carla, it's missing. All the other are uh, having so a round of applause for the brave woman that <laughs> come and attend the technical. Uh, technical conferences and we would like to have more and more because they always have good ideas and contribute. Now I give the microphone to Thank you. Roman, which is coming from uh, Conton Transportation, uh, Austria. Let him to introduce himself and what they do yeah. there. Thank so you. Good afternoon. Seems uh, another Austrian country, uh, another Austrian company presenting. So I'm from Conton. I'm doing a presentation about mission critical uh, service over the top. It's just one of our deployment and where we use Camilio as, as lightweight IMS. You will see why lightweight for this deployment method and also some other functionalities for which we use Camilio basically. So this is what, what I would like to, to talk about um, in the next 25 minutes. A few words about Contron that you see what we are doing. A few words about myself. And what is mission critical and, and can we realize it over the top? The building blocks of the architecture and, and then also how we use uh, a specifically Camilio and also an outlook what we plan to do next. So Contron Transportation is basically providing end-to-end -end solutions for mission critical 
um, clients. So our majority of the customers are in the railway domain. Um, yesterday we have heard that, that 2G is dead, that's true, but in the railway market it's still alive and it's called GSMR, so GSMR for railways, and it's still alive for the next at least 10 years. And a part of that, we, we work on the next generation, which is um, more or less this MCX. MCX stands for MCPDT, MC Video, and MC Data, where MC Data can be SDS, so a short message, um, likes for messaging, and as well as file distribution, so you get a link and can share and upload files. So this is basically what Contron does, and as said, I'm based in Austria. I'm Roman, part of Generation X. I did development for wireless, so I started with 2G. Um, we had a joint venture in those days with a US company, Nortel Networks, doing MSC, um, SGSN, so the old stuff, development. 2006, um, I started with this GSMR development, also in the uh, core domain, so access is not, not my area. And quite late, I started looking into this uh, IMS and MCPTT solution, and we, we did some research, and finally it figured, turned out that we plan to use Camellio for, for our IMS um, solution, and yeah, um, private, I like very much DevOps, so that's what I really like. Um, a few words, what, what is mission critical? Um, so communications should be um, available wherever and whenever needed, right? It should be reliable, so, so you should have low probability of failures or call drops. So yesterday also some speaker said in the wireless days, if a call drops, uh, who cares? You, you just push the button again and redial. Um, but in, in our um, area and for our clients, e each call um, must um, stay alive and, and should not drop, of course, <laughs> sometimes it happens. And, of course, secure, but that's also for the public um, domains. I picked a few mission-critical um, functions. Um, so what, what's used in mission-critical networks, so on the one side it's voice, it's also um, optional with push to talk, so that you should, must request when you want to talk. Then we have the group communication also via push to talk. We have video communication, video communication in groups. Then we have fast call setups, and I have some phones here. You can give it a try. Really, it's, it's, it's really fast. Um, we have priorities and preemption. And we also have to, to ensure um, interconnection with other systems because, as said, um, in the railway market, the, the customers or the, the, the operators will remain for the next 10 years, and we have to, to allow a, a migration, and this will be in parallel for for sure uh, 10 years, I would say. Um, what's the different um, mission critical and commercial? So on the radio side, basically you need the radio in, in a mission critical network where geographically dependent, so not where the people are, so you need the, the radio where, let's say, the, the railway tracks are, right? Um, while in, in public you need good coverage where a lot of people. Um, in mission critical networks, we have direct mode, um, which we do not have in public um, networks. The users are also only a few. When I say a few, it can be a few thousand, but in public, you have millions of users. Encrypt encryption authentication is available in both. Um, what I said, we have point to point, but on top, we have also the group communication, which we typically do not have in <coughs> commercial networks. The spectrum is also auctioned and in the mission critically it's allocated. And we have priorities and preemption. So that means higher priority calls can preempt um, lower priority calls or can also assign quality of service. And typically we do not bill uh, in mission critical networks even though we use billing or, or CDRs for statistical purposes. Okay, the question is now when we look into what I just said, if it's uh, possible to do mission critical service over the top of a public commercial operator network, in principle, no, because 
you can only build a crit mission critical system if you have the chain of all. So you have, um, on the one hand, the devices, which we would have. So these are ruggedized. They have a push to talk functionality. They have an emergency button. So this is what we would have. We also would have mission critical applications. But we don't have um, the network mission critical grade because, as I said, we use um, public networks, right? And so that's the crucial point here. So we, um, for certain clients, we can accept this with some mitigations we do, and this I come in a second. Um, so let me show you the, the architecture and how Camellio is used within it. So basically, um, we have our data center, so this is deployed in public clouds. 90% um, of customers in, in Mission Critical do not allow to, to deploy in public cloud, so we have to do on-premise. Typically, we deploy on-premise, and we use Kubernetes as our major, major platform. Um, but in this, in this deployment model, we offer um, in public cloud, where we have the IMS, um, or also called zip core because it's a lightweight IMS, which you will see in some of the later slides. We have our application um, servers, and this is all running in the cloud, and we have a gateway, um, which is running an open VPN server, and on the phones, so these are basically mounted in their vehicles. They are running also a VPN client, and we have also dispatcher systems, which are in the dispatcher room, so it's like flight controller that train communicates with the dispatcher in the dispatcher room or communicates um, with other trains or they can do group calls to, to include all the trains in a specific area. And all those um, devices are using OpenVPN clients to connect to the gateway and within the network um, we go with um, unencrypted. And the mobile devices can use over the top 4G, 5G, and what we typically do to mitigate, we put two SIM cards in those devices, and the first SIM card is from the home country, and the, the second one is from a foreign country. Why is that? Because that would allow to, to access each and every network and not only the one of the SIM card. Okay, now the, the building blocks of this MCX solution. So as said, on the, on the right side, you see the, the gateway VM. We run the OpenVPN server. We have a static IP, which we have configured on the VPN client. Um, we also have an MDM system managing the client to update our MCX application on the phones. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, we run a few other things on the, on the gateway VM. You will see later on for interconnection. And then we have our internal subnet, let's say, where we have all of our components, management provisioning. Also, we run some, some status server there, like a present service. I will come also to that later on, because also here we use some Camellio functions. Um, we have a, an application server. As I said, we have two. We have also on the very top, it's a media resource function. It's the mixer, because we have to support group calls as well. What I've just said, we have the SCSCF, PCSCF, and the HSS. And basically, the, the Camellio IMS is used for SCSCF and PCSCF. Um, all the IMS modules which, which are there, we have some other on top modules um, in use. Um, RTP engine, zip trace, we use the dispatcher module for failover and switchback. And we have our own module um, for railway dedicated networks. We have not um, published it yet because it's not fully, fully ready. But I will also give a few words about what it's capable and what it's doing. Um, <clears throat> this is the similar picture. And you see now why it's lightweight. And I, I show you in the next slide. So here we have the PCSCF, so the, the, the green um, boxes are basically the Camellio ones. We have the ICSCF and SCSCF integrated in this deployment um, to keep the, let's say, the, the resources low, because as said, it's really only a few users. We have the HSS, 
um, with the CX interface using Diameter, also the CDP, um, CDP AVP uh, modules. We are connecting the application server via ISC interface. Also, we connect other application servers for message interworking, like uh, um, IPSM gateway, for instance. And we have our RTP proxy, um, which we feed with um, the RTP proxy and G protocol and the HEP. And the proxy then sends the SIP and RTP uh, towards the recorder. Um, what is the recorder? It's, it's called um, black box recorder. It's, it's like in the, in, in, in the flights when you, when you have an incident. So in railway domain, you have to e record each and every call. You have to do signaling and you record the media because if there is an incident, then they have to, to, to keep track and, and must be able to, um, let's say, recover what was going on and what was um, communicated between the driver and the dispatcher, for instance. So this is in regards of the modules um, we are using. And you see this is the IMS reference architecture and it's much more than um, just our boxes. But as said, um, we also support other, um, other, let's say, components of this, of this architecture. But for this deployment, we really use a lightweight um, IMS. Um, what else is very important is to allow interworking and interconnection with other systems. Um, this is some of the, the ideas we had because we have to interconnect um, let's say trains running on, on other operators' lines, but sometimes they are entering the lines of, of another uh, train operator and so they have to inter, interact and intercommunicate. So the train driver of operator one has to be communicate with the dispatcher of the operator two. And as the, all of the, the train, let's say, um, train uh, operators do have an own NDC. These are routed in the public network and also the train operators do have a SIP connection or T even still TDM in some countries. We use um, simply the public provider. Um, so we introduce a SIP trunk, but very specific um, because we are in IMS and typically IMS cannot just act like a PBX towards a provider. So you would have the network-to-network -network interface, um, usually. Um, and this is what we do. Um, we have also one function which is called IWF core, um, because we have a IWF application server function as well. This IWF core is, is let's say, integrated so with um, Camellio scripting. And um, we basically act um, towards the provider like a PBX. So the provider will receive, a, we register there, we have our internal address, so the NAT, the NAT is realized on the gateway VM, we, we do it just with firewall D. Um, we have the external address towards the provider. Um, basically we are challenged there, we register with a head number which is allocated for this trunk. Um, and finally um, we should be able to successfully register there. Um, and as said, typically an IMS cannot, cannot play the role of a PBX, but we did this, this IWF core uh, implementation, which allows to do so. Um, yeah, this is just a snippet of the code where we receive the, the acknowledge of the uh, registration, and then we can just simply query um, the registration state of this PBX. We call this mode emulated PBX, so MOPBX um, in our implementation, and you can enable or disable it, and this cum command just gives the, um, the, op the, the operator the possibility to check the status if we are registered, if we are timed out, if we have to re-register. Um, what else has to be done? Of course, this MCPTT or MCX have, does have completely different address schema, so you don't have phone numbers. You also have specific um, SIP bodies, so you have um, multiple XML bodies containing the information, as well as um, the 
URI of the terminator, so in this case um, it's called secretary, I think. And what we, what we do also on the IWF, um, so the, the call is initiated, goes to the application server, the application server acts as a back-to-back -back user agent. Um, the application server is aware that this um, user is an interworked user, forwards or addresses the IWF. And the IWF does basically simple lookups um, because each and every MCPTT user does have an external address, which is a phone number, because typically in legacy networks you can just um, dial um, numbers. So we do this mapping there. So the IWF basically maps the MCPTT ID to this external phone number, and a part of that it also removes the specific um, bodies, what I've mentioned before, and does all the required modifications before we can um, shoot it to the provider. And the other way around, it's, it's the same. We have also this external URI, so let's say a phone call is done with, with um, plus four nine, whatever. Of course, it must be, um, this is exactly then the head number which the IWF registered first. Um, it's, it's sent to the SCSCF, IWF core, and the IWF core does it the other way around. So it just does the lookup for this external URI to this MCPDD ID and also adds all the necessary XML bodies and shoots it to the application server. And if the user is published, then it delivers it. This is just what, more or less what I said. Um, we have two... Um, <laughs> hash tables for this zip to MCX ID and, and the other way around. And this applies then to called and calling um, number. Yeah, this is the, the IMS uh, RDN module, this really dedicated module. Unfortunately, the developer is, is sick. He, he should have been here as well today. Um, so we, we use it for two reasons. For, on the one hand, to address specific services, specific unregistered services. And we do also special transformation functions, um, which we use in the railway um, market, which I can show you also later on. And it depends on three modules, the transaction module and two of the uh, IMS modules for the SCSCF. And we do not have any dependency of external libraries. Yeah, this is just a, a use case where we address unregistered services. So this is typically what, what's happening in, in a pure IMS. So you receive an invite for unregistered users, then the terminating uh, CSCF has to um, query HSS, and the HSS finally um, gives the application server where the invite um, should be addressed. And we just do it basically immediately because we just have a, a a look up on the SCSCF and we exactly know which service to which application server must be sent and furthermore this is a sample we also allow then digit modifications of the uh, host part of the URI so it's just a, a snapshot what we do it's just to speed up things and also to um, can allow modification of the uh, URI um, these are these transformation functions because in, um, in these specific railway domains you do not address with, um, <laughs> with, with dedicated numbers. You, you are acting with roles. And as an example, today a train from Berlin to Munich is going and has the train number 12345, but tomorrow a different engine, so a different physical engine um, goes the same and the train number remains, but the engine um, is a different one. And that's this user-to-user um, -user information which um, transports this. And also, that's why we didn't um, publish yet the module. It's not fully ready. This MC data SDS, what I mentioned, we also um, allow interworking on the messaging level. But for that, we um, require an, or we, we interconnect with an IPSM gateway. The IPSM gateway, again, we connect as an application server to the, um, to the, IW, uh, to the, to the SCSCF and these transformation functions uh, we use for those purposes. Okay, um, 
a few more functions. I don't know, the time is good, I think. We are using the dispatcher module. We have heard anyway in the last two days uh, what it does, and we just use it also for grouping the interfaces. Um, so as, as you see, we have several. Again, in this deployment, we only use two or three. We do not use the direct interface to an MGCF, for instance, or this NNI. Um, and we use it for switchover and switchback, um, using the options pinging. Um, so when the DFR timer um, kicks in, then um, the primary user agent server would be blacklisted. When the options ping comes back, it would be whitelisted again. So what else? Status server, yeah, we, we use a status server. Status server is kind of presence service. Um, so it's, the architecture is quite simple. We have uh, um, an HTTP front end for the mobiles. Um, we have a UE config server, um, and the back end is a MongoDB. The MongoDB stores basically documents required for the, for the clients, and it also um, stores GPS coordinates. It stores um, this status, if, if, it, if they are in a call or not, and why, why is we are using this architecture? Because then we can also, we have, in, we have integrated it with the CSCF specifically for the interworked user because you cannot use present service for users in the GSM, GSMR domain. And we use the dialog module just simply we query um, our lookup table um, progressively and we are checking okay, if, the, if the, the user is in a dialogue or not, and if the user is in a dialogue, then it's just simply um, signaled, put into the, the database, and uh, gets pushed to the, to the end devices, and that, that all see, okay, this user is also in a call. Um, that's important or, or good if, if the trains are driving and they see, okay, this des dispatcher is or now in a call, I, I, I call it later, of course. If it's an emergency, then there's anyway um, preemption happening uh, in regards of priority. And uh, we do recording. So this was also we have heard several times um, during the last two days. So we use the SIP trace uh, module and the RTP engine module and to feed our RTP proxy basically and the RTP proxy then um, has a signaling component and a media component and um, finally, um, you can see the signaling flow. We also do um, pickup traces there, and you can even um, um, look into the, the RTP streams and do it on this, this recorder. What's next? Um, yeah, next is, at the moment, we only have interworking from point to point, private calls. Next is also we want to um, interwork group calls, so you have group calls on our, on our next-gen side and also on the railway side. So we want to interwork that. We also plan to, to enable SCDP um, for SIP and Diameter. Um, so those are the major things. We introduce video because at the moment this, this, this deployment doesn't um, use video at all. So this is what we introduce next. And as said, the, the message interworking uh, is also one of the next steps we plan to do. That's it. Thank you. But you can see it's, it's, it's really fast. If you do a, a group call or something um, and you press the button, it's immediately ringing, so it's, it's, really, uh, it's really fast. Okay, one quick question, just to try to catch up. And we have Marcus. Hi. Uh, you said you have two SIM cards in the mobiles. One is the primary and one is the secondary. How do you take care of the call when the primary co uh, coverage goes down? So do you have something? No, at the moment not. OK, it's, so the call will break. Yeah, it's, it's just that the, the, the mitigation is just that they, they have coverage at all. Okay. The, the call will break, yeah, that's true. 
Any plans for yes. multipath yes. UDP yeah. or whatever? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah no. Get you. Why do you choose an IMS setup with an HSS in the back? Why don't you use the normal yeah. user log? Because, or? Yeah, yeah, because um, um, we have, as I said, this is, this is all, all only a, a niche, what we typically do, and typically we do have the IMS for customers, and that's why we picked this and just compressed it a bit and make it more compact and, compact and easier, and that's why we choose it, because we had it and we have it for other customers. Because this is basically the the base for the future railway uh, mobile communication core. And this is in the standards, uh, you know, also, um, it, it's called SIP core, right? But it says SIP core based on an IMS architecture, and that's why we picked this um, solution. Really interesting. Thank you, Roman. Really Thank good you. presentation. Thank you. <laughs> and Next to Thank prepare you. now will be Dan Bogos. We know CD rates does rating. We learn it does oh, DNS recently. Yeah, so yeah. now a presentation about how you can make Kubernetes more elastic with CG rates and how you can scale Google Cloud with CG rates. First challenge. Uh, <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, yeah, but here. Uh -huh. Uh, and turn it around. So no, I mean, CG rates, we all know it's an amazing and it's quite flexible. It does also diameter, if I'm not wrong. So it's quite a Swiss okay. nice. army toolkit. And Dan, uh, as usual, it's happy to share with us. A big fan of open source. Everything they uh, he even has, has Linux on the computer. Can you believe that? After all these years. I thought you went to the upper management, you know, Windows. Yeah, but still no budget. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dan, really many thanks for returning to us in this edition. Only one second so I can do the, some setting here. Okay. I don't like when it's not. Also, the presentation is streamed by CG Rates. <laughs> now it's better. I always forget what to say, so I need to say it. So, I'm thank ready. you, Dan. Thank you very much, Daniel, for having us one more year here. And thanks, guys, for surviving until this hour. Um, so my name is Dan Bogos. I'm a CG Rates project founder uh, quite a while ago. Um, what, what, who are we? We are a company located in Bavaria, so not too far away from here. Uh, we, we have back offices in... <laughs> Don't complain. <laughs> so, um, over 17 years of experience with uh, server-side solutions in VoIP environment. This is actually how we started with, with uh, voice over IP. And we, we uh, got through both uh, wholesale as well, uh, as, well as retail uh, businesses. I will not say again the, the part with responsibly understanding the outages. <laughs> um, regarding CG rates, for those of you who do not know about it yet, um, we are a real-time enterprise billing suite. So not only a, a, a billing system, but a, a complete suite. Um, we are designed to, to be pluggable, so not intrusive. Uh, you don't have to route your calls through us. We monitor your system via events. And uh, we are also um, uh, targeting to accommodate new components easily into someone's network. Um, it's all open source software. Uh, it was born sometimes in 2010. First sources published in 2012. And our first ever public appearance was first Camellia World 2013. 
So it's all in my head and heart. Have you made a final decision? No. <laughs> because, you know, um, we, we always uh, are, are based on, on this uh, cartoon story, never rush art. <laughs> so um, all software is written in Go. When we started with, with Go, Golang was weekly released, so not yet first publicly available, or, or at least not in, in, a, in a final state. So quite our, our customers were quite naive back then. Um, no add-ons. Um, we have more than 100, uh, no add-ons in private, I mean. Um, we have more than 400,000 uh, lines of code today. We all keep dreaming and dreaming, and this is one of the other reasons we did not have a 1.0. We have some other uh, stable branches, though. Uh, and we, we do have consideration for community uh, contributions. Uh, we, we run uh, today on three different branches. Uh, we, we plan to uh, support them indefinitely. So uh, V010, which is the stable branch, um, we, we keep it like that because um, we, we have quite conservative customers. Being in telecom, you know that already. Uh, master is the one where we add the functionality. However, we run that in production as well. And um, you, you can see on the other side that we have more than 10,000 tests on our system. So uh, this is actually the reason why we can run Master in production and why we trust it. And then there is the, the famous 1.0, which we are trying to release since now three years or four years. Uh, we, we are very close, I think, and uh, we, we aim it uh, to, to happen soon. <laughs> Uh, Performance-oriented software, um, we have uh, stuff like built-in advanced caching system, which actually saves our, our um, uh, round trip to the database. It's trans transactional, it has support for LRU, uh, this list record use, and uh, TTL to auto-expire from cache, so it's, it's pretty fancy and advanced. Uh, all what we do is asynchronous. So it's, uh, we use this uh, micro threads, if you know the Go routines in Golang, everywhere. So uh, we also include the API load balancer, which I will talk about today. Uh, it's all modular, so you can, uh, if you are unhappy with our licensing, which by the way matches uh, uh, Camaelio license, GPL, uh, you can rewrite your own modules and interconnect with us via RPC, so nothing uh, stops you from protecting your module and your work and working with CG rates. Uh, future reach, I will not uh, go into details. Uh, we, we are a classic rating engine, um, uh, online, offline charging system, uh, diameter for, for mobile, this IMS stuff, um, CDR server, billing, um, uh, sta statistics, fraud detection, mitigation, uh, watch all the Camaelio, uh, very good uh, documentation online on YouTube, and you will see all our uh, capabilities there. Um, this is an internal architecture diagram of ours. So you can see on the left side all the, the agents which we use to communicate outside of our system. So uh, diameter radius, HTTP agent, the, the DNS, if you, if you have um, watched about the, the uh, ENAM, uh, Nick's uh, five slides presentation. Uh, SIP agent, so we, we even have a SIP agent built in CG rates, but works only with redirects. So uh, it's, it's again compatible if you want to use it for any reason with Camaelio with via SIP. Then an asterisk agent, a free switch agent, all these are, are written and managed by us. Also, Camaelio agent, again uh, maintained by us and some event reader uh, service which is used to uh, process all these files like CSVs, XML, JSON, everything what you might be receiving from your carriers, let's say. Um, all all the, the modules giving the uh, 
uh, abilities to, to rate, for example, CDRs, attributes like uh, an internal DB chargers for multiple uh, charging, uh, including here parallel char charging for your um, um, inbound traffic or outbound traffic for your suppliers as well as your carriers, uh, uh, sorry, suppliers as well as customers as well as uh, distributors. So you can charge many virtual sessions out of one physical. Statistics, routing module if you are to do uh, LCR, um, thresholds to do uh, fraud management and uh, mitigation. Um, Camaillo integration, um, we do that over our own module, Evapi. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for, for uh, writing it. It's super flexible, and I, I really uh, recommend anybody who wants to talk to Camaillo from outside. It's very simple and efficient module. Um, for that, we also have a, a, an MIT-published uh, library in Go, if you, if you are uh, looking into that. Uh, it offers bi-directional communication, and um, we also have it internally uh, to our sessions module, so we can disconnect from inside uh, a session, and we do also session synchronization to Camillo, because uh, if for some reason, you know, we are monitoring in parallel, so uh, for prepaid live calls, we are opening our own debit loop, which might be uh, due to unhappy, I don't know, events, uh, network uh, disconnect, network cut or whatever, desynchronized from Camaillo. And for, for, to fix this problem, we are syncing at regular interval. You decide when in the configuration, and then you are safe that your, your sessions will always be in sync with what uh, Camaillo has inside. Um, we also exchange pseudo variables with Camaillo server, which gives you uh, a lot of power. So you can process um, data from, from CG rates or data from Camaillo like an internal module of Camaillo. So uh, you, it becomes an extension of your uh, modules within Camaillo. At some Camaillo world, I even uh, demoed um, uh, CG rates as database for Camaillo. So you didn't need to, to use any kind of database back then. Uh, you also have predefined events for uh, request replies. This we, we uh, provide in some sample config which we have on our GitHub. If you don't know where to start, you start directly from there. Um, it, it gives you also a lot of flexibility that you can put any kind of uh, data from within your Camaillo and send it to the billing system. So you don't have to uh, always bill based on from URI or uh, I don't know what you want to use for. You can use as, as an account for prepaid, for example, the, the uh, request IP address from user, uh, from host or whatever you, you might want. So you define the fields which you want to bill uh, on. Then um, we also support Camaillo DB flat store. Uh, you know, in, in uh, real time it's nice, but there are some cases when you want to be uh, really uh, super reliable and do not um, uh, count on an external billing system to, to count your events. So you will, you will count then on Camaillo directly to, route, uh, to, to write your accounting events into the file, which is also the fastest possible. And then uh, we can process these files offline. We will merge, invite, buy, and, or, or acknowledge uh, via partial CDRs functionality, which we support. Uh, it's, it's fast. Uh, it's all asynchronous in both CG rates as well as Camaillo. So both are, are working asynchronously. And um, we will uh, save, uh, serve the data from, from cache or cache the data on demand. So it's, it's, it can travel without any touch on the disk, which is what it makes nowadays the, the, the world move faster. This also is um, pretty useful in scenarios when you use uh, cloud computing and uh, stuff like Docker and Kubernetes, because there you don't have to, to use files anymore. Uh, it's flexible. 
we don't have hard coded fields as I told you, and um, fields are added to, to the event which will go uh, uh, to CG rates. Uh, it's reliable, you can do a pool of uh, EVAPI connections uh, for, for automatic failover. <coughs> And uh, also, in case of um, file content from DB flat store, um, you can do uh, uh, file rotations and reloads, and then uh, you you can uh, you know that you can count on um, these um, records. This is just a sample of uh, interoperability between CG rates and Camaillo. And, and this is actually how EVAPI content looks like. You see it's a, it's a string going over network, pretty straightforward. We are defining the event, the content, so it doesn't have to be JSON. In this case, it's JSON, but you can actually encode it how you like. Uh, both, um, uh, in this case, both requests and replies are JSON encoded. And you can see that we are passing uh, TR index and TR label for, in order to retrieve uh, on reply, uh, in order to, to retrieve the um, transaction from the, the memory. So it's uh, for the asynchronous part on Camaillo side. Um, the, the, actually, the, the subject of my talk was how to, to make your installation faster on CG rate side. Uh, because uh, doing this with EVAPI can get you around 500 CPS, I think, if you, if you are using uh, sessions. So who, whoever targets more on, a, on an, uh, an installation on a, simple, on a single server, I don't know if you want to do that, because normally at some point you would like to uh, start having also um, high availability in your Camaillo, uh, and then if you have that amount of traffic, you would like to make more servers. However, um, you can uh, increase the CPS on uh, CG rate side by adding this uh, component, what is what we call dispatcher. It's a standalone service. It has its own APIs, like everything in CG rates. Uh, all in CG rates, it's API driven. Um, it's it's um, remotely accessible. It has um, transparent implementation of all the other RPC methods for, the, for our subsystems. And this is a big um, um, advantage because you can replace any modules of ours or any um, uh, subsystem of us with uh, a dispatcher. So um, if, if you are running today uh, CG rates and you see that your rating is slow but your CDR server is doing fine, you, you can increase or you can replace that rating component with a pool of raters by just adding this dispatcher instead. So the rest of your network of CG rates components will not know that you have replaced it because it will think it, it talks to a rater. So the APIs are the same, and behind the dispatcher will do the job of load balancing and failover. Um, what are the advantages? Why we did not simply use an HTTP load balancer or even our, our uh, RPC connections, they do have ability to failover and also to load balance. Well, the dispatcher is more intelligent. And why is that? Is because it works, first of all, with all API types of CG rates. It's not only HTTP, but you can do also JSON over socket, and you can also do um, GOB, which is the binary uh, serialization used in, in uh, Golang. Uh, it has multiple strategies for, for routing the request. So it's not only load balancing, but it can do more. Uh, it has also ability to route based on request content. So if you, if you have a request for um, a specific account, you can bring all the rating um, uh, regarding that particular account to a specific component. So it can look inside the, the, the requests. Then um, it, it is also secured via what we call a, a special parameter named API key, which you can share with your, your um, um, administrator. And it also supports route caching via route ID. Uh, this is, again, an important thing because um, we are able to, to do dynamic routing, so um, what, what we call dynamic partitioning. 
So you can send a request to a dispatcher, and this, the dispatcher can look into the, the route ID, and it finds whether it has already a routing entry inside. If it, if it has inside a routing entry, it will use the same um, endpoint which was used last time. So in this way, you achieve the, uh, partitioning without pre-configuring anything. Because the, the first, if it doesn't find any uh, cached route, it will then look into its routing table and find a, a, a routing profile or a routing strategy. So uh, by, by using this, you are still um, fully flexible into configuring it, but you have also um, uh, caching enabled. So you know that all the requests belonging, for example, to an account or to a company will hit always the same uh, endpoint. Um, Regarding request router, it has also generic filters. So uh, we are looking into like a hash map. Each event we are processing, I'll, I'll show you um, a sample. Each request which we are, uh, are sending, it's a hash map. And it, we are able to filter and route like normally for, for uh, like for example, Kamailio is doing on SIP level. Um, we have also unlimited number of host categories with uh, uh, failover on host category. And um, we also support dynamic hosts. And what is that is we can add hosts on the fly via APIs. What is, um, uh, these hosts are the endpoints on IP level where we will route the request. Um, also, connections are established on the fly. So if we have a connection, we use it. If not, we, we build it. Uh, we also cache the connections so we never repeat uh, the, the connection setup, which is, in our view, um, expensive. So um, we have, in terms of routing strategies, we have weight-based, random, uh, round-robin, and broadcast implemented. Uh, on API security, you can store the, the API keys inside uh, our attributes uh, module. And uh, you can also control the API methods. So each API key can have access only to some API methods. Um, we, uh, the, the routing path cache is what I explained to you. Only the first request is dynamically routed. All the others are following the same path. Uh, many of these ideas were also used from SIP, for example, because um, uh, SIP has solved all these problems long time we faced them. Um, and we also have a registrar. So not only in SIP there is the concept of register, but also in, 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 into an API server. What is this used for? Uh, for example, in, in cloud computing, you have the... the um, endpoints which are not having fixed IP addresses and you don't know when they come and go. So when, in this case, when they will come online, so if an if a endpoint, an API endpoint will come online for us over, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a Kubernetes or something, we will then be informed by that uh, and we'll learn its IP address and we'll use it as a processor for our uh, APIs. And in this way, we, we achieve elastic routing. And we are, as I told you, compatible with uh, cloud computing environments. This is a sample of dispatch and configuration. So you see it, uh, you can um, differentiate on, on different tenants. Um, you can uh, configure on which subsystem it can be used, that profile. So you can say only rating or only stats or only thresholds. Uh, you configure the filters, so this uh, applies to what's within the event and the strategy, as, as you saw, the, the routing strategy. And then you have uh, the, the weight, so if more profiles are matching, only the, the, the highest weight will win. And then you have a list of hosts where we will route. So if it's a failover mechanism, then we will do, use them in order. If it's a round robin, then we will uh, use every time the next one and so on. This is a, a, a rough scratch of uh, how you can use it. Uh, you, you see you have the Camaillo agent on, on top left, which is passing information to sessions. This is just an example because Camaillo agent could talk directly to dispatcher and have a pool of sessions behind. 
And then the sessions has a pool of dispatchers. Um, and what's the advantage of this is the dispatchers will communicate with each other and with, will um, uh, publish to each other their routing um, uh, information live. So uh, once the, the routing information is available into one, all will be informed. And it's all live and um, in, over the cache. So it never hits any disk. And then you see you can have a pool of RALs or a pool of CDR servers. And all this is done via the, the routing uh, configurations which I showed you. So uh, the, the API comes for RALs. Uh, the dispatcher will uh, grab a dispatcher profile. At, and within the dispatcher profile, you have all the hosts where you can route. So it will end up at one of these RALs, which has can can uh, go forward and use one of these databases. Also, a database we have replication. So we, we this is actually the reason why we are still not with the 1.0 release because we are keep uh, uh, coming up with new fancy ideas. So um, also, CDR server can uh, go and have a pool of CDR servers and a pool of, of databases behind. Um, a sample request because uh, to visualize it, you will understand. Um, better all the, the nonsense I was talking for the last half an hour. Um, so you can see an event for, this is exactly a, a, a Camailio event, uh, simply with account, answer time, destination. It, it even has a virtual connection ID. And um, um, LCR profile, which was used, and this H entry and H ID for um, the, the asynchronous part. And you see in the API options, we have an API key, which is used for authorization. And we have the route ID, which in this case is my account. But it can be anything you identify. So you, you want to, to have based on the originator IP address to route all the traffic within CG rates based on originator IP address, then you, you just add this as a route uh, key. So it's, it's all uh, fully um, generic. So we don't force yourself to use any of the logic we, which we use. And I, I am done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, for coming. You started late. It's still time, so don't worry. We... I was watching all the time, if I can time. So. <laughs> Uh, Dennis actually did, uh, instead of 15 minutes, did uh, five minutes, five slides. So we have the break like uh, normal uh, half an hour or so. But first questions for uh, Dan. <coughs> yeah, it's one. Hi, Dan. Uh, Hi. I'd like to ask, what is the broadcast strategy? You had, you had, had, uh, there was... We can inform multiple engines in the same time. Broadcast, we send them uh, to, to all, and we re just simply receive the, the first answer which comes back. So they're fighting for each other like... Yeah, who whoever is faster. And we, we have some uh, caching implemented on the unit side, so they are able to receive in parallel uh, the same request, and they will the next... Uh, endpoint where they will go, it will notice that the request is repeated, so we don't double charge or something. Thanks. One more question, anyone, about uh, the CG rates? With uh, can you go to one of the last JSONs? Yes, it's here. This one, yeah, this one with the, the route ID, you said it can be like the IP address, but then you have to map it in your dispatcher? Exactly, so you have ah, to configure okay. in the dispatcher. I, I was caught. <laughs> <laughs> you can configure in the, in the dispatcher a route ID. Ah, okay, so could be any kind of text. You use the hash there yes. because you like found key from It's the a virtual DPMS. identifier of anything you like, it's a string. Okay, I thought it's we can put it there and the money is taken from your account. Yeah, Even this we, is also if we possible. Make the call. If you have power enough to configure the server, then you have power on anything you like. You rewrite the account yourself anyway in Camellia. We know that you do that often. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Dan. Really appreciate it. And, uh, thank you. 
See you next time. With the updates and, of course, the version 1.0. Next year. Next year. Promise. Okay, so we have the break. Uh, we start late with the break, but we have enough, like, uh, oh, what's now? So we can do it up to yeah, half an hour. We can do it. So uh, then we'll have a presentation from Maxim. It's still around.
Thanks for the introduction. Um, Thank you, Maxim, and the floor is yours. Thanks for this uh, great chance for the organizers. Uh, it's my first time here. Um, and today I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, my idea about uh, Camelio extension, uh, about Visual Studio extension for Camelio code. Uh, Just a few words about me. Uh, my name is Maxim. I live in Madrid. Uh, I'm voice therapy and software engineer. I've been doing this for more than uh, 15 years. Uh, now I am working uh, for Ybot. We are making a platform for um, AI powered uh, voice assistants. Um, I started learning English not so far ago, so I still have some difficulties with articles, so uh, I prepared uh, spare ones in case if I will skip it. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about uh, an extension uh, which I hope can make a uh, configuration file of Camelio more clear, more um, uh, understandable, um, and I will tell you how I came to this decision, how I did it, uh, what problem I faced, uh, and uh, what, uh, what we got. Uh, you may ask, uh, what is unclear in Camelio configuration? Uh, sure, Camelio configuration structure is uh, very uh, simple. It's just uh, uh, global parameters, like key value pairs, nothing special, loading modules, uh, par parameters for modules, the same, nothing uh, special. Uh, road, uh, road blocks has C-like syntax, uh, it's clear too, but uh, there is uh, one thing. Camelio uh, operates with a huge amount of uh, keywords like uh, parameters, functions, pseudo variables, and so on. I heard that uh, statements are more convincing if they contain numbers, so I have these numbers. Uh, Camelio core itself uh, operates with uh, 200 uh, parameters and more than 40 different functions, and this is just, there's a tip of the Iceberg because, sorry, uh, because Camelio has more than two hundreds of different modules, and uh, that modules contain about a thousand of uh, functions and about two thousands of uh, parameters. It's not a joke. Um, when I first started to work with Camelio, it was a problem for me. Uh, of course, some of uh, keywords, some of uh, parameters and functions are uh, clear from their names, but sometimes it isn't and it is uh, hard to remember. Um, so, problem. We have huge amount of unknown words and Camelio has excellent documentation, but there are there are a few things. Uh, it's a little bit uh, difficult to navigate between uh, different parts of the documentation. For example, we have uh, pseudo variables in one part of documentation, but another things about modules in module documentation. Uh, we have something like search in uh, Wikidocs. Uh, and we can try to use Google to uh, finding uh, information. But usually we, uh, we found uh, links to outdated version of documentation, not actual. And uh, as a result of these things, uh, usually uh, newcomers uh, use uh, huge blocks of default Camelio configuration as is without understanding what is 
what what they did. Um, so uh, one of the possible solution for this uh, it's a uh, IDE. Um, they provide us a huge amount of different con convincing um, features like syntax highlighting, syntax checking, auto formatting uh, after complete, navigation, and uh, and on horror tooltips. And this is the main idea of uh, uh, my solution uh, to make uh, documentation closer to your configuration file. Um, please, uh, could you please raise your hand if you use uh, Visual Studio Code on a daily basis? Great. And if you use uh, JetBrains tools like PyCharm, Goland? Uh, to be honest, <laughs> I prefer JetBrains, JetBrains tools uh, like PyCharm, Goland, uh, C-Line, uh, Android Studio, and so on. And first of all, I tried to uh, make an extension for this platform, but I failed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, SDK for developing modules for JetBrains platform is too complicated for me. Uh, and another reason uh, that we already have uh, extension for syntax highlighting by Daniel. Thanks for Daniel. And uh, these two modules can be used together to complement each other. So uh, making extension for Visual Studio Code is absolutely simple and it doesn't need uh, any specific knowledge. Uh, you just need to install Node and uh, NPM, uh, install two packages, run uh, YOM and utility, and follow their instruction. Uh, enter name of your module, uh, of your extension, identifier, description, and uh, so on. Um, Later, you need to mm, describe your language. We are working with a Camarillo configuration file, like with uh, uh, source code of any, uh, any well-known mm, programming language. So we uh, should to describe ID, uh, name for this uh, type of file, uh, extension, and uh, first line to uh, to identify uh, a file like as a, a Camelio configuration. Mm, uh, and the next thing, thing uh, we need to implement a hover provider. A hover provider is, a, is an object uh, which contain uh, one function, provide hover, hover and this uh, function gets uh, position of uh, the mouse pointer when you point uh, it on uh, some word in your text, in your document. Uh, next, you need to uh, get the range or uh, range of this word in the document, uh, get this uh, word from document, uh, find the um, content you want to show and return it. And after that, uh, you will see a tooltip uh, close to this word. It's absolutely easy, but uh, we need the content to show. Uh, first of all, uh, I tried to get it from the modules documentation in HTML format. Uh, at the first look, it was uh, simple uh, because uh, the URLs has uh, some structure and we can uh, make this uh, URL and it points on the, uh, on the section in the 
uh, document uh, with, uh, which describes this uh, function or parameter or something like this. And it works for uh, parameters because uh, we can now, we can know uh, a name of the model from the context because they are on the same string. But for functions, it's impossible. We need to know in advance uh, which module this uh, function belongs. So I tried another solution. And this is uh, dog book documentation. Uh, it uh, located in the source code of Comailio, uh, in, the, in the source of each module. And uh, uh, in fact, this is uh, HT, uh, XML document. And it, is, uh, has, uh, it has structure. And uh, he, it has the same uh, ID. Um, looks great, but um, usually this ID doesn't follow the rule, and it uh, has another structure, uh, or it may be uh, empty at all. And uh, uh, for for this tooltip and extension, we need to. Uh, return content in plain text or HTML or uh, markdown. So we need to convert this XML to, to another format. And next, uh, next step is to convert all the documentation about modules into markdown using Pandoc utility. So and, and uh, all another documentation about Comavilio we have in Markdown format too. So now all the documents in the same format. So we can use the uh, same uh, methods to um, extract, the document, extract the content from this uh, documentation. Uh, <coughs> Um, I made a uh, Python script which um, extracts uh, content of um, parts of documentation about each uh, parameter function and so on. Uh, it was easy because uh, in Markdown format we have a name of the uh, function keyword or function parameter or so on uh, as a heading, heading. So uh, the part between one heading and the next heading uh, belongs to previous heading to previous uh, name keyword. Uh, later, I uh, converted it to JSON format. Uh, so now we have well-structured information about uh, each uh, parameter um, function uh, and uh, so on, uh, and we can work with it. Uh, the same, the same uh, things I did with uh, another, with other parts of documentation with uh, pseudo variables, uh, um, core uh, things, uh, uh, core parameters, and uh, and translations. Uh, but of course, uh, there was one another problem. Uh, one of modules, the commutation of one of modules has completely different structure of document, and a uh, few modules have has uh, have um, broken structure, so uh, headings are not in the right order. Uh, it's not a problem too. Uh, and uh, another thing, some modules have functions with the same names. For example, uh, RTP engine and RTP proxy have the same uh, function record or something like this. And uh, another example, uh, modules uh, uh, like from here, uh, old modules, uh, have the same names like new, and uh, IMS modules have the same things like modules 
not for IMS. Uh, so uh, in these cases, I uh, filtered uh, this uh, uh, less usual used uh, modules from the uh, result. And uh, little demo. I think live demo will be better than pre-recorded. Great. So it's uh, just default uh, uh, Camellio configuration file, and we have some things. Uh, for example, global parameters. Here we can see uh, portions of documentation about it. So uh, pseudo variables. Great. And modules. It's a little overview of uh, each module. module. Uh, later, uh, modules parameters. There are the same things. Um, routing blocks. Uh, some functions from modules and the global. Also, it uh, has support for uh, translations, but I think they are absent in default configurations. So, Sorry. Just a few words about future plans. Um, right now, this extension supports only one version of uh, Camaelio, uh, and uh, all the documentation included in uh, this uh, extension is uh, <coughs> belong to uh, 5.8 version uh, branch of Camaelio. Uh, uh, so my my plan is to implement the possibility to uh, have uh, many versions of uh, uh, documentation at the same time and the ability to switch between versions in the uh, Visual Studio Visual Studio Code. And uh, next thing is to get a grip and finish uh, uh, implementation of. Uh, extension for uh, JetBrains uh, uh, IntelliJ platform. And uh, the next thing is uh, more dreams than plans because it, uh, it needs a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of time. Uh, first of all, my dream is to implement a, a true syntax parser for uh, Camilo configuration file. Uh, which for making uh, syntax tree, and uh, this open uh, for us possibility to implement uh, any other uh, convenient features. For example, uh, correctness checking, uh, auto formatting, and uh, uh, code navigation, like uh, uh, go to definition of row, to go to definition of uh, define. Um, Uh, here you can see um, uh, links to this um, uh, extension. You can download it on my GitHub repository on, or on uh, Visual Studio Code Marketplace. Also, you can find uh, the link uh, in the, uh, on the site of uh, conference uh, in the schedule. Um, Thanks for uh, thanks, thanks for all the authors of Camaelio uh, for 
uh, all community member. Uh, we, you, you ha have done a lot, and uh, I tried to make my little uh, contribution to our common cause. Uh, thank you very much. I hope it was thank interesting. You, thank you. It's pretty, pretty useful. And will be usual. Or will be uh, question useful. from Tori. Uh, the script you use to uh, scrape all the information out of the documentation. Uh, do you have that script available somewhere? Yeah, the script is available on uh, my GitHub. Okay, repository. so it's not just a, a VS Code plugin. Yeah, the scraper code is in there too. Sorry, I didn't catch you. The the scraper code that will go and parse the documentation, build uh, the. Yes, you you can use the script from the my GitHub repository and build uh, uh, this uh, documentation for for example for the another version. version. And all that stuff, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Any other question? I, yeah, right. We don't see that guy there behind. <laughs> Probably a simple question, but um, does it also work if I write my configuration in Python or Lua? Did you so, sorry, I didn't. Okay. If I write the, configura the Camellio configuration in Python or Lua, so ah. not in Camellio config, does it work? Does your uh, Hava also it, it work for, for those languages, or is it only for Camellio config? It works only for Camellio configuration file. But yeah, in the future it could be extended because if it's getting the name, the thing is that for the Kemi we don't have direct reference because sometimes the name are different for the function. So how does the Kemi documentation do the link to? Uh, it does it by name, but sometimes it's not accurate. <laughs> so sometimes yeah. it goes you at the top of the file, From and the then you have to. Yeah, we have to format properly the XML. Yeah, yeah. The documentation of the stuff. But the problem is you can, you can make uh, custom functions in Python and um, you have to bind uh, it's hard. But well, that's what I'm doing already. I put the mock. Uh, so that's, so I can just document good. the mock and uh, give proper variable names and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it should be structured. Okay. In this case, uh, build strictly. Then, Thomas, thank you. It's, it's cool. So, uh, two things. So, first, accuracy on uh, Kimi. Maybe not so important, we are used to chat GPT now, so... <laughs> it, I think it would be okay if it's a little bit fuzzy. But uh, my actual thing is, uh, you said you want an, an syntax parser. In Camellio, Daniel, there is truly a syntax parser. It is, but Can it's... Can he reuse um, it somehow? Outdated. Not outdated. It's um, Yak uh, uh, or Bizod and Flex which is not used by this uh, modern JavaScript uh, yeah. uh, platform like Node.js and so on. But yeah, it could be eventually if it's a translator from uh, uh, Yakbizon and FlexLex to what they use in JavaScript, then uh, could be. Could be done, but I'm not aware of that translator. At some point, I was thinking to make this, I forgot the name of that project, to make the, the definition of the language in another uh, more modern language specification uh, format, but uh, I didn't get the time. Yuck, uh, the new one, it's your nightmare. Yeah, so it's... Uh, five years. <laughs> not that much, but uh, it's not straightforward. Ragal, I think it was one quite popular at some point for defining grammars for languages. Anyhow, thank you, Maxim, not to get people from using. So actually, we're gonna. I'm gonna give two uh, gifts. If you want to stay ten seconds in, you might win. No, okay. So uh, I'm gonna prepare, but. Uh, uh, Matthias, can you extract one? So I'll give away this right now. Nikolai, he cancelled, sorry. You cancelled him. <laughs> no, it's Kenan. It's there. Okay, so this is, uh, I forgot. Like, uh, 
Oliver can explain it eventually. It's, uh, welcome. You can ask. And let's give uh, another one. The book. Okay. The book. The outdated one. This is a fake one. Barry Flanagan. You are okay. Can I, I can start my presentation. There. It's you. Thank you. It comes to you. Okay, so I'm gonna start with uh, handheld, I guess, uh, as I will uh, you to the end of the conference, or should I use that one? Yes. Which is better? Is better that one? Yes. You don't have to hold. And you look more professional. Thank you. Okay, so uh, last uh, session as usual, uh, I'm uh, delivering uh, a bit on technical content and uh, I'm trying every edition to cover some other topic. From time to time I'm coming back with a topic and trying to give updates like in the morning with uh, Kemi, but now, um, something rather basic that everyone kind of uses, maybe not exactly for billing, but it's good for, you know, sometimes statistics and tracking events that happened. So, uh, looking at um, event and call accounting with Kamailio and trying to give you some uh, tips and tricks that could improve the performance and uh, some ideas how you could eventually replace CG rates which Dan left too early, so in a simple way. Uh, okay, so we know Kamailio is uh, building uh, blocks uh, toolkit to help you create uh, real-time communication systems for the SIP protocol, and one of them is accounting. So I have a module, actually a bunch of them, that can help in uh, uh, adding this function to your uh, Kamailio based uh, system. So the main uh, module that we have is um, ACC, obviously short name for the counting. And uh, over the years it went through some transformation right now. It takes care of the log, which would be like writing to the syslog, like a backend and the database. In the past it used to be also with radius, but you had to recompile it. Uh, now, ACC Radius, it's a different module. I will give a, a short uh, uh, details about the other uh, backends. But then, um, actually, this module, it's, it's um, very flexible. It can uh, report the, the events to both uh, um, backends. And also has two kind of mechanisms for reporting. One is based on flags, message transaction flag, which is like because usually you do the decision for the request, for the invite, what to do, where to route it, and so on. You can also decide, I want to account this call, like start of the call for this invite. So you do the decision, this is going to PSTN or whatever, I want to get a record for this transaction. You mark the transaction with the flag. When the invite is answered, then the magic is done internally with some callbacks between ACC and transaction module and you get it uh, reported to the syslog or to the database. And then we have the functions that you can execute wherever you want in your config file, and that gives you even more flexibility because transaction, it's based on state, it's completed, successful, or with a failure, you get event. But with a function, you get ringing, you get uh, session in progress or any other events, you can uh, execute that uh, function in the uh, configuration file. Then what other kind of flexibility you get from uh, reporting, so accuracy of the time by default will be second, the standard Unix 
timestamp, but then with some mod params you can get like uh, millisecond accuracy and uh, different formats for the, the time. In some country you are uh, uh, required to have such kind of accuracy. Uh, we have also support for like what's known as multi-leg accounting, which is when you do like call forwarding inside Camaillo, like uh, Someone is calling me, I'm offline and I have a rule to redirect to Matthias. Matthias has also a busy time and redirects to Alice, Alice to Bob. And you don't see this on the network. But using these variables like AVPs where you can have multi-value uh, AVP, then instead of a single record, come I will report many. So you say practically specify via mod param, kind of color collie, and it's up to you to build this list of pairs of color and collie internally. And you see a single invite in, a single invite going out to the final target after this forwarding rules. But in the accounting, you get like, someone called me, I called Matthias, Matthias called uh, Alice, and Alice called Bob. And you decide which one you build, eventually all of them, so you get uh, more money for you. And then this is not specific for calls. You can account anything that goes to Camarillo. Invite for text messages, that's common, like SMS, if you do kind, that kind of service. But also for IoT, you can info, notify, whatever you think worth to report it, and then you decide what to do with behind, you can report it with this uh, module. Among the interesting uh, modules parameters that, uh, and, um, that you can set up, very important would be to look at log extra, db extra, and cdr extra. Here you can uh, give like attribute name and like equal from where to take the value, which is usually a variable. So you'll see Actually, I can jump to the next one because I'll have an example with this. By default, comma in will report this timestamp, method name like invite by, call ID from tag to tag to identify the transaction and the call, like invite and by that uh, are corresponding for the same session. And then the status code 200, 400, depending on what was the reply. And the reason text, which is not really that important for accounting, but everything else that you want to get stored in the accounting record, syslog or database has to be specified with the extra parameter, log extra for syslog or db extra and uh, CDR extra for database or uh, CDR reporting together with the dialog module. I'll have a slide for it. What you get in the Syslog, when you specify this uh, uh, reporting, when you enable it, practically you get like name equal value in a single line as a record from accounting. You can specify different uh, Syslog facility. So you can have Camaillo logging the usual debug information in the default Syslog or another Camaillo log. And then with a different Syslog facility value, you can have accounting through Syslog filtering divert it to something like amailio-acc.log. So you don't really need to parse all the debugging information and spot only those for accounting. You'll get only accounting records in this um, uh, file. And of course, a matter of the capacity you handle, you might need to tune syslog, and it's important to make it asynchronous which has some kind of risk of losing some records, but at least it's not uh, blocking Camaillo um, because sometimes syslog blocking could uh, reduce the capacity of Camaillo. So you have to think about the risk and benefits of uh, this um, approach with the asynchronous uh, logging configuration for syslog. Some example of the record, again, it's like a single line. Here I... Uh, uh, span it over many just to uh, show it in a slide. You'll see how we set this parameter so you get like source IP also uh, reported destination user, destination domain, and uh, 
uh, this kind of uh, record. The first one is for the invite, so it would be like start of the call. Second one, it's the end of the call. Usually for the end of the call, you don't need all the attributes because they are not that relevant. So if you like report through an AVP, usually you set it for the invite, but for the buy is no longer relevant because uh, you have it in the invite um, record. For the database parameter, of course, you have to set the database URL. You have to specify additional parameters with DB extra. In this case, practically, you'll have to extend the counting table and also miss call table if you report miss call events with additional co um, um, columns because every attribute that you want to report will be written in a column that should have the same name. But you have to create it prior uh, starting Camailio with DB extra uh, pointing to them. With the default config file, we give actually in our uh, Camailio.cfg at some point, it's a if def with this accdb underscore comment. So practically because it's a preprocessor uh, uh, condition, the if def, Camailo will ignore it because this token accdb underscore comment is not defined. And then Camailio will ignore it. We thought this is better because we could make it like comments, but then you have at the beginning hash or uh, slash slash, and then here is like copy and paste it in the MySQL client, you know, tool, and you extend it. But then if you are using CMCLI, this Python tool that we have for Camailio, uh, the newest one, but already like five, maybe eight years old, there is a sub command to extend the counting uh, records and Cyrem is the web interface has also the option when you have the installation wizard, there has the option of extend the SIP server database, which will do this kind of operation internally. In the database, again, you get this, the same attributes reported, but each of them will be in their own column. Uh, matching with the one from the accounting in the syslog. That's because I was making the example using the default config file option and you see in green mod param log extra, the first one, and then mod param db extra. They are the same, but you can have it differently. So in many cases, I have the log extra for syslog with the basic information like caller, callie, timestamp, and so on. And in the databases, many operators actually like a lot more than just for accounting, you know. It is audio, video, everything that you could extract from signaling, and then you put it in a variable and you report it because they do it like, you know, marketing reports or, you know, usage reports for various services and so on, and they want to tag it. But then we know with the database, things go well as long as they go well, but when it's crashing, sometimes it's hard to recover. So it's good to have like a backup, you know, a minimal information that you can uh, create the invoice and build um, the customer. Parameters that you can set relevant one will be for uh, flag-based accounting with transaction module. Defining them, we use define to associate tokens to the index of the flag because the flags are numbers from 0 to 31. There's the bluish uh, 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 rectangle up there where we define it. And as you look, the bold uh, blue, we set this uh, mod params like log flag and db flag pointing to this flt underscore acc token define it above. You can also use different flag indexes so you can decide I want this to both syslog and database so you set the both flags or you can decide only for the database this time or only for syslog. If you set the same flag and you set it once then we'll report it to both at once. And the request route you have the snippet on the right side we set it with a default config file only for the invite, so we want to account only calls. And for the buy, because we want to account also the end of the call. But you see a difference with the, the buy. We have two flags, so it's the one for the counting, but by default, doing accounting will be only for a successful transaction. 
So practically for invite, you get the record only if it's a 200 OK response. But for the buy, it's important to have it also in the case buy gets a failure code. Because sometimes one side gets disconnected, network failure and so on, and the other one is saying, hey, Daniel, are you still there? No RTP, no audio coming in, and then hanging up. Buy comes to Kamailo. Kamailo will try to send it to my device based on the contact of the invite and so on, but fails and will be like a 408 generated by Kamailo after a while. So buy doesn't get the 200 OK, but then we still want to mark it as the end of the call. So this second flag, FLT ACC failed, which again, it's defined in the bluish up top part. It also set as a uh, mod param, this failed transaction flag, which is in the middle, that uh, bold mod param. So with this one, you have uh, both successful and failed transaction uh, accounted to database and sysl. Of course, if you want for the invites the same, you put the second set flag also for the invite in the request route, and you get it. So this is just how the default config file ended up, and I extracted snippets from there but you can uh, do it uh, different as you need. In terms of functions, from the module we have the ACC log request and ACC DB request, which kind of suggest where they are gonna send the event uh, record for accounting. So the first to syslog, the second to uh, database. And then we have the wrapper around the two of them, ACC request, which if database URL is defined, it is going to call also ACC DB request. Otherwise, we'll be doing only the ACC log request to simplify it. And actually, I use this ACC request in many cases for the buy processing because I want to get it when the buy is received, not when the buy transaction is completed, the reporting of the record. So in that case, you can... Um, Skip. You can combine it like for the invite when the transaction is completed and for the buy when the request is received and processed. And then with these uh, functions, you can catch any event you want. And sometimes even for the same invite, I'm doing a couple of accounting records based on the processing. So I have like ACC. And in the, the first parameter looks like the first line of the response, like status code and text. So I can put like 101 receive, and then later I see this is going to the PSTN, 101 to PSTN. And by that, you have reporting as you need, and then for monitoring, for tracking, for uh, building uh, statistics, you have uh, full flexibility. Now, aggregation of the records. OK, for this event, based like message, info, IoT stuff, you have a record and you build on that. But for calls, now I have the invite and the buy. And we need to detect which one corresponds to uh, which. So we know from SIP that we have the call ID from tags and two tags being the same values for uh, the same uh, call with the remark that from and to tax can be swapped based on the direction. So if the buy is coming from the callee, will be actually in the from, will be the to tag from the initial transaction. So you might have to do cross checking, but if you load RR module, there is a parameter to append from tag and then ACC module, if you enable detect direction, could see that, OK, the bytes coming from the callee, and then we'll swap from and to tags. So you can do just straight comparison, not cross comparison. And that will be the matching of the invite and buy by call ID from tag and to tag. And the, the duration of the call will be the difference of the timestamps for this event records. How would look the database? Uh, ACC table when we extend it for the default config file plus what Cyremis does for uh, rating. So the CDR ID, the last column created, is not necessary for Camailio to report the record, but I'll show you 
a small billing engine just with the database um, stored procedure. And then you need a second table, kind of created from scratch, where we keep like full CDR. So in the ACC we have invite and buy, and this table will have a single record per call. And of course, there are different uh, column names sometimes comparing with the other one. I think here is SIP from tag, SIP to tag. That was a decision here, it's called from tag to tag. But at the end, it's up to you because aggregation you'll see is gonna be done by another store procedure. And to have a CG rates NG, like next generation CG rates, since Dan is not here, I will show you also like a simple rating engine. It's the second table, billing rates, where you can have like a rate group. So you can have like customers belonging to one group or another and you have different rates per group. And then the simplest way, so not really a replacement for CG rates, I'm just making a bit of joke, but they do really nice and complex ability of uh, combining um, uh, the rules for uh, uh, rating. Here it's the longest prefix matching with the rate unit and the time unit for that one. As you can see, the table is very simple. The next is the store procedure. It's a little bit small font to match, in a, to, to fit in a single slide. But I wanted to show that it's not really complex to get this aggregation of invite and buys records. Practically because they are long line, for example, here the insert, the last one. From insert to update, it's a single SQL uh, statement. But we have been out of the, the slide if we have been a single line. So actually overall, I, I'm not gonna focus on explaining SQL uh, language and this sort of procedure. What I wanted to, to show is, uh, is not something that complex. It fits in, the, in a slide. And you have it in the Cyremis source code and you have it also in CAMCLI uh, inside the, the Python uh, script, uh, the DB. Uh, command and the next one will be rating, applying costs to your CDRs this time. And this is even smaller. So this is what it's running in this CG rates go scalable multi-dimensional uh, engine for rating. Again, another uh, joke which I should not do because Dan is not here to defend. But for a simple uh, um, rating engine, experimental, you can use this approach. Now, of course, it's about execution, and we know Kamailu is performant and executing everything, and you can do it with timer and ex uh, R timer module plus SQL ops. R timer, you can configure it to create dedicated timer that executes a route block from the config file, and inside that route block, you execute these two store procedures. First one, the one to aggregate the CDRs and the second one to apply rates and get the, the cost per uh, call. And this would be like a full accounting till kind of a billing engine build with Kamailio only in SQL um, stored procedures. Now there is uh, like full CDR reporting from Kamailio if you load the dialog module because the, uh, the dialog module tracks the active calls, you can get like a single record for every call. So you just have to configure the CDR extra. This time, uh, these additional attributes have to be dialog variables because they have to stay from the invite to the buy. And we know AVPs disappear after a while because they are only in the transaction context. But if this fits better for you, just use it. I'm typically a big fan of event-based accounting because I can have many, many events for the same uh, call. As I said, there are a couple of other uh, backends, ACC radius, which was popular back in the days lately. I haven't seen much activity about it. Diameter was never used. It was supposed to take over radius at some point, but never made it in the ISP telephony world. It's used in uh, mobile networks, but not 
is more like interface between components, like IMS components. And a ACC JSON, it's kind of an in-memory JSON document storage. I think, Julian, you added the ACC JSON. Okay, so if you have more questions, you can ask him. But the idea is the JSON is built in memory, and then we have this kind of connect connectors and message buses like uh, RabbitMQ, NSQ, and you can push it um, outside to an external system. Now there are uh, some concerns usually when using a proxy and like detecting when one side is down. If you load the dialog module, it can send like the uh, options keep alive to detect color quality being out of the network, like disconnected. But if not, usually you have to do like uh, uh, RTP relaying. Because this, uh, it's when uh, you need not traversal or maybe for some quality of service or maybe for call recording. And RTP engine can detect silence on the uh, media stream, and then you can configure it to do a callback to Kamailio, an XML RPC callback to Kamailio, which you can handle inside the Kamailio config file with this event routes for XHttp, for example. You'll get something like this, and we have SQL ops, uh, sorry, uh, XML ops, and you can extract the call ID or if you have the mode 2x2, you will have also the call ID from tag to tag. And this also can terminate the call from signaling point if you use dialog module. So it's, this is like a DLG terminate call RPC command for our dialog module. But if not, you can extract this value and you can insert it with the SQL ops into your accounting table and close the, the record because you need only the timestamp. All the other caller, callee, you get it from the invite uh, record. Another uh, concern uh, over the years was like, okay, this transaction, it's uh, uh, based on uh, keeping the state of retransmission and uh, getting the response with the TA module and handling it. But what happens if you restart or maybe it takes too long for the transaction for the other side to send the call and the transaction somehow disappears from the memory. There is actually another uh, uh, um, callback, like a route block from uh, config file that can be executed by uh, TM. So you can specify on SL reply with the name of uh, on reply route block to be executed for stateless replies. Usually you get this on reply route when it's a stateful reply, a reply that matches the transaction. So this is for the rest that don't match the transaction. And then again here, you can invoke now the, the function with some uh, code, and uh, then practically will get the call ID. Of course, you don't get these variables like um, uh, they are in the context of the transaction, but you can rely also in from two headers to get caller call you, or you can reject the reply. Sometimes if the 200 OK doesn't match a tran uh, transaction, you can call a drop and it's not sent out, so the call doesn't complete, actually. That could be another option if you go this uh, way and you like it more. The last few uh, tips and uh, uh, tricks. We have support for asynchronous database inserts. So there is this insert delayed as another option, actually. But we have this mechanism internal in Kamailo, like the SIP worker is creating the insert into the database statement from the request. But instead of writing to the database connection, we'll put it in shared memory. And then there is an asynchronous worker that does only this job of writing to the database. So you relieve the SIP uh, router process from interaction to the database, and it's another process that writes to the database. Another tip that I strongly recommend to be uh, aware of would be who else gets access to the counting table? Because in the past, like 10 years ago, I had, like, I lost more than like two or three days troubleshooting a situation when the customer was saying, 
Camellia stops processing for like five minutes. Looking, do you take like snapshot of the virtual machine or what was there and backups and no, no. And to discover that someone wrote a script to analyze accounting records and it was like log table. And then when Camarillo was doing the insert, was not this asynchronous, it's when I started to add this asynchronous at some point. Practically, they were waiting for that lazy script to finish. And those scripts or external applications, sometimes they must be there, right, for detecting fraud and so on, so that's not a problem. But better do some replication database layer so they don't really work directly on the database that Kamailio interacts with because it can have unpredictable uh, reports. And usually, you like, many people don't know about other people doing such stuff. So it was like, for sure are you not doing it? And then, okay, so let's log everything, <laughs> like database queries. With, they didn't want to do it because they said it's going to slow down because of excessive logging. But that was the, the result. Then for syslog, I already mentioned with this dedicated uh, facility, so you have smaller file. And then, again, look at the time mode parameter if you need different accuracy for these accounting records to get millisecond based ac accuracy and so on. So this would be to conclude the, the presentation and actually conclude the entire uh, event. Before saying the, the last things from myself to you, I'll have again uh, our uh, sponsors on uh, the screen because they made it possible. And uh, I'm really grateful because we could get also a, a large group of speakers here that could attend it and share the um, uh, knowledge with you. And yeah. Hopefully, there will be some uh, future edition next year if no other pandemic or unexpected events happen. I think uh, so far, at least, we got uh, very good feedback for the new venue. It was quite some stress till tomorrow lunchtime to see how everything goes. But after that, uh, everyone seemed to be happy. Most of you said that uh, it's even better than uh, the past uh, location. So we are really happy to hear that. Hopefully, it was not because you're afraid of me <laughs> not helping in the future with Kamahilio or so. Uh, but yeah, actually, speakers. We can easily find that um, the bigger things should go to the attendees, the audience. And uh, without you, the event will not uh, make uh, much sense. And as I said, at least this edition in the audience, in the attendees, were uh, a lot of um, val valuable minds from the community and other projects that you could interact with. So thank you, everyone, and don't go before we give this uh, other gifts. Oliver, do you want to come and give this one? Okay, thank you everyone. I, I thought I got rid of questions.